Chapter 1 of 25 Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. 25 Sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. The Eve of Departure. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Acts 20. 38. To the more than twenty-five million people in many countries, to whom my sermons come week by week, in English tongue and by translation, through the kindness of the press, I address these words. I dictate them to a stenographer on the eve of my departure for the Holy Land, Palestine. When you read this sermon, I will be in mid-Atlantic. I go to be gone a few weeks on a religious journey. I go because I want for myself and hearers and readers to see Bethlehem and Nazareth and Jerusalem and Calvary and all the other places connected with the Savior's life and death, and so reinforce myself for sermons. I go also because I am writing the life of Christ and can be more accurate and graphic when I have been an eyewitness of the sacred places. Pray for my successful journey and my safe return. I wish on the eve of departure to pronounce a loving benediction upon all my friends in high places and low, upon congregations to whom my sermons are read in absence of pastors, on groups gathered out on prairies and in mining districts, upon all sick and invalid and aged ones who cannot attend churches, but to whom I have long administered through the printed page. My next sermon will be addressed to you from Rome, Italy, for I feel like Paul when he said, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. The fact is that Paul was ever moving about on land or sea. He was an old sailor, not from occupation, but from frequency of travel. I think he could have taken a vessel across the Mediterranean as well as some of the ship captains. The sailors never scoffed at him for being a land lubber. If Paul's advice had been taken, the crew would never have gone ashore at Melita. Paul on the Ocean When the vessel went scudding under bare poles, Paul was the only self-possessed man on board, and turning to the excited crew and despairing passengers, he exclaims in a voice that sounds above the thunder of the tempest and the wrath of the sea, Be of good cheer! The men who now go to sea with maps and charts and modern compass warned by buoy and lighthouse, know nothing of the perils of ancient navigation. Horace said that the man who first ventured on the sea must have had a heart bound with oak and triple brass. People then ventured only from headland to headland and from island to island, and not until long after spread their sail for a voyage across the sea. Before starting, the weather was watched, and the vessel having been hauled up on the shore, the mariners placed their shoulders against the stern of the ship and heaved it off, they at the last moment leaping into it. Vessels were then chiefly ships of burden, the transit of passengers being the exception, for the world was not then migratory as in our day, when the first desire of a man in one place seems to be to get into another place. The ship from which Jonah was thrown overboard, and that in which Paul was carried prisoner, went out chiefly with the idea of taking a cargo. As now, so then, vessels were accustomed to carry a flag. In those times it was inscribed with the name of a heathen deity. A vessel bound for Syracuse had on it the inscription, Castor and Pollux. The ships were provided with anchors. Anchors were of two kinds, those that were dropped into the sea and those that were thrown up onto the rocks to hold the vessel fast. This last kind was what Paul alluded to when he said, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and that which entereth into that within the veil. That was what the sailors call a hook anchor. The rocks and sandbars, shoals and headlands not being mapped out, vessels carried a plumb line. They would drop it and find the water fifty fathoms, and drop it again and find it forty fathoms, and drop it again and find it thirty fathoms, thus discovering their near approach to the shore. In the spring, summer, and autumn, the Mediterranean Sea was white with the wings of ships, but at the first wintry blast they hide themselves to the nearest harbor, 
although now the world's commerce prospers in january as well as in june and in midwinter all over the wide and storm deep there float palaces of light trampling the billows underfoot and showering the sparks of terrible furnaces on the wild wind and the christian passenger tippeted and shawled sits under the shelter of the smokestack looking off upon the phosphorescent deep on which is written in scrolls of foam and fire thy way o god is in the sea and thy path in the great waters it is in those days of early navigation that i see a group of men women and children on the beach of the mediterranean paul is about to leave the congregation to whom he had preached and they are come down to see him off it is a solemn thing to part there are so many traps that wait for a man's feet the solid ground may break through and the sea how many dark mysteries it hides in its bosom a few counsels a hasty good-bye a last look and the ropes rattle and the sails are hoisted and the planks are hauled in and paul is gone i expect to sail over some of the same waters over which paul sailed but before going i want to urge you all to embark for heaven the church is the dry dock where souls are to be fitted out for heaven in making a vessel for this voyage the first need is sound timber the floor timbers ought to be of solid stuff for the want of it vessels that looked able to run their jibboons into the eye of any tempest when caught in a storm have been crushed like a wafer the truths of god's word are what i mean by floor timbers away with your lighter materials nothing but oaks hewn in the forest of divine truth are staunch enough for this craft striking maritime similes you must have love for a helm to guide and turn the craft neither pride nor ambition nor avarice will do for a rudder love not only in the heart but flashing in the eye and tingling in the hand love married to work which many look upon as so homely a bride love not like brooks which foam and rattle yet do nothing but love like a river that runs up the steps of mill wheels and works in the harness of factory bands love that will not pass by on the other side but visits the man who fell among thieves near jericho not merely saying poor fellow you are dreadfully hurt but like the good samaritan pours in oil and wine and pays his board at the tavern there must also be a prow arranged to cut and override the billow that is christian perseverance there are three mountain surges that sometimes dash against the soul in a minute the world the flesh and the devil and that is a well-built prow that can bound over them for lack of this many have put back and never started again it is the broadside wave that so often sweeps the deck and fills the hatches but that which strikes in front is harmless meet troubles courageously and you surmount them stand on the prow and as you wipe off the spray of the split surge cry out with the apostle none of these things move me let all your fear stay aft the right must conquer know that moses in an ark of bulrushes can run down a war steamer the anchor of hope have a good strong anchor which hope we have as an anchor by this strong cable and windlass hold on to your anchor if any man sin we have an advocate with the father do not use the anchor wrongfully do not always stay in the same latitude and longitude. You will never ride up to the harbor of eternal rest if you all the way drag your anchor. But you must have sails. Vessels are not fit for the sea until they have the flying jib, the foresail, the top gallant, the sky sail, the gaff sail, and other canvas. Faith is our canvas. Hoist it, and the winds of heaven will drive you ahead sails made out of any other canvas than faith will be slit to tatters by the first northeaster strong faith never lost a battle it will crush foes blast rocks quench lightnings thresh mountains it is a shield to the warrior a crank to the most ponderous wheel a lever to pry up pyramids a drum whose beat gives strength to the step of the heavenly soldiery and sails to waft ships laden with priceless pearls from the harbor of earth to the harbor of heaven but you are not yet equipped you must have what seamen call the running rigging this comprises the ship's braces 
halyards, clue lines, and such like. Without these, the yards could not be braced, the sails lifted, nor the canvas in any wise managed. We have prayer for the running rigging. Unless you understand this tackling, you are not a spiritual seaman. By pulling on these ropes, you hoist the sails of faith and turn them every whither. The prow of courage will not cut the wave, nor the sail of faith spread and flap its wing, unless you have strong prayer for a halyard. One more arrangement, and you will be ready for the sea. You must have a compass, which is the Bible. Look at it every day, and always sail by it, as its needle points toward the star of Bethlehem. Through fog and darkness and storm it works faithfully. Search the scriptures. Box the compass. Let me give you two or three rules for the voyage. Allow your appetites and passions only an under-deck passage. Do not allow them ever to come up on the promenade deck. Mortify your members which are upon the earth. Never allow your lower nature anything better than a steerage passage. Let watchfulness walk the decks as an armed sentinel, and shoot down with great promptness anything like mutiny of riotous appetites. Be sure to look out of the forecastle for icebergs. These are cold Christians floating about in the church. The frigid zone professors will sink you. Steer clear of icebergs. Keep a logbook during all the voyage, an account of how many furlongs you make a day. The merchant keeps a daybook as well as a ledger. You ought to know every night as well as every year how things are going. When the express train stops at the depot, you hear a hammer sounding on all the wheels, thus testing the safety of the rail train. Bound as we are with more than express speed toward a great eternity, ought we not often to try the work of self-examination? Be sure to keep your colors up. You know the ships of England, Russia, France, and Spain by the ensigns they carry. Sometimes it is a lion, sometimes an eagle, sometimes a star, sometimes a crown. Let it ever be known who you are and for what port you are bound. Let Christian be written on the very front with a figure of a cross, a crown, and a dove. And from the masthead let float all the streamers of Emmanuel. Then the pirate vessels of temptation will pass you unharmed as they say, there goes a Christian bound for the port of heaven. We will not disturb her, for she has too many guns aboard. Run up your flag on this pulley. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the wisdom of God unto salvation. When driven back or laboring under great stress of weather, now changing from starboard tack to larboard, and then from larboard to starboard, look above the top gallants, and your heart shall beat like a war drum as the streamers float on the wind. The sign of the cross will make you patient, and the crown will make you glad. The Voyage to Eternity Before you gain port you will smell the land breezes of heaven, and Christ the pilot will meet you as you come into the narrows of death, and fasten to you and say, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Are you ready for such a voyage? Make up your minds. The gangplanks are lifting. The bell rings. All aboard for heaven. This world is not your rest. The chaffinch is the silliest bird in all the earth for trying to make its nest on the rocking billow. Oh, how I wish that as I embark for the holy land in the east, all to whom I preach by tongue or type would embark for heaven. What you all most need is God and you need him now. Some of you I leave in trouble. Things are going very rough with you. You have had a hard struggle with poverty, or sickness, or persecution, or bereavement. Light after light has gone out, and it is so dark that you can hardly see any blessing left. May that Jesus who comforted the widow of Nain, and raised the deceased to life, with his gentle hand of sympathy, wipe away your tears. All is well. When David was fleeing through the wilderness, pursued by his own son, he was being prepared to become the sweet singer of Israel. The pit and the dungeon were the best schools at which Joseph ever graduated. The hurricane that upset the tent and killed Job's children prepared the man of Uz 
to write the magnificent poem that has astounded the ages. There is no way to get the wheat out of the straw but to thresh it. There is no way to purify the gold but to burn it. Look at the people who have always had it their own way. They are proud, discontented, useless, and unhappy. But if you want to find cheerful folks, go among those who have been purified by the fire. After Rossini had rendered William Tell the five hundredth time, a company of musicians came under his window in Paris and serenaded him. They put upon his brow a golden crown of laurel leaves. But amidst all the applause and enthusiasm, Rossini turned to a friend and said, I would give all this brilliant scene for a few days of youth and love. Contrast the melancholy feeling of Rossini, who had everything that this world could give him, to the joyful experience of Isaac Watts, whose misfortunes were innumerable, when he says, The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. Before we reach the heavenly fields, our walk the golden streets. Then let our songs abound, and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high. It is prosperity that kills, and trouble that saves. While the Israelites were on the march amidst great privations and hardships, they behaved well. After a while they prayed for meat, and the sky darkened with a large flock of quails, and these quails fell in great multitudes all about them. And the Israelites ate and ate, and stuffed themselves until they died. Oh, my friends, it is not hardship or trial or starvation that injures the soul, but abundant supply. It is not the vulture of trouble that eats up the Christian's life. It is the quails. It is the quails. I cannot leave you until once more I confess my faith in the Savior whom I have preached. He is my all in all. I owe more to the grace of God than most men. With this ardent temperament, if I had gone overboard, I would have gone to the very depths. You know I can do nothing by halves. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I am constrained to be. I think all will be well. Do not be worried about me. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that if any fatality should befall me, I think I should go straight. I have been most unworthy, and would be sorry to think that any one of my friends had been as unworthy a Christian as myself. But God has helped a great many through, and I hope he will help me through. It is a long account of shortcomings, but if he is going to rub any of it out, he will rub it all out. And now give us, for I go not alone, your benediction. When you send letters to a friend in a distant land, you say via such a city or via such a steamer. When you send your good wishes to us, send them via the throne of God. We shall not travel out of the reach of your prayers. There is a scene where spirits dwell, where friends hold intercourse with friend. Though sundered far by faith we meet around one common mercy seat. And now may the blessing of God come down upon your bodies and upon your souls, your fathers and mothers, your companions, your children, your brothers and sisters, and your friends. May you be blessed in your business and in your pleasures, in your joys and in your sorrows, in the house and by the way. And if during our separation an arrow from the unseen world should strike any of us, may it only hasten on the raptures that God has prepared for those who love him. I utter not the word farewell. It is too sad, too formal a word for me to speak or write. But considering that I have your hand tightly clasped in both of mine, I utter a kind and affectionate and a cheerful goodbye. End of chapter 1chapter two of twenty-five sermons on the holy land this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c twenty-five sermons on the holy land by thomas de witt talmage Chapter 2. I Must Also See Rome I must also see Rome. Acts 19, 
twenty one here is paul's itinerary he was a travelling or circuit preacher he had been mobbed and insulted and the more good he did the worse the world treated him but he went right on now he proposes to go to jerusalem and says after that i must also see rome why did he want to visit this wonderful city in which i am to-day permitted to stand to preach the gospel you answer no doubt of it but there were other reasons why he wanted to see rome a man of paul's intelligence and classic taste had fifty other reasons for wanting to see it your coliseum was at that time in process of erection and he wanted to see it the forum was even then an old structure and the eloquent apostle wanted to see that building in which eloquence had so often thundered and wept over the appian way the triumphal processions had already marched for hundreds of years and he wanted to see that the temple of saturn was already an antiquity and he wanted to see that the architecture of the world-renowned city he wanted to see that the places associated with the triumphs the cruelties the disasters the wars the military genius the poetic and the rhetorical fame of this great city he wanted to see them a man like paul so many-sided so sympathetic so emotional so full of analogy could not have been indifferent to the antiquities and the splendors which move every rightly organized human being and with what thrill of interest he walked these streets those only who for the first time like ourselves enter rome can imagine if the inhabitants of all christum were gathered into one plain and it were put to them which two cities they would above all others wish to see the mass majority of them would vote jerusalem and rome so we can understand something of the record of my text and its surroundings when it says paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through macedonia and achaia to go to jerusalem saying after that i must also see rome as some of you are aware with my family and only for the purpose of what we can learn and the good we can get i am on the way to palestine since leaving brooklyn new york this is the first place we have stopped intermediate cities are attractive but we have visited them in other years and we hastened on for i said before starting that while i was going to jerusalem i must also see rome why do i want to see it because i want by visiting regions associated with the great apostle to the gentiles to have my faith in christianity confirmed there are those who will go through large expenditure to have their faith weakened in my native land i have known persons of very limited means to pay fifty cents or a dollar to hear a lecturer prove that our christian religion is a myth a dream a cheat a lie on the contrary i will give all the thousands of dollars that this journey of my family will cost to have additional evidence that our christian religion is an authenticated grandeur a solemn a joyous a rapturous a stupendous a magnificent fact so i want to see rome i want you to show me the places connected with apostolic ministry i have heard that in your city and amid its surroundings apostles suffered and died for christ's sake my common 
sense tells me that people do not die for the sake of a falsehood they may practice deception for purposes of gain but put the sword to their heart or arrange the halter around their neck or kindle the fire around their feet and they would say my life is worth more than anything i can gain by losing it i hear you have in this city paul's dungeon show it to me i must see rome also while i am interested in this city because of her rulers or her citizens who are mighty in history for virtue or vice or talents romulus and caligula and cincinnatus and vespasian and corollianus and brutus and a hundred others whose names are bright with an exceeding brightness or black with the deepest dye most of all am i interested in this city because the preacher of mars hill and the defier of agrippa and the hero of the shipwrecked vessel in the breakers of melita and the man who held higher than any one that the world ever saw the torch of resurrection lived and preached and was massacred here show me every place connected with his memory i must also see rome curiosity of the christian but my text suggests that in paul there was the inquisitive and curious spirit had my text only meant that he wanted to preach here he would have said so indeed in another place he declared i am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at rome also but my text suggests a sight-seeing this man who had been under dr gamil had no luck in phraseology and was used to say exactly what he meant and he said i must also see rome there is such a thing as christian curiosity paul had it and some of us have it about other people's business i have no curiosity about all that can confirm my faith in the christian religion and the world's salvation and the soul's future happiness i am full of an all-absorbing all-compelling curiosity paul had a great curiosity about the next world and so have we i hope some day by the grace of god to go over and see for myself but not now no well man no prospered man i think wants to go now but the time will come i think when i shall go over i want to see what they do there and i want to see how they do it i do not want to be looking through the gates ajar forever i want them to swing wide open there are ten thousand things i want explained about you about myself about the government of the world about god about everything we start in a plain path of what we know and in a minute come up against a high wall of what we do not know i wonder how it looks over there somebody tells me it is like a paved city paved with gold and another man tells me it is like a fountain and it is like a tree and it is like a triumphal procession and the next man i meet tells me it is all figurative i really want to know after the body is resurrected what they wear and what they eat and i have an immeasurable curiosity to know what it is and how it is and what it is columbus risked his life to find the american continent and shall we shudder to go out on a voyage of discovery which shall reveal a vaster and more brilliant country 
john franklin risked his life to find a passage between icebergs and shall we dread to find a passage to eternal summer men in switzerland travel up the heights of the matterhorn with an alpenstock and guides and rockets and ropes and getting halfway up stumble and fall down in a horrible massacre they just wanted to say they had been on top of those high peaks and shall we fear to go out for the ascent of the eternal hills which start a thousand miles beyond where stop the highest peaks of the alps when in that ascent there is no peril a man doomed to die stepped on the scaffold and said in joy now in ten minutes i will know the great secret one minute after the vital function ceased the little child that died last night knew more than paul himself before he died friends the exit from this world or death if you please to call it to the christian is glorious explanation it is demonstration it is illumination it is sunburst it is the opening of all the windows it is shutting up the catechism of doubt and the unrolling of all the scrolls of positive and accurate information instead of standing at the foot of the ladder and looking up it is standing at the top of the ladder and looking down it is the last mystery taken out of botany and geology and astronomy and theology oh will it not be granted to have all questions answered the perpetually recurring interrogation point changed for the mark of exclamation all riddles solved who will fear to go out on that discovery when all the questions are to be decided which we have been discussing all our lives who shall not clap his hands in the anticipation of that blessed country if it be no better than through holy curiosity as this paul of my text did not suppress his curiosity we need not suppress ours yes i have an unlimited curiosity about all religious things and as this city of rome was so intimately connected with apolistic times the incidents of which emphasize and explain and augment the christian religion you will not take it as an evidence of a prying spirit but as the outbursting of a christian curiosity when i say i must also see rome our desire to visit this city is also intensified by the fact that we want to be confirmed in the feeling that human life is brief but its work lasts for centuries indeed forever therefore show us the antiquities of old rome about which we have been reading for a lifetime but never seen in our beloved america we have no antiquities a church eighty years old overawes us with its age we have in america some cathedrals hundreds and thousands of years old but they are in yellowstone park or californian canon and their architecture and masonry were by the omniponent god we want to see buildings or ruins of old buildings that were erected hundreds and thousands of years ago by human hands they lived forty or seventy years but the arches they lifted the paintings they penciled the sculpture they chiseled the roads they laid out i understand are yet to be seen and we want you to show them to us i can hardly wait until monday morning i must also see rome 
we want to be impressed with the fact that what men do on a small scale or large scale lasts a thousand years lasts forever that we build for an eternity and that we do so in a very short space of time god is the only old living presence but it is an old age without any of the infirmities or limitations of old age there is a passage in of scripture which speaks of the birth of the mountains for there was a time when the andes were born and the pyrenees were born and the sierra nevada were born but before the birth of those mountains the bible tells us god was born a was never born at all because he always existed psalm x c two before the mountains were brought forth or over thou hast formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting thou art god how short is human life what antiquity attaches to its worth how everlasting is god show us the antiquities the things that were old when america was discovered old when paul went up and down the streets sightseeing old when christ was born must i must also see rome the pauline intellect another reason for our visit to this city is that we want to see the places where the mightiest intellects and the greatest natures wrought for our christian religion we have been told in america by some people of swollen heads that the christian religion is a pusillanimous thing good for children under seven years of age and small-brained people but not for the intelligent and swarthy-minded we have heard of your constantine the mighty who pointed his army to the cross saying by this conqueror if there be anything here connected with his reign or his military history show it to us the mightiest intellect of the ages was the author of my text and if for the christian religion he was willing to labor and suffer and die there must be something exalted and sublime and tremendous in it and show me every place he visited and show me if you can where he was tried and which of your roads leads out to ostia that i may see where he went out to die we expect before we finish this journey to see lake galilee and the places where simon peter and andrew fished and perhaps we may drop a net or a hook and line into those waters ourselves but when following the track of these lesser apostles i will learn quite another lesson i want while in this city of rome to study the religion of the brainiest apostles i want to follow as far as we can trace it the track of this great intellect of my text who wanted to see rome also he was a logician he was a metaphysician he was an all-conquering orator he was a poet of the highest type he had a nature that could swamp the leading men of his own day and hurled against the sanhedrin he made it tremble he learned all he could get in the school of his native village then he had gone to a higher school and there he had mastered the greek and the hebrew and perfected himself in bell letras until in after years 
he astounded the cretans and the corinthians and the athenians by quotations from their own authors i have never found anything in carlyle or goth or herbert spencer that could compare in strength or beauty with paul's epistles i do not think there is anything in the writings of sir william hamilton that shows such mental discipline as you find in paul's argument about justification and resurrection i have not found anything in milton finer in the way of imagination than i can find in paul's illustrations drawn from the amphitheatre there was nothing in robert emmet pleading for his life or in edmund burke arraigning warren hastings in westminster hall that compared with the scene in the courtroom when before robed officials paul bowed and began his speech saying i think myself happy king agrippa because i shall answer for myself this day i repeat that a religion that can capture a man like that must have some power in it it is time our wise acres stop talking as though all the brain of the world were opposed to christianity where paul leads we can afford to follow i am glad to know that christ has in the different ages of the world had in his discipleship a mozart and handel in music a raphael and a reynolds in painting an angelo and canova in sculpture a rush and a harvey in medicine a grotius and a washington in statesmanship a blackstone a marshall and a kent in the law and the time will come when the religion of christ will conquer all the observatories and universities and philosophy will through her telescope behold the morning star of jesus and in her laboratory see that all things work together for good and with her geological hammer discern the rock of ages oh instead of powering and shivering when the skeptic stands before us and talks of religion as though it were a pusillanimous thing instead of that let us take out our new testament and read the story of paul at rome or come and see the city for ourselves and learn that it could have been no weak gospel that actuated such a man but that it is an all-conquering gospel a for all ages the power of god and the wisdom of god into salvation concluding exhortation men brethren and fathers i thank you for this opportunity of preaching the gospel to you that are at rome also the churches of america salute you upon you who are like us strangers in rome i pray the protecting and journeying care of god upon you who are resident here i pray grace mercy and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ after tarrying here a few days we resume our journey for palestine and we shall never meet again either in italy or america or what is called the holy land but there is a holier land and there we may meet save by the grace that in the same way saves italian and american and there is that supernatural clime 
after embracing him who by his sufferings on the hill back of jerusalem made our heaven possible and given salutation to our own kindred whose departure broke our hearts on earth we shall i think seek out the travelling preacher and mighty hero of the text who marked out his journey through macedonia and achaia to a jerusalem saying after i have been there i must also see rome end of chapter two recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter three of twenty-five sermons on the holy land this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c twenty-five sermons on the holy land by thomas de witt tamage a mediterranean voyage and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land acts twenty seven forty four having visited your historical city brindisi which we desire to see because it was the terminus of the most famous road of the ages the roman appian way and for its mighty fortress overshadowing a city which even hannibal's hosts could not thunder down we must to-morrow morning leave your harbour and after touching at athens and corinth voyage about the mediterranean to alexandria egypt i have been reading this morning in my new testament of a mediterranean voyage in an alexandrian ship it was this very month of november the vessel was lying in a port not very far from here on board that vessel were two distinguished passengers one jophius the historian as we have strong reasons to believe the other a convict one paul by name who was going to prison for upsetting things or as they termed it turning the world upside down this convict had gained the confidence of the captain indeed i think that paul knew almost as much about the sea as did the captain he had been shipwrecked three times already he had dwelt much of his life amidst capstans and yard arms and cables and storms and he knew what he was talking about seeing the equid storm was coming and perhaps noticing something unseaworthy in the vessel he advised the captain to stay in the harbor but i hear the captain and the first mate talking together they say we cannot afford to take the advice of this landsman and he a minister he may be able to preach very well but i don't believe he knows a manline spike from a luff tackle all aboard cast off shift the helm for headway who fears the mediterranean they had gone only a little way out when a whirlwind called a eurocyclodon made the torn sail its turban shook the mast as you would brandish a spear and tossed the hulk into the heavens overboard with the cargo it is all washed with salt water and worthless now and there are no marine insurance companies all hands ahoy and out with the anchors a great sea storm great consternation comes on crew and passengers the sea monsters snort in the foam and the billows clap their hands in glee of destruction in the lull of the storm i hear a chain clank it is the chain of the great apostle as he walks the deck 
or holds fast to the rigging amid the lurching of the ship the spray dripping from his long beard as he cries out to the crew now i exhort you to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship for there stood by me this night the angel of god who i am and whom i serve saying fear not paul thou must be brought before caesar and lo goth hath given thee all them that sail with thee fourteen days have passed and there is no abatement of the storm it is midnight standing on the lookout the man peers into the darkness and by a flash of lightning sees the long white line of the breakers and knows they must be coming near to some country and fears that in a few moments the vessel be shivered on the rocks the ship flies like chaff in the tornado they drop the sounding line and by the light of the lantern they see it is twenty fathoms speeding along a little farther they drop the line again and by the light of the lantern they see it is fifteen fathoms two hundred and seventy-six souls within a few feet of awful shipwreck the managers of the vessel pretending they want to look over the side of the ship and undergird it get into the small boat expecting in it to escape but paul sees through the sham and tells them if they go off in the boat it will be the death of them the vessel strikes the planks spring the timbers crack the vessel parts in the thundering surge oh what wild struggling for life here they leap from plank to plank here they go under as if they would never rise but catching hold of a timber come floating on it to the beach here strong swimmers spread their arms through the waves until their chins plough the sand and they rise up and wring out their wet locks on the beach when the roll of the ship is called two hundred and seventy-six people answer to their names and so says the text it comes to pass that they escaped all safe to land some wholesome lessons i learnt from this subject first that those who get us into trouble will not stay to help us out these shipmen got paul out of fair havens into the storm but as soon as the tempest dropped upon them they wanted to go off in the small boat caring nothing for what became of paul and the passengers ah me human nature is the same in all ages they who get us into trouble never stop to help us out they who tempt that young man into a life of dissipation will be the first to laugh at its imbecility and to drop him out of decent society gamblers always make fun of the losses of gamblers they who tempt you into the contest with fists saying i will back you will be the first to run look over all the predicaments of your life and count the names of those who have got you into those predicaments and tell me the name of one who ever helped you out they were glad enough to get you out from fair havens but when with damaged rigging you tried to get into harbor did they hold you a plank or throw you a rope not one satan has got thousands of men into trouble but he never got one out he led them into theft but he would not hide the goods or bail out the defendant the spider shows the fly the way over the gossamer bridge into the cobweb but it never shows the fly the way out of the cobweb over the gossamer bridge 
i think that there were plenty of fast young men to help the prodigal spend his money but when he had wasted his substance in riotous living they let him go to the swine pastures while they betook themselves to some other newcomer they who took paul out of fair havens will be of no help to him when he gets into the breakers of melita i remark again as a lesson learned from the text that it is dangerous to refuse the counsel of competent advisers paul told them not to go out with that ship they thought he knew nothing about it they said he is only a minister they went and the ship was destroyed there are a great many people who now say of ministers they know nothing about the world they cannot talk to us ah my friends it is not necessary to have the asiatic chorea before you can give it medical treatment to others it is not necessary to have your arm broken before you know how to splinter a fracture and we who stand in the pulpit and in the office of a christian teacher know that there are certain styles of belief and certain kinds of behavior that will lead to destruction as certainly as paul knew that if the ship went out of fair havens it would go to destruction rejoice o young man in thy youth and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth but know thou that for all these things god will bring thee into judgment we may not know much but we know that young people refuse the advice of parents they say father is over suspicious and mother is getting old but these parents have been on the sea of life they know where the storms sleep and during their voyage they have seen a thousand battered hulks marking the place where beauty burned and intellect foundered and morality sank they are old sailors having answered many a signal of distress and endured great stress of weather and gone scuttling under bare poles and the old folks know what they are talking about look at that man in his cheek the glow of infernal fires his eye flashes not at once with thought but with low passion his brain is a sewer through which impurity floats and his heart the trough in which lust wallows and drinks men shudder as the leper passes and parents cry wolf wolf yet he once said the lord's prayer at his mother's knee and against that inquietous brow once pressed a pure mother's lip but he refused her counsel he went where eurosidons have their lair he foundered on the sea while all hell echoed at the roar of the wreck lost pacifics lost pacifics the safety of christians another lesson from the subject is that christians are always safe there did not seem to be much chance for paul getting out of that shipwreck did there they had not in those days rockets with which to throw ropes over foundering vessels their lifeboats were of but little worth and yet notwithstanding all the danger my text says that paul escaped safe to land and so it will always be with god's children they may be plunged into darkness and trouble but by the throne of the eternal god i assert it they shall all escape safe to land sometimes there comes a storm of commercial disaster the cables break the masts fall the cargoes are scattered over the sea 
oh what struggling and leaping on kegs and hogsheads and corn bins and store shelves and yet though they may have it so very hard in commercial circles the good trusting in god all comes safe to land wreckers go out on the ocean's beach and find the shattered hulks of vessels and on the streets of our great cities there is many a wreck mainsail slit with banker's pen hulks a beam's end on insurance counters vast credit sinking having suddenly sprung a leak yet all of them who are god's children shall at last through his goodness and mercy escape safe to land the scandinavian warriors used to drink wine out of the skulls of the enemies they had slain even so will god help us out of the conquered ills and disasters of life to drink sweetness and strength for our souls you have my friends had illustrations in your own life of how god delivers his people i have had illustrations in my own life of the same truth i was once in what on your mediterranean you call a eurocyclon but what on the atlantic we call a cyclone but the same storm the steamer greece of the national line swung out into the river mercy at liverpool bound for new york we had on board seven hundred crew and passengers we came together strangers italians englishmen irishmen swedes norwegians americans two flags floated from the mass british and american ensigns we had a new vessel or one so thoroughly remodeled that the voyage had around it all the uncertainties of a trial trip the great steamer felt its way cautiously out into the sea the pilot was discharged and committing ourselves to the care of him who holdeth the winds in his fist we were fairly started on our voyage of three thousand miles it was roughly nearly all the way the sea with strong buffeting disputing our path but one night at eleven o'clock after the lights had been put out a cyclone a wind just made to tear ships to pieces caught us in its clutches it came down so suddenly that we had not time to take in the sails or to fasten the hatches you may know that the bottom of the atlantic is strewn with the ghastly work of cyclones oh they are cruel winds they have hot breath as though they came up from infernal furnaces their merriment is the cry of affrighted passengers their play is the foundering of steamers and when a ship goes down they laugh until both continents hear them they go in circles or as i describe them with my hand rolling on rolling on with finger of terror writing on the white sheet of the wave this sentence of doom let all that come within this circle perish brig guillotines go down clippers go down steamships go down and the vessel hearing the terrible voice crouches in the surf and as the waters gurgle through the hatches and portholes it lowers away thousands of feet down farther and farther until at last it strikes the bottom and all is peace for they have landed helmsman's dead at the wheel engineer dead amidst the extinguished furnaces captain dead in the gangway passengers dead in the cabin buried in the great cemetery of dead seamers beside the city of boston the lexington the president the cambria waiting for the archangel's trumpet 
to split up the decks and wrench open the cabin doors and unfasten the hatches perils not to be made light of i thought that i had seen storms on the sea before but all of them together might have come under one wing of that cyclone we were only eight or nine hundred miles from home and in high expectation of soon seeing our friends for there was no one on board so poor as not to have a friend but it seemed as if we were to be disappointed the most of us expected then and there to die there were none who made light of the peril save two one was an englishman and he was drunk and the other was an american and he was a fool oh what a time it was a night to make one's hair turn white we came out of the berths and stood in the gangway and looked into the steerage and sat in the cabin while seated there we heard overhead something like minute guns it was the bursting of the sails we held on by both hands to keep our places those who attempted to cross the floor came back bruised and gashed cups and glasses were dashed to fragments pieces of the table getting loose swung across the saloon it seemed as if the hurricane took that great ship of thousands of tons and stood it on one end and said shall i sink it or let it go this once and then it came down with such force that the billows trampled over it each mounted of a fury we felt that everything depended on the propelling screw if that stopped for an instant we knew the vessel would fall off into the trough of the sea and sink so we prayed that the screw which three times since leaving liverpool had already stopped might not stop now oh how anxiously we listened for the regular thump of the machinery upon which our lives seemed to depend after a while someone said the screw is stopped no its sound had only been overpowered by the uproar of the tempest and we breathed easier again when we heard the regular pulsations of the overtasked machinery going thump 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 at three o'clock in the morning the water covered the ship from prow to stern and the skylights gave way the deluge rushed in and we felt that one or two more waves like that must swamp us forever as the water rolled back and forward in the cabins and dashed against the wall it sprang halfway up to the ceiling rushing through the skylights as it came in with such terrific roar there went up from the cabin a shriek of horror which i pray god i may never hear again i have dreamed the whole scene over again but god has mercifully kept me from hearing that one cry into it seemed to be compressed the agony of expected shipwreck it seemed to say i shall never get home again my children shall be orphaned and my wife shall be widowed i am launching now into eternity in two minutes i shall meet my god there were about five hundred and fifty passengers in the steerage and as the water rushed in and touched the furnaces and began violently to hiss the poor creatures in the steerage imagined that the boilers were giving way those passengers writhed in the water and in the mud some praying some crying all terrified they made a rush for the deck an officer stood on deck and beat them back with blow after blow it was necessary they would not have stood an instant on the deck oh how they begged to get out of the hold of the ship 
one woman with a child in her arms rushed up and caught hold of one of the officers and cried do let me out i will help you do let me out i cannot die here some got down and prayed to the virgin mary saying o oh, blessed mother keep us have mercy on us some stood with white lips and fixed gaze silent in their terror some wrung their hands and cried out o oh god what shall i do what shall i do the time came when the crew could no longer stay on the deck and the cry of the officers was below all hands below our brave sympathetic captain andrews whose praise i shall not cease to speak while i live had been swept by the hurricane from the bridge and had escaped very narrowly with his life the cyclone seemed to stand on the deck waving its wing crying this ship is mine i have captured it ha ha i will command it if god will permit i will sink it here and now by a thousand shipwrecks i swear the doom of this vessel there was a lull in the storm but only that it might gain additional fury crash went the lifeboat on one side crash went the lifeboat on the other side the great booms got loose and as with the heft of a thunderbolt pounded the deck and beat the mask the jibboom studding sail boom and square sail boom with their strong arms beating time to the awful march and music of the hurricane meanwhile the ocean became phosphorescent the whole scene looked like fire the water dripping from the rigging there were ropes of fire and there were mass of fire and there was a deck of fire a ship of fire sailing on a sea of fire through a night of fire may i never see anything like it again prayers from all everybody prayed a lad of twelve years of age got down and prayed for his mother if i should give up he said i do not know what would become of mother there were men who i think had not prayed for thirty years who then got down on their knees when a man who has neglected god all his life feels that he has come to his last time it makes a very busy night all of our sins and shortcomings pass through our minds my own life seemed utterly unsatisfactory i could only say here lord take me as i am i cannot mend matters now lord jesus thou didst die for the chief of sinners that's me it seems lord as if my work is done and poorly done and upon the infinite mercy i cast myself and in this hour of shipwreck and darkness commit myself and her whom i hold by the hand to thee o lord jesus praying that it may be a short struggle in the water and that at the same instant we may both arrive in glory oh i tell you a man prays straight to the mark when he has a cyclone above him an ocean beneath him an eternity so close to him that he can feel its breath on his cheek the night was long at last we saw the dawn looking through the portholes as in the olden time in the fourth watch of the night jesus came walking on the sea from wave cliff to wave cliff and when he put his foot upon a billow though it may be tossed up with might it goes down he cried to the winds hush they knew his voice the waves knew his foot they died away and in the shining track of his feet i read these letters on scrolls of foam and fire 
the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of god as the waters cover the sea the ocean calmed the path of the steamer became more and more mild until on the last morning out the sun threw about us a glory such as i never witnessed before god made a pavement of mosaic reaching from horizon to horizon for all the splendors of earth and heaven to walk upon a pavement bright enough for the foot of a seraph bright enough for the wheels of the archangel's chariot as a parent embraces a child and kisses away its grief so over that sea that had been writhing in agony in the tempest the morning threw its arms of beauty and of benediction and the lips of earth and heaven met as i came on deck it was very early and we were nearing the shore i saw a few sails against the sky they seemed like the spirits of the night walking the billows i leaned over the taffrail of the vessel and said thy way o god is in the sea and thy path in the great waters it grew lighter the clouds were hung in purple clusters along the sky and as if those purple clusters were pressed into red wine and poured out upon the sea every wave turned into crimson yonder fire cleft stood opposite the fire cleft and here a cloud rent and tinged with light seemed like a palace with flames bursting from the windows the whole scene lighted up until it seemed as if the angels of god were ascending and descending upon stairs of fire and the wave crests changed into jasper and crystal and amethyst as they were flung toward the beach made me think of the crowns of heaven cast before the throne of the great jehovah i leaned over the taffrail again and said with more emotion than before thy way o god is in the sea and thy path in the great waters so i thought will be the going off of the storm and night of the christian's life the darkness will fold its tents and away the golden feet of the rising morn will come skipping upon the mountains and all the wrathful billows of the world's woe break into the splendor of eternal joy and so we came into the harbor the cyclone behind us our friends before us god who is always good all around us and if the roll of the crew and the passengers had been called seven hundred souls would have answered to their names and so it came to pass that we all escaped safe to land and may god grant that when all our sabbaths on earth are ended we may find that through the rich mercy of our lord jesus christ we all have weathered the gale into the harbor of heaven now we glide home at last softly we drift on the bright silver tide home at last glory to god all our dangers are o'er we stand secure on the glorified shore glory to god we will shout evermore home at last home at last end of chapter three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 4 of 25 Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 25 Sermons on the Holy Land 
by thomas de witt talmage chapter four paul's mission in athens i hath not seen nor ear heard first corinthians two nine for now we see through a glass darkly first corinthians thirteen twelve both these sentences were written by the most illustrious merely human being the world ever saw one who walked these streets and preached from yonder pile of rocks mars hill though more classic associations are connected with this city than with any city under the sun because here socrates and plato and aristotle and demosthenes and pericles and herodotus and pythagoras and xenophon and praxiteles wrote or chiseled or taught or thundered or sung yet in my mind all those men and their teachings were eclipsed by paul and the gospel he preached in this city and in your nearby city of corinth yesterday standing on the old fortress at corinth the acro corinthus out from the ruins at its base arose in my imagination the old city just as paul saw it i have been told that for splendor the world beholds no such wonder today as that ancient corinth standing on an isthmus washed by two seas the one sea bringing the commerce of europe the other sea bringing the commerce of asia from her wharves in the construction of which whole kingdoms had been absorbed war galleys with three banks of oars pushed out and confounded the navy yards of all the world huge-handed machinery such as modern invention cannot equal lifted ships from the sea on one side and transported them on trucks across the isthmus and sat them down in the sea on the other side the revenue officers of the city went down through the olive groves that lined the beach to collect a tariff from all nations the mirth of all people sported in her isthmian games and the beauty of all lands sat in her theatres walked her porticos and threw itself on the altar of her stupendous dissipations column and statue and temple bewildered the beholder there were white marble fountains into which from apertures at the side there gushed waters everywhere known for health-giving qualities around these basins twisted into wreaths of stone there were all the beauties of sculpture and architecture while standing as if to guard the costly display was a statue of hercules of burnished corinthian brass vases of terracotta adorned the cemeteries of the dead vases so costly that julius caesar was not satisfied until he had captured them for rome armed officials the corinthari paced up and down to see that no statue was defaced no pedestal overthrown no bas-relief touched from the edge of the city the hill held its magnificent burden of columns and towers and temples one thousand slaves awaiting at one shrine and a citadel so thoroughly impregnable that gibraltar is a heap of sand compared with it amid all that strength and magnificence corinth stood and defied the world paul addressed high intelligence oh it was not to rustics who had never seen anything grand that paul uttered one of my texts they had heard the best music that had come from the best instruments in all the world had heard songs floating from morning porticos and melting in evening groves they had passed their whole lives among pictures and sculpture and architecture and corinthian brass which had been molded and shaped until there was no chariot wheel in which it had not sped and no tower in which it had not glittered and no gateway that it had not adorned 
ah it was a bold thing for paul to stand there amid all that and say all this is nothing these sounds that come from the temple of neptune are not music compared with the harmonies of which i speak these waters rushing in the basin of pyrene are not pure these statues of bacchus and mercury are not exquisite your citadel of acrocorinthus is not strong compared with that which i offer to the poorest slave that puts down his burden at that brazen gate you corinthians think this is a splendid city you think you have heard all sweet sounds and seen all beautiful sights but i tell you i hath not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god hath prepared for them that love him indeed both my texts the one spoken by paul and the one written by paul show us that we have very imperfect eyesight and that our day of vision is yet to come for now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face so paul takes the responsibility of saying that even the bible is an indistinct mirror and that its mission shall be finally suspended i think there may be one bible in heaven fastened to the throne just as now in a museum we have a lamp exhumed from herculaneum or nineveh and we look at it with great interest and say how poor a light it must have given compared with our modern lamps so i think that this bible which was a lamp to our feet in this world may lie near the throne of god exciting our interest to all eternity by the contrast between its comparatively feeble light and the illumination of heaven the bible now is the scaffolding to the rising temple but when the building is done there will be no use for the scaffolding the idea i shall develop today is that in this world our knowledge is comparatively dim and unsatisfactory but nevertheless is introductory to grander and more complete vision this is eminently true in regard to our view of god canst thou find out god we hear so much about god that we conclude that we understand him he is represented as having the tenderness of a father the firmness of a judge the pomp of a king and the love of a mother we hear about him talk about him write about him we lisp his name in infancy and it trembles on the tongue of the dying octogenarian we think that we know very much about him take the attribute of mercy do we understand it the bible blossoms all over with that word mercy it speaks again and again of the tender mercies of god of the sure mercies of the great mercies of the mercy that endureth forever of the multitude of his mercies and yet i know that the views we have of this great being are most indefinite one-sided and incomplete when at death the gate shall fly open and we shall look directly upon him how new and surprising we see upon canvas a picture of the morning we study the cloud in the sky the dew upon the grass and the husbandman on the way to the field beautiful picture of the morning but we rise at daybreak and go up on a hill to see for ourselves that which was represented to us while we look the mountains are transfigured the burnished gates of heaven swing open and shut to let pass a host of fiery splendors the clouds are all abloom and hang pendant from arbors of alabaster and amethyst the waters make pathway of inlaid pearl for the light to walk upon and there is morning on the sea 
the crags uncover their scarred visage and there is mourning among the mountains now you go home and how tame your picture of the morning seems in contrast greater than that shall be the contrast between this scriptural view of god and that which we shall have when standing face to face this is a picture of the morning that will be the morning itself again my texts are true of the saviour's excellency by image and sweet rhythm of expression and startling antithesis christ is set forth his love his compassion his work his life his death his resurrection we are challenged to measure it to compute it to weigh it in the hour of our broken enthrallment we mount up into high experience of his love and shout until the countenance glows and the blood bounds and the whole nature is exhilarated i have found him and yet it is through a glass darkly we see not half of that compassionate face we feel not half the warmth of that loving heart we wait for death to let us rush into his outspread arms then we shall be face to face not shadow then but substance not hope then but the fulfilling of all prefigurement that will be a magnificent unfolding to see eye to eye the rushing out in view of all hidden excellency the coming again of a long absent jesus to meet us not in rags and in penury and death but amidst a light and pomp and outbursting joy such as none but a glorified intelligence could experience oh to gaze full upon the brow that was lacerated upon the side that was pierced upon the feet that were nailed to stand close up in the presence of him who prayed for us on the mountain and thought of us by the sea and agonized for us in the garden and died for us in horrible crucifixion to feel of him to embrace him to take his hand to kiss his feet to run our fingers along the scars of ancient suffering to say this is my jesus he gave himself for me i shall never leave his presence i shall forever behold his glory i shall eternally hear his voice lord jesus now i see thee i behold where the blood started where the tears coursed where the face was distorted i have waited for this hour i shall never turn my back on thee no more looking through imperfect glasses no more studying thee in the darkness but as long as this throne stands and this everlasting river flows and those garlands bloom and these arches of victory remain to greet home heaven's conquerors so long i shall see thee jesus of my choice jesus of my song jesus of my triumph forever and forever face to face the idea of my text is just as true when applied to god's providence who has not come to some pass in life thoroughly inexplicable you say what does this mean what is god going to do with me now he tells me that all things work together for good this does not look like it you continue to study the dispensation and after a while guess about what god means he means to teach me this i think he means to teach me that perhaps it is to humble my pride perhaps it is to make me feel more dependent perhaps to teach me the uncertainty of life but after all it is only a guess a looking through the glass darkly the bible assures us there shall be a satisfactory unfolding 
what i do thou knowest not now but thou shalt know hereafter you will know why god took to himself that only child next door there was a household of seven children why not take one from that group instead of your only one why single out the dwelling in which there was only one heart beating responsive to yours why did god give you a child at all if he meant to take it away why fill the cup of your gladness brimming if he meant to dash it down why allow all the tendrils of your heart to wind around that object and then when every fiber of your own life seemed to be interlocked with the child's life with strong hand to tear you apart until you fall bleeding and crushed your dwelling desolate your hopes blasted your heart broken do you suppose that god will explain that yea he will make it plainer than any mathematical problem as plain as that two and two make four in the light of the throne you will see that it was right all right just and true are all thy ways thou king of saints providential hindrances in life here is a man who cannot get on in the world he always seems to buy at the wrong time and to sell at the worst disadvantage he tries this enterprise and fails that business and is disappointed the man next door to him has a lucrative trade but he lacks customers a new prospect opens his income is increased but that year his family are sick and the profits are expended in trying to cure the ailments he gets a discouraged look becomes faithless as to success begins to expect disasters others wait for something to turn up he waits for it to turn down others with only half as much education and character get on twice as well he sometimes guesses as to what it all means he says perhaps riches would spoil me perhaps poverty is necessary to keep me humble perhaps i might if things were otherwise be tempted into dissipations but there is no complete solution of the mystery he sees through a glass darkly and must wait for a higher unfolding will there be an explanation yes god will take that man in the light of the throne and say child immortal hear the explanation you remember the failing of that great enterprise this is the explanation and you will answer it is all right i see every day profound mysteries of providence there is no question we ask oftener than why there are hundreds of graves that need to be explained hospitals for the blind and lame asylums for the idiotic and insane almshouses for the destitute and a world of pain and misfortune that demand more than human solution ah god will clear it all up in the light that pours from the throne no dark mystery can live things now utterly inscrutable will be illumined as plainly as though the answer were written on the jasper wall or sounded in the temple anthem bartimaeus will thank god that he was blind and lazarus that he was covered with sores and joseph that he was cast into the pit and daniel that he was denned with the lions and paul that he was humpbacked and david that he was driven from jerusalem and the sewing woman that she could get only a few pence for making a garment and that invalid that for twenty years he could not lift his head from the pillow 
and that widow that she had such hard work to earn bread for her children you know that in a song different voices carry different parts the sweet and overwhelming part of the hallelujah of heaven will not be carried by those who rode in high places and gave sumptuous entertainments but pauper children will sing it beggars will sing it redeemed hod carriers will sing it those who were once the off-scouring of earth will sing it the hallelujah will be all the grander for earth's weeping eyes and aching heads and exhausted hands and scourged backs and martyred agonies how many shall be saved again the thought of my text is true when applied to the enjoyment of the righteous in heaven i think we have but little idea of the number of the righteous in heaven infidels say your heaven will be a very small place compared with the world of the lost for according to your teaching the majority of men will be destroyed i deny the charge i suppose that the multitude of the finally lost as compared with the multitude of the finally saved will be a handful i suppose that the few sick people in the hospitals of our great cities as compared with the hundreds of thousands of well people would not be smaller than the number of those who shall be cast out in suffering compared with those who shall have upon them the health of heaven for we are to remember that we are living in only the beginning of the christian dispensation and that this whole world is to be populated and redeemed and that ages of light and love are to flow on if this be so the multitudes of the saved will be in vast majority take all the congregations that have assembled for worship throughout christendom put them together and they would make but a small audience compared with the thousands and tens of thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand and the hundred and forty and four thousand that shall stand around the throne those flashed up to heaven in martyr fires those tossed for many years upon the invalid couch those fought in the armies of liberty and rose as they fell those tumbled from high scaffolding or slipped from the mast or were washed off into the sea they came up from corinth from laodicea from the red sea bank and gennesaret's wave from egyptian brickyards and gideon's threshing floor those thousands of years ago slept the last sleep and these are this moment having their eyes closed and their limbs stretched out for the sepulchre a general expecting an attack from the enemy stands on a hill and looks through a field glass and sees in the great distance multitudes approaching but has no idea of their numbers he says i cannot tell anything about them i merely know that they are a great number and so john without attempting to count says a great multitude that no man can number we are told that heaven is a place of happiness but what do we know about happiness happiness in this world is only a half-fledged thing a flowery path with a serpent hissing across it a broken pitcher from which the water has dropped before we could drink it a thrill of exhilaration followed by disastrous reactions to help us understand the joy of heaven the bible takes us to a river we stand on the grassy bank we see the waters flow on with ceaseless wave but the filth of the cities is emptied into it and the banks are torn and unhealthy exhalations spring up from it 
and we fail to get an idea of the river of life in heaven a glorious and everlasting reunion we get very imperfect ideas of the reunions of heaven we think of some festal day on earth when father and mother were yet living and the children came home a good time that but it had this drawback all were not there that brother went off to sea and never was heard from that sister did we not lay her away in the freshness of her young life never more in this world to look upon her ah there was a skeleton at the feast and tears mingled with our laughter on that christmas day not so with heaven's reunions it will be an uninterrupted gladness many a christian parent will look around and find all his children there ah he says can it be possible that we are all here life's perils over the jordan passed and not one wanting why even the prodigal is here i almost gave him up how long he despised my counsels but grace hath triumphed all here all here tell the mighty joy through the city let the bells ring and the angels mention it in their song wave it from the top of the walls all here no more breaking of heartstrings but face to face the orphans that were left poor and in a merciless world kicked and cuffed of many hardships shall join their parents over whose graves they so long wept and gaze into their glorified countenances forever face to face we may come up from different parts of the world one from the land and another from the depths of the sea from lives affluent and prosperous or from scenes of ragged distress but we shall all meet in rapture and jubilee face to face many of our friends have entered upon that joy a few days ago they sat with us studying these gospel themes but they only saw dimly now revelation hath come your time will also come god will not leave you floundering in the darkness you stand wonderstruck and amazed you feel as if all the loveliness of life were dashed out you stand gazing into the open chasm of the grave wait a little in the presence of your departed and of him who carries them in his bosom you shall soon stand face to face oh that our last hour may kindle up with this promised joy may we be able to say like the christian not long ago departing though a pilgrim walking through the valley the mountain tops are gleaming from peak to peak or like my dear friend and brother alfred cookman who took his flight to the throne of god saying in his last moment that which has already gone into christian classics i am sweeping through the pearly gate washed in the blood of the lamb End of chapter 4chapter 5 of 25 sermons on the holy land this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by larry wilson 25 sermons on the holy land by thomas dewitt talmage life and death of dorcas and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which dorcas made while she was with them acts nine thirty nine christians of joppa impressed as i am with your mosque the first i ever saw 
and stirred as i am with the fact that your harbor once floated the great rafts of lebanon cedar from which the temples at jerusalem were builded solomon's oxen drawing the logs through this very town on the way to jerusalem nothing can make me forget that this joppa was the birthplace of the sewing society that has blessed the poor of all succeeding ages in all lands the disaster to your town when judas maccabeus set it on fire and napoleon had five hundred prisoners massacred in your neighborhood cannot make me forget that one of the most magnificent charities of the centuries was started in this seaport by dorcas a woman with her needle embroidering her name ineffaceably into the beneficence of the world i see her sitting in yonder home in the doorway and around about the building and in the room where she sits are the pale faces of the poor she listens to their plaint she pities their woe she makes garments for them she adjusts the manufactured articles to suit the bent forms of this invalid woman and to the cripple that comes crawling on his hands and knees she gives a coat to this one she gives sandals to that one with the gifts she mingles prayers and tears and christian encouragement then she goes out to be greeted on the street corners by those whom she has blessed and all through the street the cry is heard dorcas is coming the sick look up gratefully into her face as she puts her hand on the burning brow and the lost and the abandoned start up with hope as they hear her gentle voice as though an angel had addressed them and as she goes out the lane eyes half put out with sin think they see a halo of light around her brow and a trail of glory in her pathway that night a half-paid shipwright climbs the hill and reaches home and sees his little boy well clad and says where did these clothes come from and they tell him dorcas has been up here in another place a woman is trimming a lamp dorcas brought the oil in another place a family that had not been at table for many a week are gathered now for dorcas has brought bread dorcas is dead but there is a sudden pause in that woman's ministry they say where is dorcas why we haven't seen her for many a day where is dorcas and one of these poor people goes up and knocks at the door and finds the mystery solved all through the haunts of wretchedness the news comes dorcas is sick no bulletin flashing from the palace gate telling the stages of a king's disease is more anxiously awaited for than the news from this sick benefactress alas for joppa there is wailing and wailing the voice which has uttered so many cheerful words is hushed that poor hand which has made so many garments for the poor is cold and still the star which had poured light into the midnight of wretchedness is dimmed by the blinding mists that go up from the river of death in every god-forsaken place in this town wherever there is a sick child and no balm wherever there is hunger and no bread wherever there is guilt and no commiseration wherever there is a broken heart and no comfort there are despairing looks and streaming eyes and frantic gesticulations as they cry dorcas is dead they send for the apostle peter who happens to be in the suburbs of this place stopping with a tanner by the name of simon peter urges his way through the crowd around the door and stands in the presence of the dead with expostulation and grief all about him here stand some of the poor people who show the garments which this poor woman had made for them the grief cannot be appeased the apostle peter wants to perform a miracle he will not do it amidst the excited crowd so he kindly orders that the whole room be cleared the door is shut against the populace the apostle stands now with the dead oh it is a serious moment you know when you are alone with a lifeless body the apostle gets down on his knees and prays and then he comes to the lifeless form of this one already for the sepulchre and in the strength of him who is the resurrection tabitha arise there is a stir in the fountains of life the heart flutters the nerves thrill the cheek flushes the eye opens she sits up we see in this subject dorcas the disciple dorcas the benefactress dorcas the lamented dorcas the resurrected a model for all women if i had not seen that word disciple in my text i would have known this woman was a christian 
Such music as that never came from a heart which is not corded and strung by divine grace. Before I show you the needlework of this woman, I want to show you her regenerated heart, the source of a pure life and of all Christian charities. I wish that the wives and mothers and daughters and sisters of all the earth would imitate Dorcas in her discipleship. Before you cross the threshold of the hospital, before you enter upon the temptations and trials of tomorrow, I charge you in the name of God, and by the turmoil and tumult of the judgment day, O woman, that you attend to the first, last, and greatest duty of your life, the seeking for God and being at peace with Him. When the trumpet shall sound, there will be an uproar, and a wreck of mountain and continent, and no human arm can help you. Amidst the rising of the dead, and amidst the boiling of yonder sea, and amidst the live leaping thunder of the flying heavens, calm and placid will be every woman's heart who hath put her trust in Christ. Calm, notwithstanding all the tumult, as though the fire in the heavens were the only gildings of an autumnal sunset, as though the peal of the trumpet were the only harmony of an orchestra, as though the awful voices of the sky were but a group of friends bursting through a gateway at eventime with laughter and shouting. Dorcas, the disciple, would God that every Mary and every Martha would this day sit down at the feet of Jesus. Dorcas, the benefactress. Further, we see Dorcas, the benefactress. History has told the story of the crown. The epic poet has sung of the sword. The pastoral poet, with his verses full of the redolence of clover tops and a rustle with the silk of the corn, has sung the praises of the plough. I tell you the praises of the needle. From the fig-leaf robe prepared in the Garden of Eden to the last stitch taken on the garment for the poor, the needle has wrought wonders of kindness, generosity, and benefaction. It adorned the girdle of the high priest. It fashioned the curtains of the ancient tabernacle. It cushioned the chariots of King Solomon. It provided the robes of Queen Elizabeth, and in high places and in low places, by the fire of the pioneer's backlog, and under the flash of the chandelier, everywhere it has clothed nakedness, it has preached the gospel, it has overcome hosts of penury and want, with the war cry of stitch, stitch, stitch. The operatives have found a livelihood by it, and through it the mansions of the employer have been constructed. Amidst the greatest triumphs in all ages and lands, I set down the conquests of the needle. I admit its crimes, I admit its cruelties. It has had more martyrs than the fire. It has punctured the eye, it has pierced the side. It has struck weakness into the lungs. It has sent madness into the brain. It has filled the potter's field. It has pitched whole armies of the suffering into crime and wretchedness and woe. But now that I am talking of Dorcas and her ministries to the poor, I shall speak only of the charities of the needle. To Charity This woman was a representative of all those women who make garments for the destitute, who knit socks for the barefooted, who prepare bandages for the lacerated, who fix up boxes of clothing for missionaries, who go into the asylums of the suffering and destitute, bearing that gospel which is sight for the blind and hearing for the deaf, and which makes the lame man leap like a heart and brings the dead to life immortal health bounding in their pulses. What a contrast between the practical benevolence of this woman and a great deal of the charity of this day. This woman did not spend her time idly planning how the poor of your city, Joppa, were to be relieved. She took her needle and relieved them. She was not like those persons who sympathize with imaginary sorrows and go out in the street and laugh at the boy who has upset his basket of cold victuals or like that charity which makes a rousing speech on the benevolent platform and goes out to kick the beggar from the step, crying, Hush your miserable howling! The sufferers of the world want not so much theory as practice, not so much tears as dollars, not so much kind wishes as loaves of bread, not so much smiles as shoes, not so much God bless you's as jackets and frocks. I will put one earnest Christian man hard-working against five thousand mere theorists of the subject of charity. There are a great many who have fine ideas about church architecture, who never in their life helped build a church. There are men who can give you the history of Buddhism and Mohammedanism, who never sent a farthing for their evangelization. 
There are women who talk beautifully about the suffering of the world, who never had the courage like Dorcas to take the needle and assault it. Woman's Benevolence I am glad that there is not a page of the world's history which is not a record of female benevolence. God says to all lands and people, Come now, and hear the widow's might rattle down into the poor box. The princess of Conti sold all her jewels that she might help the famine-stricken. Queen Blanche, the wife of Louis the Eighth of France, hearing that there were some persons unjustly incarcerated in the prisons, went out amidst the rabble, and took a stick and struck the door as a signal that they might all strike it, and down went the prison door, and out came the prisoners. Queen Maud, the wife of Henry I, went down amidst the poor and washed their sores, and administered to them cordials. Mrs. Reston at Matagorda appeared on the battlefield while the missiles of death were flying around, and cared for the wounded. Is there a man or woman who has ever heard of the Civil War in America, who has not heard of the women of the Sanitary and Christian Commissions, or the fact that before the smoke had gone up from Gettysburg and South Mountain, the women of the North met the women of the South on the battlefield, forgetting all their animosities while they bound up the wounded and closed the eyes of the slain. Dorcas, the Benefactress. Dorcas the Lamented. I come now to speak of Dorcas the Lamented. When death struck down that good woman, oh, how much sorrow there was in the town of Joppa. I suppose there were women here with larger fortunes, women perhaps with handsomer faces, but there was no grief at their departure like this at the death of Dorcas. There was not more turmoil and upturning in the Mediterranean Sea, dashing against the wharves of this seaport, than there were surgings to and fro of grief because Dorcas was dead. There are a great many who go out of life and are unmissed. There may be a very large funeral. There may be a great many carriages and a plumed hearse. There may be high-sounding eulogiums. The bell may toll at the cemetery gate. There may be a very fine marble shaft rearing over the resting place. But the whole thing may be a falsehood and a sham. The church of God has lost nothing. The world has lost nothing. It is only a nuisance abated. It is only a grumbler ceasing to find fault. It is only an idler stopped yawning. It is only a dissipated fashionable parted from his wine cellar. While on the other hand, no useful Christian leaves this world without being missed. The church of God cries out like the prophet, Howl, fir tree, for the cedar has fallen. Widowhood comes and shows the garments which the departed had made. Orphans are lifted up to look into the calm face of the sleeping benefactress. Reclaimed vagrancy comes and kisses the cold brow of her who charmed it away from sin. And all through the streets of Joppa there is mourning. Mourning because Dorcas is dead. When Josephine of France was carried out to her grave, there were a great many men and women of pomp and pride and position that went out after her. But I am most affected by the story of history that on that day there were ten thousand of the poor of France who followed her coffin, weeping and wailing until the air rang again, because when they lost Josephine, they lost their last earthly friend. Oh, who would not rather have such obsequies than all the tears that were ever poured into the lacrimals that have been exhumed from ancient cities? There may be no mass for the dead. There may be no costly sarcophagus. There may be no elaborate mausoleum. But in the damp cellars of the city and through the lonely huts of the mountain glen, there will be mourning, 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 because Dorcas is dead. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Dorcas the Resurrected I speak to you of Dorcas the Resurrected. The apostle came to where she was and said, Arise, and she sat up. In what a short compass the great writer put that. She sat up. Oh, what a time there must have been around this town when the apostle brought her out among her old friends. How the tears of joy must have started. What clapping of hands there must have been. What singing. What laughter. Sounded all through that lane. Shouted down the dark alley. Let all Joppa hear it. Dorcas is resurrected. You and I have seen the same thing many a time. Not a dead body resuscitated, 
but the deceased coming up again after death in the good accomplished. If a man labors up to fifty years of age serving God and then dies, we are apt to think that his earthly work is done. No, his influence on earth will continue till the world ceases. Services rendered for Christ never stop. A Christian woman toils for the upbuilding of a church through many anxieties, through many self-denials, with prayers and tears, and then she dies. It is fifteen years since she went away. Now the Spirit of God descends upon that church. Hundreds of souls stand up and confess the faith of Christ. Has that Christian woman who went away fifteen years ago nothing to do with these things? I see the flowering of her noble heart. I hear the echo of her footsteps in all the songs over sins forgiven, in all the prosperity of the church. The good that seemed to be buried has come up again. Dorcas is resurrected. Asleep in Jesus After a while all these womanly friends of Christ will put down their needles forever. After making garments for others, someone will make a garment for them. The last robe we ever wear, the robe for the grave. You will have heard the last cry of pain. You will have witnessed the last orphanage. You will have come in worn out from your last round of mercy. I do not know where you will sleep, nor what your epitaph will be. But there will be a lamp burning at the tomb, and an angel of God guarding it. And through all the long night, no rude foot will disturb the dust. Sleep on. Sleep on. Soft bed, pleasant shadows, undisturbed repose. Sleep on. Asleep in Jesus, blessed sleep, from which none ever wake to weep. Then one day there will be a sky rending, and a whirl of wheels, and the flash of a pageant, armies marching, chains clanking, banners waving, thunders booming, and that Christian woman will rise from the dust, and she will be suddenly surrounded, surrounded by the wanderers of the street whom she reclaimed, surrounded by the wounded souls to whom she administered daughter of god so strangely surrounded what means this it means that reward has come that the victory is won that the crown is ready that the banquet is spread shout it through all the crumbling earth sing it through all the flying heavens dorcas is resurrected the great and final reward in eighteen fifty five when some of the soldiers came back from the crimean war to london the Queen of England distributed among them beautiful medals called Crimean medals. Galleries were erected for the two houses of Parliament and the royal family to sit in. There was a great audience to witness the distribution of the medals. Her colonel, who had lost both feet in the Battle of Inkerman, was pulled in on a wheelchair. Others came in limping on their crutches. Then the Queen of England arose before them in the name of her government and uttered words of commendation to the officers and men and distributed these medals inscribed with the four great battlefields, Alma, Balaclava, Inkerman, and Sebastopol. As the Queen gave these to the wounded men and the wounded officers, the bands of music struck up the national air, and the people with streaming eyes joined in the song. God save our gracious Queen, long live our noble Queen, God save the Queen. And then they shouted, Huzza, Huzza! Oh, it was a proud day for those returned warriors. But a brighter, better and gladder day will come when Christ shall gather those who have toiled in his service, good soldiers of Jesus Christ. He shall rise before them, and in the presence of all the glorified of heaven, he will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. And then he will distribute the medals of eternal victory, not inscribed with works of righteousness which we have done, but with those four great battlefields, dear to earth and dear to heaven. Bethlehem, Nazareth, Gethsemane, Calvary. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of 25 Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Durham. 25 Sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. Chapter 6 The Glory of Solomon Drain. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Matthew 23, 
37. This exclamation burst from Christ's lips as he came in sight of this great city. And although things have marvelously changed, who can visit Jerusalem today without having its mighty past roll over him? And ordinary utterance must give place for the exclamatory as we cry, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Disappointed with the Holy Land, many have been. And I have heard good friends say that their ardor about sacred places had been so dampened that they were sorry they ever visited Jerusalem. But with me, the city and its surroundings are a rapture, a solemnity, an overwhelming emotion. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem! The procession of kings, conquerors, poets, and immortal men and women pass before me as I stand here. Among the throng are Solomon, David, and Christ. Yes, through these streets and amid these surroundings rode Solomon, that wonder of splendor and wretchedness. It seemed as if the world exhausted itself on that man. It wove its brightest flowers into his garland. It set its richest gems in his coronet. It pressed the rarest wine to his lips. It robed him in the purest purple and embroidery. It cheered him with the sweetest music in that land of harps. It greeted him with the gladdest laughter that ever leaped from mirth's lips. It sprinkled his cheek with spray from the brightest fountains. Royalty had no dominion. Wealth, no luxury. Gold, no glitter. Flowers, no sweetness. Song, no melody. Light, no radiance. Upholstery, no gorgeousness. Waters, no gleam. Birds, no plumage. Prancing coursers, no metal. Architecture, no grandeur. But it was all his. Across the thick grass of the lawn, fragrant with tufts of campfire from Ingati, fell the long shadows of trees brought from distant forests. Fish pools, fed by artificial channels that brought the streams from hills far away, were perpetually ruffled with fins and golden scales that shot from water cave to water cave, with endless dive and swirl, attracting the gaze of foreign potentates. Birds, that had been brought from foreign aviaries, glanced and fluttered among the foliage, and called to their mates far beyond the sea. From the royal stables there came up the neighing of twelve thousand horses standing in blankets of Tyrian purple, chewing their bits over troughs of gold, waiting for the king's order to be brought out in front of the palace, when the official dignitaries would leap into the saddle for some grand parade, or harnessed to some of the fourteen hundred chariots of the king, the fiery chargers with flaunting mane and throbbing nostril would make the earth jar with the tramp of hoofs and the thunder of wheels. While within and without the palace, you could not think of a single luxury that could be added, or of a single splendor that could be kindled. Down on the banks of the sea, the dry docks of Ezion Gebar rang with the hammers of the shipwrights who were constructing larger vessels for still wider commerce. For all lands and climes were to be robed to make up Solomon's glory. No rest till his keels shall cut every sea, his axemen you every forest, his archers strike every rare wing. His fishermen whip every stream. His merchants trade in every bazaar. His name be honored in every tribe. And royalty shall have no dominion. Wealth, no luxury. Gold, no glitter. Song, no melody. Light, no radiance. Waters, no gleam. Birds, no plumage. Prancing coursers, no metal, upholstery, no gorgeousness, architecture, no grandeur, but it was all his. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Well, 
you say, if there is any man happy, he ought to be. But I hear him coming out through the palace and see his robes actually encrusted with jewels as he stands in the front and looks out upon the vast domain. What does he say? King Solomon, great is your dominion. Great is your honor. Great is your joy. No. While standing here amidst all the splendor, the tears start, and his heart breaks, and he exclaims, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What? Solomon? Not happy yet? No, not happy. The honors and the emoluments of this world bring so many cares with them that they bring also torture and disquietude. Pharaoh sits on one of the highest earthly eminences, yet he is miserable because there are some people in his realm that do not want any longer to make bricks. The head of Edward I aches under his crown because the people will not pay the taxes, and Llewellyn, Prince of Wales, will not do him homage, and Wallace would be a hero. Frederick William III of Prussia is miserable because France wants to take the Prussian provinces. The world is not large enough for Louis the Fourteenth and William the Third. The ghastliest suffering and the most shriveling fear, the most rending jealousies, the most gigantic disquietude, have walked amidst obiescus courtiers and been clothed in royal apparel and sat on the judgment seats of power. Honor and truth and justice cannot go so high up in authority as to be beyond the range of human assault. The pure and the good in all ages have been execrated by the mob who cry out, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. By honesty, by Christian principle, I would have you seek for the favor and the confidence of your fellow men. But do not look upon some high position as though that there were always sunshine. The mountains of earthly honor are like the mountains of Switzerland, covered with perpetual ice and snow. Having obtained the confidence and love of your associates, be content with such things as you have. You brought nothing into this world, and it is very certain you can carry nothing out. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils. There is an honor that is worth possessing, but it is an honor that comes from God. This day rise up and take it. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Who aspires not for that royalty? Come now, and be kings and priests unto God and the Lamb forever. If wealth and wisdom could have satisfied a man, Solomon would have been satisfied. To say that Solomon was a millionaire gives but a very imperfect idea of the property he inherited from David his father. He had at his command gold to the value of 680 million pounds, and he had silver to the value of 1,029,377,000 pounds sterling. The Queen of Sheba made him a nice little present of 720,000 pounds, and Hiram made him a present of the same amount. If he had lost the value of a whole realm out of his pocket, it would have hardly been worth his while to stoop down and pick it up. He wrote 1,005 songs. He wrote 3,000 proverbs. He wrote about almost everything. The Bible says distinctly he wrote about plants from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that groweth out of the wall, and about birds and beasts and fishes. No doubt he put off his royal robes and put on his hunter's trappings, and he went out with arrows to bring down the rarest specimens of birds. And then 
with his fishing apparatus, he went down to the stream to bring up the denizens of the deep and plunged into the forest and found the rarest specimens of flowers. And then he came back to his study and he wrote books about zoology, the science of animals, about ictology, the science of fishes, about ornithology, the science of birds, about botany, the science of plants. Yet, notwithstanding all his wisdom and wealth, behold his wretchedness, and let him pass on. Did any other city ever behold so wonderful of a man? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. David's Greatest Grief But here passes through these streets, as in the imagination I see him, quite as wonderful and a far better man. David, the conqueror, the king, the poet. Can it be that I am in the very city where he lived and reigned? David, great for power and great for grief. He was wrapped up in his boy Absalom. He was a splendid boy, judged by all the rules of worldly criticism. From the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, there was not a single blemish. The Bible says that he had such a luxuriant lock of hair that once a year when it was shorn, what was cut off weighed over three pounds. But notwithstanding all his brilliancy of appearance, he was a bad boy, and he broke his father's heart. He was plotting to get the throne of Israel. He had marshaled an army to overthrow his father's government. The day of battle had come. The conflict was begun. David, the father, he sat between the gates of the palace waiting for the tidings of the conflict. Oh, how rapidly his heart beat with emotion. Two great questions were to be decided. The safety of his boy and the continuance of the throne of Israel. After a while, a servant, standing on the top of a house, looks off and he sees someone running. He is coming with great speed, and the man on the top of the house announces the coming of the messenger, and the father watches and waits. And as soon as the messenger from the field of battle comes within hailing distance, the father cries out, Is it a question in regard to the establishment of his throne? Does he say, Have the armies of Israel been victorious? Am I to continue in my imperial authority? Have I overthrown my enemies? Oh, no. There is one question that springs from his heart to his lips and springs from the lip into the ear of the besweated and bedusted messenger flying from the battlefield. The question, Is the young man Absalom safe? When it was told to David, the king, that though his armies had been victorious, his son had been slain, the father turned his back upon the congratulations of the nation and went up the stairs of the palace, his heart breaking as he went, wringing his hands sometimes and then again, pressing them against his temples as though he would press them in, crying, O oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom. My son, my son. Stupendous grief of David resounding through all seceding ages. This was the city that heard the woe. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I am also thrilled and overpowered with the remembrance that yonder, where now stands a Mohammedan mosque, stood the temple, the very one that Christ visited. Solomon's temple had stood there but Nebuchadnezzar thundered it down. Zerubbabel's temple had stood there, but that had been prostrated. Then Herod built a temple, because he was fond of great architecture, and he wanted the preceding temples to seem insignificant. Put eight or ten modern cathedrals together, and they would not equal that structure. It covered nineteen acres. There were marble pillars supporting roofs of cedar and silver tables on which stood golden lamps. 
and there were carvings, exquisite, and inscriptions, resplendent, glittering balustrades, and ornamented gateways. The building of this temple kept 10,000 workmen busy for 46 years. Stupendous pile of pomp and magnificence. But the material and architectural grandeur of the building were very tame compared with the spiritual meaning of its altars and holy of holies and the overwhelming significance of its ceremonies. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Christ's last visit there. But standing in this old city, all other facts are eclipsed when we think that near here our blessed Lord was born, that up and down the streets of this city he walked, and that in the outskirts of it he died. Here was his only day of triumph and his assassination. One day, this old Jerusalem is at the tip-top of excitement. Christ has been doing some remarkable works and asserting very high authority. The police court has issued papers for his arrest, for this thing must be stopped, as the very government is imperiled. News comes that last night this stranger arrived at a suburban village, and that he is stopping at the house of a man whom he had resuscitated after four days' sepulture. Well, the people rush out into the streets, some with the idea of helping in the arrest of this stranger when he arrives, and others expecting that on the morrow he will come into town and by some supernatural force oust the municipal and royal authorities and take everything in his own hands. They pour out of the city gates until the procession reaches to the village. They come all around about the house where the stranger is stopping and peer into the doors and the windows that they may get a glimpse of him or hear the hum of his voice. The police dare not make the arrest because he has somehow won the affections of all the people. Oh, it is a lively night in yonder Bethany. The heretofore quiet village is filled with uproar and outcry and loud discussions about the strange acting countryman. I do not think that there was any sleep in that house that night where the stranger was stopping. Although he came in weary, he finds no rest, though for once in his lifetime he had a pillow. But the morning dawns, the olive gardens wave in the light, and all along yonder road reaching over the top of the Olivet towards the city, there is a vast swaying crowd of wandering people. The excitement around the door of the cottage is wild as the stranger steps out beside an unbroken colt that had never been mounted, and after his friends had strewn their garments on the beast for a saddle, the Savior mounts it, and the populace, excited and shouting and feverish, push on back toward the city of Jerusalem. Let none jeer now or scoff at this rider or the populace will trample him underfoot in an instant. There is one long shout of two miles, and as far as the eye can reach, you see wavings of demonstrations and approval. There was something in the rider's visage, something in his majestic brow, something in his princely behavior that steers up the enthusiasm of the people. They run up against the beast, and they try to pull the rider off into their arms and carry on their shoulders the illustrious stranger. The populace are so excited that they hardly know what to do with themselves, and some rush up to the roadside trees and they wrench off branches and they throw them in his way, and others doff their garments, what though they be new and costly, and spread them for a carpet for the conqueror to ride over. Hosanna! cry the people at the foot of the hill. Hosanna! cry the people all up and down the mountain. The procession has now come to the brow of yonder Olivet. Magnificent prospect, reaching out in every direction. Vineyards, olive groves, jutting rock, silvery shalom. And above all, 
rising on its throne of hills, this most highly honored city of all the earth, Jerusalem. Christ, there, in the midst of the procession, looks off, and he sees her fortress gates, and yonder the circling wall, and here the towers blazing in the sun, Phesalius and Mariam, yonder is Hippicus, the king's castle, looking along in the range of the larger branch of that olive tree, you see the mansions of the merchant princes. Through this cleft in the limestone rock, you can see the palace of the richest trafficker in all the earth. He has made his money by selling Tyrian purple. Behold now the temple, clouds of smoke lifting from the shimmering roof, while the building rises up, beautiful, grand, majestic. The architectural skill and glory of the earth lifting themselves there in one triumphant doxology, the frozen prayer of all nations. Personality of Christ The crowd looked around to see exhilaration and transport in the face of Christ? Oh, no. No. Out from amid the gates and the domes and the palaces, there arose a vision of this city's sin and this city's doom which obliterated the landscape from horizon to horizon. And he burst into tears, crying, Oh, Jerusalem! Jerusalem! But that was the only day of pomp that Jesus saw in and around the city. Yet he walked the streets of this city, and the loveliest and the most majestic being the world ever saw or ever will see. Publius Lentius in a letter to the Roman Senate, describes him as a man of stature, somewhat tall, his hair the color of a chestnut fully ripe, plain to the ears, whence downward it was more orient, curling and waving about the shoulders. In the midst of his forehead is a stream or partition of his hair, forehead plain and very delicate, his face without spot or wrinkle, a lovely red, his nose and mouth so formed as nothing can be represented, his beard thick in color like his hair, not very long, his eyes gray, quick, and clear. He must die. The French army in Italy found a brass plate on which was a copy of his death warrant, signed by John Zerubbabel, Raphael Roboni, Daniel Roboni, and Capet. Sometimes, men on the way to the scaffold have been rescued by the mob. No such attempt was made in this case, for the mob was against him. From nine in the morning till three in the afternoon, Jesus hung dying in the outskirts of the city. It was a scene of blood. We are so constituted that nothing is so exciting as blood. It is not the child's cry in the street that so arouses you as the crimson dripping from its lips. In the dark hall, seeing the finger marks of blood on the plastering makes you cry, What terrible deed has been done here? Looking upon the suspended victim of the cross, we thrill with the sight of blood. Blood dripping from thorn and nail. Blood rushing upon his cheek blood saturating his garments, blood gathered in a pool beneath. It is called an honor to have in one's veins the blood of the house of Stuart or of the house of Habsburg. Is it nothing when I point to you the outpouring blood of the king of the universe? In England, the name of Henry was so great that its honors were divided among different reigns. It was Henry the First, and Henry the Second, and Henry the Third, and Henry the Fourth, and Henry the Fifth. In France, the name of Louis was so favorably regarded that it was Louis the First, Louis the Second, Louis the Third, and so on and so on. But the king who walked these streets was Christ the First, Christ the Last, and Christ the Only. He reigned before the Tsar mounted the throne of Russia, 
or the throne of Austria was lifted. King, eternal, immortal. Through the indulgences of the royal family, the physical life degenerates, and some of the kings have been almost imbecile, their bodies weak, their blood thin and watery. But the crimson life that flowed upon Calvary had in it the health of the immortal God. The Death and Resurrection Tell it now to all of the earth and to all the heavens. Jesus, our King, is sick with his last sickness. Let couriers carry the swift dispatch. His pains are worse. He is breathing a last groan. Through his body quivers the last anguish. The king is dying. The king is dead. It is royal blood. It is said that some religionists make too much of the humanity of Christ. I respond that we make too little. If some Roman surgeon standing under the cross had caught one drop of the blood on his hand and analyzed it, it would have been found to have been the same plasma, the same disc, the same fibrin, the same albumin. It was unmistakably human blood. It was a man that hung there. His bones are of the same material as ours. His nerves are as sensitive as ours. If it were an angel being despoiled, I would not feel it so much, for it belongs to a different order of being. But my Savior is a man, and my whole sympathy is aroused. I can imagine how the spikes felt, how hot the temples burned, what deathly sickness seized his heart, how mountain and city and mob swam away from his dying vision. Something of the meaning of that cry for help that makes the blood of all the ages curdle with horror. My God, my God, why has you forsaken me? Forever, with all these scenes of a Savior's suffering, will this city be associated. Here, his unjust trial, and here, his death. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. But finally, I am thrilled with the fact that this city is a symbol of heaven, which is only another Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. And this thought has kindled the imagination of all the sacred poets. I am glad that Horatio Bonar, the Scotch hymnist, rummaged among old manuscripts of the British Museum until he found that hymn in ancient spelling, parts of which we have in mutilated form in our modern hymn books, but the quaint power of which we do not get in our modern versions. Jerusalem, my happy home, when shall I come to thee? When shall my sorrows have an end? Thy joys, when shall I see? No dampish mist is seen in thee, no cold, no darksome night. There every soul shines as the sun, there God himself gives light. The walls are made of prettiest stones, thy bulwarks diamonds square. Thy gates are of a right orient pearl, exceedingly rich and rare. Thy turrets and thy pinnacles with carbuncles do shine. Thy very streets are paved with gold, surpassing clear and fine. Thy houses are of ivory, thy windows crystal clear. Thy tiles are made of beaten gold, O oh God, that I was there. Our sweat is mixed with bitter gall, our pleasure is but pain. Our joy scarce last the looking on, our sorrows still remain. But there they live in such delight, such pleasure, and such play, as that to them a thousand years does seem as yesterday. Thy gardens and thy gallant walks continually are green. There grow such sweet and pleasant flowers as nowhere else are seen. There trees forever bear fruit and evermore do spring. There evermore the angels sit and evermore they do sing. Jerusalem, my happy home, 
Would God I were in thee. Would God my woes were at an end. Thy joys that I might see. End of chapter 6. Recording by Ryan Durham. Chapter 7 of 25 Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. 25 Sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. Peace be still. Entered into a ship and went over to the sea toward Capernaum. John six seventeen, and he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, Mark four thirty nine. Here in this seashore village was the temporary home of that Christ, who for the most of his life was homeless. On the site of this village, now in ruins, and all around this lake, what scenes of kindness and power and glory and pathos when our Lord lived here! It has been the wish of my life. I cannot say hope, for I never expected the privilege to stand on the banks of Galilee. What a solemnity and what a rapture to be here! I can now understand the feeling of the immortal Scotchman, Robert McShane, when sitting on the banks of this lake he wrote, It is not that the wild gazelle comes down to drink thy tide, but he that was pierced and saved from hell, oft wandered by thy side. Graceful around thee the mountains meet, thou calm reposing sea but ah far more the beautiful feet of jesus walked o'er thee i can now easily understand from the contour of the country that bounds this lake that storms were easily tempted to make these waters their playground from the gentle way this lake treated our boat when we sailed on it yesterday one would have thought it incapable of a paroxysm of rage but it was quite different on both the occasions spoken of in my two texts I closed my eyes, and the shore of Lake Galilee, as it now is, with but little signs of human life, disappears, and there comes back to my vision the lake as it was in Christ's time. It lay in a scene of great luxuriance, the surrounding hills, terrace sloped, grooved, so many hanging gardens of beauty. On the shore were castles, armed towers, Roman baths, everything attractive and beautiful all styles of vegetation in shorter space than in almost any other space in all the world from the palm tree of the forest to the trees of rigorous climate it seemed as if the lord had launched one wave of beauty on all that scene and it hung and swung from rock and hill and oleander roman gentlemen in pleasure boats sailing this lake and countrymen in fish smacks coming down to drop their nets pass each other with nod and shout of laughter or swinging idly at their moorings. Oh, what a beautiful scene! It seems as if we shall have a quiet night. Not a leaf winked in the air, not a ripple disturbed the face of Genesaret. But there seems to be a little excitement up the beach, and we hasten to see what it is, and we find it an embarkation. The voyage begins. From the western shore a flotilla pushing out, not a squadron or deadly armament, nor clipper with valuable merchandise, nor piratic vessels ready to destroy everything they could seize, but a flotilla bearing messengers of life and light and peace. Christ is in the back of the boat. His disciples are in a smaller boat. Jesus, weary with much speaking to large multitudes, is put into somnolence by the rocking of the waves. If there was any motion at all, the ship was easily righted. If the wind passed from starboard to larboard, or from larboard to starboard, the boat would rock, and by gentleness of the motion putting the master asleep. And they extemporized a pillow made out of a fisherman's coat. I think no sooner is Christ prostrate, and his head touches the pillow, than he is sound asleep. The breezes of the lake run their fingers through the locks of the worn sleeper, and the boat rises and falls like a sleeping child on the bosom of a sleeping mother. Calm night, starry night, beautiful night. Run up all the sails, ply all the oars, and let the large boat and the small boat glide over gentle Genesaret. But the sailors say there is going to be a change of weather, and even the passengers can hear the moaning of the storm 
as it comes on with great strides and all the terrors of hurricane and darkness the large boat trembles like a deer at bay among the clangor of the hounds great patches of foam are flung into the air the sails of the vessel loosen and the sharp winds crack like pistols the smaller boats like petrels poise on the cliffs of the waves and then plunge saved by christ overboard go cargo tackling and masts and the drenched disciples rush into the back part of the boat and lay hold of christ and say unto him master carest thou not that we perish that great personage lifts his head from the pillow of the fisherman's coat walks to the front of the vessel and looks out into the storm all around him are the smaller boats driven in the tempest and through it comes the cry of drowning men by the flash of lightning i see the calm brow of christ as the spray dropped from his beard he has one word for the sky and another for the waves looking upward he cries peace looking downward he says be still the waves fall flat on their faces the foam melts and extinguished stars relight their torches the tempest falls dead and christ stands with his feet on the neck of the storm and while the sailors are bailing out the boats and while they are trying to untangle the cordage the disciples stand in amazement now looking into the calm sea then into the calm sky then into the calm saviour's countenance and then they cry out what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him the subject in the first place impresses me with the fact that it is very important to have christ in the ship for all those boats would have gone to the bottom of Genesaret if christ had not been present oh what a lesson for you and for me to learn we must always have christ in the ship whatever voyage we undertake into whatever enterprise we start let us always have christ in the ship all you can do with utmost tension of body mind and soul you are bound to do but oh have christ in every enterprise christ in every voyage the necessity of god's help there are men who ask god's help at the beginning of great enterprises he has been with them in the past no trouble can overthrow them the storms might come down from the top of mount hermon and lash generous ret into foam and into agony but it could not hurt them but here is another man who starts out in worldly enterprise and he depends upon the uncertainties of this life he has no god to help him after a while the storm comes and tosses off the masts of the ship he puts out his lifeboat and the longboat the sheriff and the auctioneer try to help him off they can't help him off he must go down no christ in the ship your life will be made up of sunshine and shadow there may be in it arctic blasts or tropical tornadoes i know not what is before you but i know if you have christ with you all shall be well you may seem to get along without the religion of christ while everything goes smoothly but after a while when sorrow hovers over the soul when the waves of trial dash clear over the hurricane deck and the decks are crowded with piratical disasters oh what would you do then without christ in the ship take god for your portion god for your guide god for your help then all is well all is well for time all shall be well forever blessed is that man who puts in the lord his trust he shall never be confounded but my subject also impresses me with the fact that when people start to follow christ they must not expect smooth sailing the troubles of the apostles these disciples got into the small boats and i have no doubt they said what a beautiful day it is what a smooth sea what a bright sky this is how delightful is sailing in this boat and as for the waves under the keel of the boat why they only make the motion of our little boat more delightful but when the wind swept down and the sea was tossed into wrath then they found that following christ was not smooth sailing so you have found it so i have found it did you ever notice the end of the life of the apostles of jesus christ you would say if ever men ought to have had a smooth life a smooth departure then those men 
The disciples of Jesus Christ ought to have such a departure and such a life. St. James lost his head. St. Philip was hung to death on a pillar. St. Matthew had his life dashed out with a halbert. St. Mark was dragged to death through the streets. St. James the Less was beaten to death with a fuller's club. St. Thomas was struck through with a spear. They did not find following Christ smooth sailing. Oh, how they were all tossed in the tempest. John Huss in the fire. Hugh McHale in the hour of martyrdom. The Albigenses, the Waldenesses, the Scotch Covenanters. Did they find it smooth sailing? But why go into history when we can draw from our own memory illustrations of the truth of what I say? Some young man in a store trying to serve God, while his employer scoffs at Christianity. The young men in the same store, antagonistic to the Christian religion, teasing him, tormenting him about his religion, trying to get him mad. They succeed in getting him mad, saying, You are a pretty Christian. Does that young man find it smooth sailing when he tries to follow Christ? Or you remember a Christian girl. Her father despises the Christian religion. Her mother despises the Christian religion. Her brothers and sisters scoff at the Christian religion. She can hardly find a quiet place in which to say her prayers. Did she find it smooth sailing when she tried to follow Jesus Christ? Oh, no. All who would live the life of the Christian religion must suffer persecution. If you do not find it in one way, you will get it in another way. The question was asked, Who are those nearest the throne? And the answer came back, These are they who came up out of great tribulation, great flailing, as the original has it, great flailing, great pounding, and had their robes washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, do not be disheartened. Take courage. You are in glorious companionship. God will see you through all trials, and he will deliver you. My subject also impresses me with the fact that good people sometimes get very much frightened. No Real Cause for Fear In the tones of these disciples, as they rushed into the back part of the boat, I find they are frightened almost to death. They say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They had no reason to be frightened, for Christ was in the boat. I suppose if we had been there, we would have been just as much affrighted. Perhaps more. In all ages, very good people got very much affrighted. It is often so in our day, and men say, Why look at the bad lectures? Look at the various errors going over the Church of God. We are going to founder. The Church is going to perish. She is going down. Oh, how many good people are affrighted by iniquity in our day! and think the Church of Jesus Christ is going to be overthrown, and are just as much affrighted as were the disciples of my text. Don't worry, don't fret, as though iniquity were going to triumph over righteousness. A lion goes into a cavern to sleep. He lies down with his shaggy mane covering the paws. Meanwhile, the spider spins a web across the mouth of the cavern, and say, We have captured him. Gossamer thread after gossamer thread, until the whole front of the cavern is covered with a spider's web, and the spiders say, The lion is done, the lion is fast. After a while the lion has got through sleeping. He rouses himself and shakes his mane. He walks out into the sunlight. He does not even know the spider's web is spun, and with his voice he shakes the mountain. So men come spinning their sophistries and skepticism about Jesus Christ. He seems to be sleeping. They say, We have captured the Lord. He will never come forth again upon the nation. Christ is captured forever. His religion will never make any conquest among men. But after a while, the lion of the tribe of Judah will rouse himself and come forth to shake mightily the nations. What's a spider's web to the aroused lion? Give truth and error a fair grapple, and truth will come off victor. But there are a great many good people who get affrighted in other respects. They are affrighted in our day about revivals. They say, Oh, this is a strong religious gale. We are afraid the church of God is going to be upset, and there are going to be a great many people brought into the church that are going to be of no use to it. And they are affrighted when they see a revival taking hold of the churches. 
as though a ship captain with five thousand bushels of wheat for a cargo should say some day coming upon deck throw overboard all the cargo and the sailor should say why captain what do you mean throw over all the cargo oh says the captain we have a peck of chaff that has got into this five thousand bushels of wheat and the only way to get rid of the chaff is to throw all the wheat overboard now that is a great deal wiser than the talk of a great many christians who want to throw overboard all the thousands and tens of thousands of souls who are the subjects of revivals throw all overboard because they are brought into the kingdom of god through great revivals because there is a peck of chaff a quart of chaff a pint of chaff i say let them stay until the last day the lord will divide the chaff from the wheat do not be afraid of great revival oh that such gales from heaven might sweep through all our churches oh for such day as richard baxter saw in england and robert mcshane saw in dundee oh for such days as jonathan edwards saw in northampton i have often heard my father tell of the fact that in the early part of this century a revival broke out in somerville new jersey and some people were very much agitated about it they said oh you are going to bring too many people into the church at once and they sent down to new brunswick to get john livingston to stop the revival well there was no better soul in all the world than john livingston he went and looked at the revival they wanted him to stop it he stood in the pulpit on the sabbath and looked over the solemn auditory and he said this brethren is in reality the work of god beware how you try to stop it and he was an old man leaning heavily on his staff a very old man and he lifted that staff and took hold of the small end of the staff and began to let it fall slowly between the finger and the thumb and he said oh thou impenitent thou art falling now falling from life falling away from peace and heaven falling as certainly as that cane is falling through my hand falling certainly though perhaps falling slowly and the cane kept on falling through john livingston's hand the religious emotion in the audience was overpowering the men saw a type of their doom as the cane kept falling until the knob of the cane struck mr livingston's hand and he clasped it stoutly and said but the grace of god can stop you as i stop that cane and then there was a gladness all through the house at the fact of pardon and peace and salvation well said the people after the service i guess you had better send livingston home he is making the revival worse oh for gales from heaven to sweep all the continents the danger of the church of god is not in revivals god and man again my subject impressed me with the fact that jesus was god and man in the same being here he is in the back part of the boat oh how tired he looks what sad dreams he must have look at his countenance he must be thinking of the cross to come look at him he is a man bone of our bone flesh of our flesh tired he falls asleep he is a man but then i find christ at the prow of the boat i hear him say peace be still and i see the storm kneeling at his feet and the tempests folding their wings in his presence he is god if i have sorrow and trouble and want sympathy i go and kneel down at the back part of the boat and say o oh christ weary one of genesaret sympathize with all my sorrows man of nazareth man of the cross a man a man but if i want to conquer my spiritual foes if i want to get the victory over sin death and hell i come to the front of the boat and i kneel down and i say o lord jesus christ thou who dost hush the tempest hush all my grief hush all my temptation hush all my sin a man a man a god a god i learn once more from this subject that christ can hush a tempest it did seem as if everything must go to ruin the disciples had given up the idea of managing the ship the crew were entirely demoralized yet christ rises and he puts his foot on the storm and it crouches at his feet oh yes christ can hush the tempest you have had trouble perhaps it was the little child taken away from you the sweetest child of the household 
the one who asked the most curious questions and stood around you with the greatest fondness and the spade cut down through your bleeding heart perhaps it was an only son and your heart has ever since been like a desolated castle the owls of the night hooting among the fallen arches and crumbling stairways perhaps it was an aged mother you always went to her with your troubles she was in your home to welcome your children into life and when they died she was there to pity you that old hand will do you no more kindness that white lock of hair you put away in the casket or in the locket didn't look as it usually did when she brushed it away from her wrinkled brow in the home circle or the country church or your property is gone you said i have so much bank stock i have so many government securities i have so many houses i have so many farms all gone all gone why sir all the storms that ever trampled with their thunders all the shipwrecks have not been worse than this is to you yet you have not been completely overthrown why christ says i have that little one in my keeping i can care for him as well as you can better than you can o oh, bereaved mother hushing the tempest when your property went away god said there are treasures in heaven in banks that never break jesus hushing the tempest there is one storm into which we all will have to run the moment when we let go of this world and try to take hold of the next we will want all the grace possible yonder i see a christian soul rocking on the surges of death all the powers of darkness seem to let out against that soul the swirling wave the thunder of the sky the shriek of the wind all seem to unite together but that soul is not troubled there is no sighing there are no tears plenty of tears in the room at the departure but he weeps no tears calm satisfied and peaceful all is well by the flash of the storm you see the harbor just ahead and you are making for that harbor all shall be well jesus being our guide into the harbor of heaven now we glide we're home at last home at last softly we drift on the bright silvery tide we're home at last glory to god all dangers are o'er we stand secure on the glorified shore glory to god we will shout evermore we're home at last end of chapter seven Chapter 8 of 25 Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. 25 Sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. The Marriage Feast. Thou hast kept the good wine until now. John 2.10 standing not far off from the demolished town of what was once called cana of galilee i bethink myself of our lord's first manhood miracle which has been the astonishment of the ages my visit last week to that place makes vivid in my mind that beautiful occurrence in christ's ministry my text brings us to a wedding in that village it is a wedding in common life two plain people pledged to each other hand and heart and their friends having come in for congratulation the joy is not the less because there is no pretension in each other they find all the future they want the daisy in the cup and on the table may mean as much as a score of artistic garlands fresh from the hothouse when a daughter goes off from home with nothing but a plain father's blessing and a plain mother's love she is missed as much as though she were a princess it seems hard after parents have sheltered her for eighteen years that in a few short months her affection should have been carried off by another but mother remembers how it was in her own case when she was young and so she braces up until the wedding has passed and the banqueters are gone and she has a good cry all alone well we are today at the wedding in cana of galilee jesus and his mother have been invited it is evident there are more people there than were expected either some people have come who were not invited or more invitations have been sent out than it was supposed would be accepted 
of course there is not enough supply of wine you know that there is nothing more embarrassing to a housekeeper than a scant supply jesus sees the embarrassment and he comes up immediately to relieve it he sees standing six water pots he orders the servants to fill them with water then waves his hand over the water and immediately it is wine real wine taste of it and see for yourselves no logwood in it no strychnine in it but first-rate wine i will not now be diverted to the question so often discussed in my own country whether it is right to drink wine i am describing the scene as it was when god makes wine he makes the very best wine and one hundred and thirty gallons of it standing around in those water-pots wine so good that the ruler of the feast tastes it and says why this is really better than anything we have had thou hast kept the good wine until now beautiful miracle a prize was offered to the person who should write the best essay about the miracle in cana long manuscripts were presented in the competition but a poet won the prize by just this one line descriptive of the miracle the unconscious water saw its god and blushed what the miracle teaches we learn from this miracle in the first place that christ has sympathy with housekeepers you might have thought that jesus would have said i cannot be bothered with this household deficiency of wine it is not for me lord of heaven and earth to become caterer to this feast i have vaster things than this to attend to not so said jesus the wine gave out and jesus by miraculous power came to the rescue does there ever come a scant supply in your household have you to make a very close calculation is it hard for you to carry on things decently and respectably if so don't sit down and cry don't go out and fret but go to him who stood in the house of cana of galilee pray in the parlor pray in the kitchen let there be no room at all in your house unconsecrated by the voice of prayer if you have a microscope put under it one drop of water and see the insects floating about and when you see that god makes them and cares for them and feeds them come to the conclusion that he will take care of you and feed you o ye of little faith a boy asked me if he might sweep the snow from the steps of a house the lady of the household said yes you seem very poor he says i am very poor she says don't you sometimes get discouraged and feel that god is going to let you starve the lad looked up in the woman's face and said do you think god will let me starve when i trust in him and then do the best i can enough theology for older people trust in god and do the best you can amidst all the worriments of housekeeping go to him he will help you control your temper and supervise your domestics and entertain your guests and manage your home economies there are hundreds of women weak and nervous and exhausted with the cares of housekeeping i commend you to the lord jesus christ as the best adviser and the most efficient aid the lord jesus who performed his first miracle to relieve a housekeeper i learn also from this miracle that christ does things in abundance i think a small supply of wine would have made up for the deficiency i think certainly they must have had enough for half of the guests one gallon of wine will do certainly five gallons will be enough certainly ten but jesus goes on and gives them thirty gallons and forty gallons and fifty gallons and seventy gallons and one hundred gallons and one hundred and thirty gallons of the very best wine the creator's generosity it is just like him doing everything on the largest and most generous scale does christ our creator go forth to make leaves he makes them by the whole forest full notched like the fern or silvered like the aspen are broad like the palm thickets in the tropics oregon forests does he go forth to make flowers he makes plenty of them they flame from the hedge they hang from the top of the grapevine in blossoms they roll in the blue wave of the violets they toss their white surf into the spirea enough for every child's hand a flower enough to make for every brow a chaplet enough with beauty to cover up the ghastliness of all the graves does he go forth to create water he pours it out not by the cupful but by a riverful a lakeful an oceanful pouring it out until all the earth has enough to drink 
and enough with which to wash. Does Jesus our Lord provide redemption? It is not a little salvation for this one, a little for that, and a little for the other, but enough for all. Whosoever, let him come. Each man an ocean full for himself. Promises for the young, promises for the old, promises for the lowly, promises for the blind, for the halt, for the outcast, for the abandoned. Pardon for all, comfort for all, mercy for all, heaven for all, not merely a cup full of gospel supply, but one hundred and thirty gallons. Ay, the tears of godly repentance are all gathered up into God's bottle, and some day standing before the throne, we will lift our cup of delight and ask that it be filled with the wine of heaven. And Jesus from that bottle of tears will begin to pour in the cup, and we will cry, Stop, Jesus, we do not want to drink our own tears. And Jesus will say, Know ye not that the tears of earth are the wine of heaven? Sorrow may you endure, but joy cometh in the morning. I remark further, Jesus does not shadow the joys of others with his own griefs. He might have sat down in that wedding and said, I have so much trouble, so much poverty, so much persecution, and the cross is coming. I shall not rejoice, and the gloom of my face and my sorrows shall be cast over all this group. So said not Jesus. He said to himself, Here are two persons starting out in married life. Let it be a joyful occasion. I will hide my own griefs. I will kindle their joy. There are many not so wise as that. I know a household where there are many little children, where for two years the musical instrument has been kept shut because there has been trouble in the house. Alas for the folly! Parents saying, We will have no Christmas tree this coming holiday, because there has been trouble in the house. Hush that laughing upstairs! How can there be any joy when there has been so much trouble? And so they make everything consistently doleful, and send their sons and daughters to ruin with the gloom they throw around them. O oh, my dear friends, do you know not those children will have trouble enough of their own after a while? Be glad they cannot appreciate all yours. Keep back the cup of bitterness from your daughter's lips. When your head is down in the grass of the tomb, poverty may come to her, betrayal to her, bereavement to her. Keep back the sorrows as long as you can. Do you not know that son may after a while have his heart broken? Stand between him and all harm. You may not fight his battles long. Fight them while you may. Throw not the chill of your own despondency over his soul. Rather be like Jesus who came to the wedding, hiding his own grief and kindling the joys of others. So I have seen the sun on a dark day, struggling amidst the clouds, black, ragged, and portentous, but not after a while the sun, with golden pry, heaved back the blackness, and the sun laughed to the lake, and the lake laughed to the sun, and from horizon to horizon, again, and from horizon to horizon, under the saffron sky, the water was all turned into wine. He wants us to be comfortable. I learn from this miracle that Christ is not impatient with the luxuries of life. It was not necessary that they should have that wine. Hundreds of people have been married without any wine. We do not read that any of the other provisions fell short. When Christ made the wine, it was not a necessity, but a positive luxury. I do not believe that he wants us to eat hard bread and sleep on hard mattresses unless we like them the best. I think if circumstances will allow, we have a right to the luxuries of dress, the luxuries of diet, and the luxuries of residence. There is no more religion in an old coat than in a new one. We can serve God drawn by a golden-plated harness as certainly as when we go afoot. Jesus Christ will dwell with us under a fine ceiling as well as under a thatched roof. And when you get wine made out of water, drink as much of it as you can. What is the difference between a Chinese mud hovel and an American home? What is the difference between the rough bearskins of the Russian boor and the outfit of an American gentleman? No difference except that which the gospel of Christ directly or indirectly has caused. When Christ shall have vanquished all the world, I suppose every house will be a mansion, and every garment a robe, and every horse an arched neck courser, and every carriage a glittering vehicle, and every man a king, and every woman a queen, 
and the whole earth a paradise the glories of the natural world harmonizing with the glories of the material world until the very bells of the horses shall jingle the praises of the lord i learn further from this miracle that christ has no impatience with festal joy otherwise he would not have accepted the invitation to that wedding he certainly would not have done that which increased the hilarity there may have been many in that room who were happy but there was not one of them that did so much for the joy of the wedding party as christ himself he was the chief of the banqueters when the wine gave out he supplied it and so i take it he will not deny us the joys that are positively festal i think the children of god have more right to laugh than any other people and to clap their hands as loudly there is not a single joy denied them that is given to any other people christianity does not clip the wings of the soul religion does not frost the flowers what is christianity i take it to be simply a proclamation from the throne of god of emancipation for all the enslaved and if a man accepts the terms of that proclamation and becomes free has he not a right to be merry suppose the father has an elegant mansion and larger grounds to whom will he give the first privilege of these grounds will he say my children you must not walk through these paths or sit down under these trees or pluck this fruit these are for outsiders they may walk in them no father would say anything like that he would say the first privileges in all the grounds and all my house shall be for my own children and yet men try to make us believe that god's children are on the limits and the chief refreshments and enjoyments of life are for outsiders and not for his own children it is stark atheism there is no innocent beverage too rich for god's child to drink there is no robe too costly for him to wear there is no hilarity too great for him to indulge in and no house too splendid for him to live in he has a right to the joys of earth he shall have a right to the joys of heaven though tribulation and trial and hardship may come unto many let him rejoice rejoice in the lord ye righteous and again i say rejoice he comes in the hour of extremity i remark again that christ comes to us in the hour of our extremity he knows the wine was giving out before there was any embarrassment or mortification why did he not perform the miracle sooner why wait until it was all gone and no help could come from any source and then come in and perform the miracle this is christ's way and when he did come in at the hour of extremity he made first-rate wine so that they cried out thou hast kept the good wine until now jesus in the hour of extremity he seems to prefer that hour in a christian home in poland great poverty had come and on the weekday the man was obliged to move out of the house with his whole family that night he knelt with his family and prayed to god while they were kneeling in prayer there was a tap on the window pane they opened the window and there was a raven that the family had fed and trained and it had in its bill a ring all set with precious stones which was found out to be a ring belonging to the royal family it was taken up to the king's residence and for the honesty of the man in bringing it back he had a house given to him and a garden and a farm who was it that sent the raven tapping on the window the same god that sent the raven to feed elijah by the brook cherith christ in the hour of extremity you mourned over your sins you could not find the way out you sat down and said god will not be merciful he has cast me off but in that the darkest hour of your history light broke from the throne and jesus said o wanderer come home i have seen all thy sorrows in this the hour of thy extremity i offer thee pardon and everlasting life trouble came you were almost torn to pieces by that trouble you braced yourself up against it you said i will be a stoic and will not care but before you had got through making the resolution it broke down under you you felt that all your resources were gone and then jesus came in the fourth watch of the night the bible says jesus came walking on the sea why did he not come in the first watch or in the second watch or in the third watch i do not know he came in the fourth and gave deliverance to his disciples jesus in the last extremity i wonder if it will be so in our very last extremity 
we shall fall suddenly sick and doctors will come but in vain we will try anodynes and the stimulants and the bathings but all in vain something will say you must go no one to hold us back but the hands of eternity stretched out to pull us on what then jesus will come to us as we say lord jesus i am afraid of that water i cannot wade through to the other side he will say take hold of my arm and we will take hold of his arm and then he will put his foot on the surf of the wave taking us on down deeper 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 and our soul will cry all thy waves and billows have gone over me they cover the feet they come to the knee past the girdle and come to the head and our soul cries out lord jesus christ i cannot hold thine arm any longer then jesus will turn around throw both his arms about us and set us on the beach far beyond the tossing of the billow jesus in the last extremity a grander wedding that wedding scene is gone now the wedding ring has been lost the tankards have been broken the house is down but jesus invites us to a grander wedding you know the bible says that the church is the lamb's wife that the lord will after a while come to fetch her home there will be gleaming of torches in the sky and the trumpets of god will ravish the air with their music and jesus will stretch out his hand and the church robed in white will put aside her veil and look up into the face of her lord the king and the bridegroom will say to the bride thou hast been faithful through all these years the mansion is ready come home thou art fair my love and then shall he put upon her brow the crown of dominion and the table will be spread and it will reach across the skies and the mighty ones of heaven will come in garlanded with beauty and striking their symbols and the bridegroom and bride will stand at the head of the table and the banqueters looking up will wonder and admire and say that is jesus the bridegroom but the scar on his brow is covered with a coronet and the stab in his side is covered with a robe and that is his bride the weariness of her earthly woe lost in the flesh of this wedding triumph there will be wine enough at that wedding not coming from the poisoned vats of earth but the vineyards of god will press their ripest clusters and the cups and tankards will blush to the brim with the heavenly vintage and then all the banqueters will drink standing esther having come up from the bacchanalian revelry of ahasuerus where a thousand lords feasted will be there and the queen of sheba from the banquet of solomon will be there and the mother of jesus from the wedding in cana will be there and they all will agree that the earthly feasting was poor compared with that then lifting their chalices in that holy light they shall cry to the lord of the feast thou hast kept the good wine until now end of chapter eight chapter nine of twenty-five sermons on the holy land this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Twenty-five Sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. Christmas Eve in the Holy Land. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Luke 2, 14. At last I have what I long for, a Christmas Eve in the Holy Land. This is the time of year that Christ landed. He was a December Christ. This is the chill air through which he descended. I look up through these Christmas skies, and I see no loosened star, hastening southward to halt above Bethlehem. But all the stars suggest the star of Bethlehem. No more need that any of them run along the sky to point downward. In quietude they kneel at the feet of him, who, though once in exile, is now enthroned forever. Fresh up from Bethlehem, I am full of the scenes suggested by a visit to that village. You know that whole region of Bethlehem is famous in Bible story. There were the waving harvests of Boaz, in which Ruth gleaned for herself and weeping Naomi. There David the warrior was thirsty, and three men of unheard-of self-denial broke through the Philistine army to get him a drink. It was to that region that Joseph and Mary came to have their names enrolled 
in the census. That is what the scripture means when it says, they came to be taxed, for people did not in those days rush after the assessors of tax any more than they now do. The village inn was crowded with the strangers who had come up by the command of government to have their names in the census, so that Joseph and Mary were obliged to lodge in the stables. You have seen some of those large stone buildings, in the center of which the camels were kept. While running out from this center in all directions there were rooms, in one of which Jesus was born. Had his parents been more surely apparelled, I have no doubt they would have found more comfortable entertainment. That night in the fields the shepherds with crook and kindled fires were watching their flocks. When hark to the sound of voices strangely sweet, can it be that the maidens of Bethlehem have come out to serenade the weary shepherds? But now a light stoops upon them like the morning, so that the flocks arise, shaking their snowy fleece and bleating to their drowsy young. The heavens are filled with armies of light, and the earth quakes under the harmony, as echoed back from cloud to cloud, it rings over the midnight hills. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will to men. It seems that the crown of royalty and dominion and power which Christ left behind him was hung on the sky in sight of Bethlehem. Who knows but what that crown may have been mistaken by wise men for the star running and pointing downward. Purity in Poverty My subject in the first place impresses me with the fact that indigence is not always significant of degradation. When princes are born, heralds announce it, and cannon thunder it, and flags wave it, and illuminations set cities on fire with the tidings. Some of us in England or America remember the time of rejoicing when the Prince of Wales was born. You can remember the gladness throughout Christendom at the Nativity in the palace at Madrid. But when our glorious Prince was born, there was no rejoicing on earth. Poor and growing poor, yet the heavenly recognition that Christmas night shows the truth of the proposition that indigence is not always significant of degradation. In all ages there have been great hearts throbbing under rags, tender sympathies under rough exterior, gold in the quartz, parrying marble in the quarry, and in every stable of privation wonders of excellence that have been the joy of the heavenly host. All the great deliverers of literature and of nations were born in homes without affluence, and from their own privation learned to speak and fight for the oppressed. Many a man has held up his pine knot light from the wilderness until all nations and generations have seen it, and off of his hard crust of penury has broken the bread of knowledge and religion for the starving millions of the race. Poetry and science and literature and commerce and laws and constitutions and liberty, like Christ, were born in a manger. All the great thoughts which have decided the destiny of nations started in obscure corners, and had Herods who wanted to slay them, and Iscariots who betrayed them, and rabbles that crucified them, and sepulchres that confined them until they burst forth in glorious resurrection. Strong character, like the rhododendron, is an alpine plant that grows fastest in the storm. Men are like wheat, worth all the more for being flailed. Some of the most useful people would never have come to positions of usefulness had they not been ground and pounded and hammered in the foundry of disaster. When I see Moses coming up from the ark of bulrushes to be the greatest lawgiver of the ages, and Amos from tending the herds to make Israel tremble with his prophecies, and David from the sheep coat to sway the poet's pen and the king's scepter, and Peter from the fishing net to be the great preacher at the Pentecost, I find proof of the truth of my proposition that indigence is not always significant of degradation. My subject also impresses me with the thought that it is while at our useful occupations that we have the divine manifestations. Had those shepherds gone that night into Bethlehem and risked their flocks among the wolves, they would not have heard the song of the angels. In other words, that man sees most of God in heaven who minds his own business. We all have our posts of duty, and standing there God appears to us. We are all shepherds and shepherdesses, and we have our flocks and cares and annoyances and anxieties, and we must tend them. Diligent in business, fervent in spirit. We sometimes hear very good people say, 
if i had a month or a year or two to do nothing but attend to religious things i would be a great deal better than i am now you are mistaken generally the best people are the busy people elisha was ploughing in the field when the prophetic mantle fell on him matthew was attending to his custom-house duties when christ commanded him to follow james and john were mending their nets when christ called them to be fishers of men had they been snoring in the sun christ would not have called their indolence into the apostleship gideon was at work with the flail on the threshing floor when he saw an angel saul was with great fatigue hunting up the lost asses when he found the crown of israel the prodigal son would never have reformed and wanted to have returned to his father's house if he had not first gone into business though it was swine feeding not once out of a hundred times will a lazy man become a christian those who have nothing to do are in very unfavorable circumstances for the receiving of divine manifestations it is not when you are in idleness but when you are like the bethlehem shepherds watching your flocks that the glory descends and there is joy among the angels of god over your soul penitent and forgiven my subject also strikes at the delusion that the religion of christ is dolorous and grief-infusing the music that broke through the midnight heavens was not a dirge but an anthem it shook joy over the hills it not only dropped upon the shepherds but it sprang upward among the thrones the robe of a saviour's righteousness is not black the christian life is not made up of weeping and cross-bearing and war-waging through the revelation of that christmas night i find that religion is not a groan but a song in a world of sin and sick-bed and sepulchres we must have trouble but in the darkest night the heavens part with angelic song you may like paul be shipwrecked but i exhort you to be of good cheer for you shall all escape safe to the land religion does not show itself in the elongation of the face and the cut of the garb the pharisee who puts his religion into his phylactery has none left for his heart fretfulness and complaining do not belong to the family of christian graces which move into the heart when the devil moves out christianity does not frown upon amusements and recreations it is not a cynic it is not a shrew it chokes no laughter it quenches no light it defaces no art among the happy it is the happiest it is just as much at home on the playground as in the church it is just as graceful in the charade as it is in the psalm book it sings just as well in surrey gardens as it prays in st paul's christ died that we might live christ walked that we might ride christ wept that we might laugh again my subject impresses me with the fact that glorious endings sometimes have very humble beginnings the straw pallet was the starting point but the shout in the midnight sky revealed what would be the glorious consummation christ on mary's lap christ on the throne of universal dominion what an humble starting what a glorious ending grace begins on a small scale in the heart you see only men as trees walking the grace of god in your heart is a feeble spark and christ has to keep both hands over it lest it be blown out what an humble beginning but look at that same man when he has entered heaven no crown able to express his royalty no palace able to express his wealth no sceptre able to express his power and dominion drinking from the fountain that drips from the everlasting rock among the harpers harping with their harps on a sea of glass mingled with fire before the throne of god to go no more out for ever the spark of grace that christ had to keep both hands over lest it come to extinction having flamed up into honor and glory and immortality what humble starting what glorious consummation as a grain of mustard seed the new testament church was on a small scale fishermen watched it against the uprising walls crashed infernal ingenuity the world said anathema ten thousand people rejoiced at every seeming defeat and said aha aha so we would have it martyrs on fire cried how long o lord how long very humble beginning but see the difference at the consummation when christ with his almighty arm has struck off the last chain of human bondage 
and Himalaya shall be Mount Zion, and Pyrenees, Moriah, and Oceans the walking place of him who trod the wave cliffs of storm Tiberius. And island shall call to island, sea to sea, continent to continent, and the song of the world's redemption rising, the heavens like a great sounding board shall strike back the shout of salvation to the earth, until it rebounds again to the throne of God, and all heaven rising on their thrones beat time with their scepters. Oh, what an humble beginning! What a glorious ending! Throne linked to a manger, heavenly mansions to a stable. My subject also impresses me with the effect of Christ's mission upward and downward. Glory to God, peace to man. When God sent his Son into the world, angels discovered something new in God, something they had never seen before. Not power, not wisdom, not love. They knew all that before. But when God sent his Son into this world, then the angels saw the spirit of self-denial in God, the spirit of self-sacrifice in God. It is easier to love an angel on his throne than a thief on the cross, a seraph in his worship than an adulteress in her crime. When the angel saw God, the God who would not allow the most insignificant angel in heaven to be hurt, give up his son, his son, his only, only son, they saw something that they had never thought of before. And I do not wonder that when Christ started out on that pilgrimage, the angels in heaven clapped their wings in triumph, and called on all the hosts of heaven to help them celebrate it, and sang so loud that the Bethlehem shepherds heard it, Glory to God in the highest. But it was also to be a mission of peace to man, infinite holiness, accumulated depravity. How could they ever come together? The gospel bridges over the distance. It brings God to us. It takes us to God. God in us, and we in God. Atonement atonement justice satisfied sins forgiven eternal life secured heaven built on a manger but it was also to be the pacification of all individual and international animosities what a sound this word of peace had in the roman empire that boasted of the number of people it had massacred that prided itself on the number of the slain that rejoiced at the trembling provinces sicily and corsica and sardinia and Macedonia and Egypt had bowed to her sword and crouched at the cry of her war eagles. She gave her chief honor to Scipio and Fabius and Caesar, all men of blood. What contempt they must have had there for the penniless, unarmed Christ in the garb of a Nazarene, starting out to conquer all nations. There never was a place on earth where that word peace sounded so offensively to the ears of the multitude as in the Roman Empire. They did not want peace. The greatest music they ever heard was the clanking chains of their captives. If all the blood that has been shed in battle could be gathered together, it would upbear a navy. The club that struck Abel to the earth has its echo in the butcheries of all ages. Edmund Burke, who gave no wild statistics, said that there had been spent in slaughter 35,000 millions of dollars, or what would be equal to that? But he had not seen into our times, when our own day, in America, we expended three thousand millions of dollars in civil war. Armies of the Prince of Peace Oh, if we could take our position on some high point and see the world's armies march past, what a spectacle it would be! There go the hosts of Israel through a score of red seas, one of water, the rest of blood. There go Cyrus and his army, with infuriate yell, rejoicing over the fall of the gates of Babylon. There goes Alexander, leading forth the hosts, and conquering all the world but himself, the earth reeling with the battle-gash of Arbella and Persepolis. There goes Ferdinand Cortez, leaving his butchered enemies in the table-lands, once fragrant with vanilla, and covered over with groves of flowering cacao. There goes the great Frenchman leading his army down through Egypt, like one of its plagues, and up through Russia like one of its own icy blasts. Yonder is the grave trench under the shadow of Sebastopol. There are the ruins of Delhi in Allahabad, and yonder are the inhuman sepoys and the brave regiments under Havelock, avenging the insulted flag of Britain. Well, cut right through the heart of my native land 
is a trench in which there lie one million northern and southern dead. Oh, the tears! Oh, the blood! Oh, the long marches! Oh, the hospital wounds! Oh, the martyrdom! Oh, the death! But brighter than the light which flashed on all these swords and shields and musketry is the light that fell on Bethlehem, and louder than the bray of the trumpets and the neighing of the chargers and the crash of the walls and the groaning of the dying armies is the song that unrolls this moment from the sky swept as though all the bells of heaven rung a jubilee peace on earth good will toward men oh when will the day come god hasten it when the sword shall be turned into ploughshares and the fortresses shall be remodeled into churches and the men of blood battling for renown shall become good soldiers of jesus christ and the cannon now striking down whole columns of death shall thunder in the victories of the truth many will be saved when we think of the whole world saved we are apt to think of the few people that now inhabit it only a very few compared with the population to come and what a small part cultivated do you know it has been authentically estimated that three-fourths of europe is yet all barrenness that nine hundred and ninety-one one-thousandth parts of the entire globe is uncultivated. This is all to be cultivated, all inhabited, and all gospelized. Oh, what tears of repentance when nations begin to weep! Oh, what supplications when continents begin to pray! Oh, what rejoicing when hemispheres begin to sing! Churches will worship on the places where this very hour smokes the blood of human sacrifice, and wandering through the snake-infested jungles of Africa, Christ's heel will bruise the serpent's head. Oh, when the trumpet of salvation shall be sounded everywhere, and the nations are redeemed, a light will fall upon every town brighter than that which fell upon Bethlehem. And more overwhelming than the song that fell on the pasture fields where the flocks fed, there will be a song louder than the voice of the storm-lifted oceans. Glory to God in the highest! and from all nations and kindred and people and tongues will come the response and on earth peace good will toward men on this christmas day i bring you good tidings of great joy pardon for all sin comfort for all trouble and life for the dead shall we now take this christ into our hearts the time is passing this is the closing of the year how the time speeds by put your hand on your heart one two three three times less it will beat life is passing like gazelles over the plain sorrows hover like petrels over the sea death swoops like a vulture from the mountains misery rolls up to our ears like waves heavenly songs fall to us like stars i wish you a merry christmas not with worldly dissipations but merry with gospel gladness merry with pardon sin merry with hope of reunion in the skies with all your loved ones who have preceded you. In that grandest and best sense, a Merry Christmas. And God grant that in our final moment we may have as bright a vision as did the dying girl when she said, Mother, pointing with her thin white hand through the window, Mother, what is that beautiful land out yonder beyond the mountains, the high mountains? Oh, said the mother, my darling, there are no mountains within sight of our home. Oh, yes, she said. Don't you see them? That beautiful land beyond the mountains out there, just beyond the high mountains. The mother looked down into the face of her dying child and said, My dear, I think that must be heaven you see. Well, then, she said, Father, you come, and with your strong arms carry me over those mountains, into that beautiful land beyond the high mountains no said the weeping father my darling i can't go with you well said she clapping her hands never mind never mind i see yonder a shining one coming he is coming now in his strong arms to carry me over the mountain to the beautiful land over the mountains over the high mountains end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of 25 Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Andy Glover. 25 Sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmadge. The Joyful Surprise. Behold, the half was not told to me. 1 Kings 10 7. Appearing before you today, my mind yet agitated with the scenery of the Holy Land from which we have just arrived, you will expect me to revert to some of the scenes once enacted there. Mark a circle around Lake Galilee and another circle around Jerusalem and you describe the two regions in which cluster memories of more events than in any other two circles. Jerusalem was a spell of fascination that will hold me the rest of my life. Solomon had resolved that the city should be the center of all sacred, regal, and commercial magnificence. He set himself to work and monopolized the surrounding desert as a highway for his caravans. He built the city of Palmyra, around one of the principal wells of the east, so that all the long trains of merchandise from the east were obliged to stop there pay toll, and leave part of their wealth in the hands of Solomon's merchants. He named the fortress Stapsacus, at the chief fort of the Euphrates, and put under guard everything that passed there. The three great products of Palestine, wine pressed from the richest clusters and celebrated all the world over, oil, which in that hot country is the entire substitute for butter and lard, and was pressed from the olive branches until every tree in the country became an oil well, and honey, which was the entire substitute for sugar, these three great products of the country Solomon exported, and received in return fruits and precious woods, and the animals of every clime. How Solomon enlarged his kingdom. He went down to Ezi and Geber and ordered a fleet of ships to be constructed, oversaw the workmen, and watched the launching of the flotilla which was to go out on more than a year's voyage, to bring home the wealth of the then known world. He heard that the Egyptian horses were large and swift, and long-maned and round-limbed, and he resolved to purchase them giving eighty-five dollars apiece for them, putting the best of these horses in his own stall, and selling the surplus to foreign potentates at great profit. He heard that there was the best of timber on Mount Lebanon, and he sent out one hundred and eighty thousand men to hew down the forest and drag the timber through the mountain gorges, to construct it into rafts to be floated to Joppa, and from thence to be drawn by ox teams twenty-five miles across the land to Jerusalem. He heard that there were beautiful flowers in other lands. He sent for them, planted them in his own gardens, and to this very day there are flowers found in the ruins of that city such as are to be found in no other part of Palestine, the lineal descendants of the very flowers that Solomon planted. He heard that in foreign groves there were birds of richest voice and luxuriant wing. He sent out people to catch them and bring them there, and he put them into his cages. Stand back now and see this long train of camels coming up to the king's gate, and the ox trains from Egypt gold and silver and precious stones, and beasts of every hoof, and birds of every wing, and fish of every scale. See the peacocks strut under the cedars, and the horsemen run, and the chariots wheel. Hark to the orchestra, gaze upon the dance, not stopping to look into the wonders of the temple. Step right onto the causeway, and pass up to Solomon's palace. Here we find ourselves amid a collection of buildings on which the king had lavished the wealth of many empires. The genius of Hiram, the architect, and of other artists, is here seen in the long line of corridors, and the suspended gallery, and the approach to the throne. Traceried window opposite traceried window, bronze ornaments bursting at the lotus and lily and pomegranate. Chapiters surrounded by a network of leaves, in which imitation fruit seemed suspended, as in hanging baskets. Three branches, so Josephus tells us three branches sculptured on the marble, so thin and subtle that even the leaves seemed to quiver. A laver, capable of holding five hundred barrels of water on six hundred brazen ox heads, which gushed with water and filled the whole place with coolness and crystalline brightness and musical plash. Ten tables chased with chariot wheel and lion and cherubim. Solomon sat on a throne of ivory. At the seating place of the throne, on each end of the steps, a brazen lion, why, my friends, in that place they trimmed their candles with snuffers of gold, and they cut their fruits with knives of gold, and they washed their faces in basins of gold, and they scooped out the ashes with shovels of gold, and they stirred the altar fires with tongs of gold, gold reflected in the water, gold flashing from the apparel, gold blazing in the crown, gold, gold, gold. Of course the news of the affluence of that place went out everywhere by every caravan, and by wing of every ship, until soon the streets of Jerusalem are crowded with curiosity-seekers. What is that long procession approaching Jerusalem? 
I think from the pomp of it there must be royalty in the train. I smell the breath of the spices, which are brought as presents, and I hear the shout of the drivers, and I see the dust-covered caravan showing that they come from far away. Cry the news up to the palace. The Queen of Sheba advances. Let all the people come out to see. Let the mighty men of the land come out on the palace corridors. Let Solomon come down the stairs of the palace before the queen has alighted. Shake out the cinnamon, and the saffron, and the calmus, and the frankincense, and pass it into the treasure house. Take up the diamonds until they glitter in the sun. She would see for herself. The queen of Sheba alights. She enters the palace. She washes at the bath. She sits down at the banquet. The cupbearers bow. The meat smokes. The music trembles in the dash of the waters from the molten sea. Then she rises from the banquet, and walks through the conservatories, and gazes on the architecture, and she asks Solomon many strange questions, and she learns about the religion of the Hebrews, and she then and there becomes a servant of the Lord God. She is overwhelmed. She begins to think that all the spices she brought, and all the precious woods, which are intended to be turned into harps and psalteries and into railings for the causeway between the temple and the palace, and the one hundred and eighty thousand dollars in money, she begins to think that all these presents amount to nothing in such a place, and she is almost ashamed that she has brought them, and she says within herself, I heard a great deal about this place, and about the wonderful religion of the Hebrews, but I find it far beyond my highest anticipations. I must add more than fifty percent to what has been related. It exceeds everything that I could have expected. The half, the half was not told to me. Learn from this subject what a beautiful thing it is. When social position and wealth surrender themselves to God, when religion comes to a neighborhood, the first to receive it are the women. Some men say it is because they are weak-minded. I say it is because they have quicker perception of what is right, more ardent affection and capacity for sublimer emotion. After the women have received the gospel, then all the distressed and the poor of both sexes, those who have no friends except Jesus, last of all come the greatly prospered. Alas, that it is so. If there are those who have been favored of fortune, or as I might better put it, favored of God, surrender all you have and all you expect to be to the Lord, who blessed this Queen of Sheba. Certainly you are not ashamed to be found in this Queen's company. I am glad that Christ has had his imperial friends in all ages. Elizabeth Christina, Queen of Prussia. Maria Fyodorovna, Queen of Russia. Marie, Empress of France. Helena, the Imperial Mother of Constantine. Arcadia, from her great fortunes building public baths in Constantinople, and toiling for the alleviation of the masses. Queen Clotilda, leading her husband and three thousand of his armed warriors to Christian baptism. Elizabeth of Burgundy, giving her jeweled glove to a beggar, and scattering great fortunes among the distressed. Prince Albert, singing Rock of Ages in Windsor Castle, and Queen Victoria, incognita, reading the scriptures to a dying pauper. I bless God that the day is coming when royalty will bring all its thrones, and music all its harmonies, and painting all its pictures, and sculpture all its statuary, and architecture all its pillars, and conquest all its scepters, and the queens of the earth, in long line of advance, frankincense filling the air, and the camels laden with gold, shall approach Jerusalem, and the gates shall be hoisted, and the great burden of splendor shall be lifted into the palace of this greater than Solomon. The kingdom of heaven must be sought. Again my subject teaches me what is earnestness in the search of truth. Do you know where Sheba was? It was in Abyssinia, or some say in the southern part of Arabia Felix. In either case it was a great way from Jerusalem. To get from there to Jerusalem she had to cross a country infested with bandits, and go across blistering deserts. Why did not the Queen of Sheba stay at home and send a committee to inquire about this new religion, and have the delegates report? in regard to that religion and wealth of King Solomon. She wanted to see for herself and hear for herself. She could not do this by work of committee. She felt she had a soul worth ten thousand kingdoms like Sheba, and she wanted a robe richer than any woven by oriental shuttles, and she wanted a crown set with the jewels of eternity. Bring out the camels, put on the spices, gather up the jewels of the throne and put them on the caravan. Start now, no time to be lost. Goad on the camels. When I see that caravan, dust-covered, weary and exhausted, trudging on across the desert and among the bandits until it reaches Jerusalem, I say, there is an earnest seeker after the truth. 
but there are a great many who do not act in that way. They all want to get the truth, but they want the truth to come to them. They do not want to go to it. There are people who fold their arms and say, I am ready to become a Christian at any time. If I am to be saved, I shall be saved. And if I am to be lost, I shall be lost. But Jerusalem will never come to you. You must go to Jerusalem. The religion of our Lord Jesus Christ will not come to you. You must go and get religion. Bring out the camels. Put on all the sweet spices, all the treasures of the heart's affection. Start for the throne. Go in and hear the waters of salvation dashing in fountains all around about the throne. Sit down at the banquet, the wine pressed from the grapes of the heavenly Eshkel, the angels of God, the cupbearers. Go down the camels. The Bible declares it. The queen of the south, that is the very woman I am speaking of, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment against the generation and condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. What infatuation, the sitting down in idleness expecting to be saved. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Take the kingdom of heaven by violence. Urge on the camels. Again, my subject impresses me with the fact that religion is a surprise to anyone that gets it. This story of the new religion in Jerusalem, and of the glory of King Solomon, who was a type of Christ, that story rolled on and on, and was told by every traveler coming back from Jerusalem. The news goes on the wing of every ship, and with every caravan, and you know a story enlarges as it is retold. And by the time that story gets down into the southern part of Arabia Felix, and the Queen of Sheba hears it, it must be a tremendous story, and yet this queen declares in regard to it, although she has heard so much, and had her anticipations raised so high. The half, the half was not told to her. The convert's joyful surprise. So religion is always a surprise to anyone that gets it. The story of grace, an old story. Apostles preached it with rattle of chain. Martyrs declared it with arm of fire. Deathbeds have affirmed it with visions of glory and ministers of religion have sounded it through the lanes, and the highways, and the chapels and cathedrals. It has been cut into stone with chisel, and spread on the canvas with pencil, and it has been recited in the doxology of great congregations. And yet when a man first comes to look on the palace of God's mercy, and to see the royalty of Christ, and the wealth of his banquet, and the luxuriance of his attendance, and the loveliness of his face, and the joy of his service, he exclaims with prayers, with tears, with sighs, with triumphs. The half, the half was not told to me. I appeal to those who are Christians. Compare the idea you had of the joy of the Christian life before you became a Christian with the appreciation of that joy you have now since you have become a Christian, and you are willing to attest before angels and men that you never in the days of your spiritual bondage had any appreciation of what was to come. You are ready today to answer and say in regard to the discoveries you have made of the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God, the half, the half was not told to me. Well, we hear a great deal about the good time that is coming to the world, when it is to be girded with salvation, holiness on the bells of the horses, the lion's mane padded by the hand of a babe, ships of Tarshish bringing cargoes for Jesus, and the hard, dry, barren, winter-bleached, storm-scarred, thunder-split rock, breaking into floods of bright water, deserts into which dromedaries thrust their nostrils, because they were afraid of the Samoon deserts blooming into carnation roses and silver-tipped lilies. It is the old story. Everybody tells it. Isaiah told it. John told it. Paul told it. Ezekiel told it. Luther told it. Calvin told it. John Milton told it. Everybody tells it, and yet, and yet when the midnight shall fly the hills, and Christ shall marshal his great army, and China, dashing her idols into the dust, shall hear the voice of God and wheel into line, and India, destroying her juggernaut, and snatching up her little children from the Ganges, shall hear the voice of God and wheel into line, and vine-covered Italy, and wheat-crowned Russia, and all the nations of the earth, shall hear the voice of God and fall into line. Then the church, which has been toiling and struggling through the centuries, robed and garlanded like a bride adorned for her husband, shall put aside her veil, and look up into the face of her lord the king and say, 
the half. The half was not told to me. Heaven, the greatest surprise. Well, there is coming a greater surprise to every Christian, a greater surprise than anything I have depicted. Heaven is an old story. Everybody talks about it. There's hardly a hymn in the hymn book that does not refer to it. Children read about it in their Sabbath school book. Aged men put on their spectacles to study it. We say it is a harbor from the storm. We call it home. We say it is the house of many mansions. We weave together all sweet, beautiful, delicate, exhilarant words. We weave them into letters, and then we spell it out in rose and lily and amaranth. And yet that place is going to be a surprise to the most intelligent Christian. Like the Queen of Sheba, the report has come to us from the far country, and many of us have started. It is a desert march, but we urge on the camels. What though our feet be blistered with the way? We are hastening to the palace. We take all our loves and hopes and Christian ambitions, as frankincense and myrrh and cassia, to the great king. We must not rest. We must not halt. The night is coming on, and it is not safe out here in the desert. Urge on the camels. I see the domes against the sky, and the houses of Lebanon, and the temples and the gardens. See the fountains dance in the sun, and the gates flash, as they open to let in the poor pilgrims. Send the word up to the palace that we are coming, and that we are weary of the march of the desert. The king will come out and say, Welcome to the palace. Bathe in these waters. Recline on these banks. Take this cinnamon and frankincense and myrrh, and put it upon a censer, and swing it before the altar. And yet, my friends, when heaven bursts upon us, it will be a greater surprise than that. Jesus on the throne, and we made like him. All our Christian friends surrounding us in glory. All our sorrows and tears and sins gone by forever. The thousands of thousands. The one hundred and forty and four thousand. The great multitudes that no man can number. Will cry, world without end. The half. The half was not told to me. End of chapter 10「took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons which were slain, and they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her hid in the house of the Lord six years. Second Kings chapter 11 verses 2 and 3 Grandmothers are more lenient with their children's children than they were with their own. At forty years of age, if discipline be necessary, chastisement is used. But at seventy, the grandmother, looking upon the misbehaviour of the grandchild, is apologetic and disposed to substitute confectionery for whip. There is nothing more beautiful than this mellowing of old age toward childhood. Grandmother takes out her pocket handkerchief and wipes her spectacles and puts them on and looks down into the face of her mischievous and rebellious descendant, and says, I don't think he meant to do it. Let him off this time. I'll be responsible for his behaviour in the future. My mother, with the second generation around her, a boisterous crew, said one day, I suppose they ought to be disciplined, but I can't do it. Grandmothers are not fit to bring up grandchildren. But here, in my text, we have a grandmother of a different hue. I have, within a few days, been at Jerusalem, where the occurrence of the text took place, and the whole scene came vividly before me, while I was going over the site of the ancient temple and climbing the towers of the king's palace. Here, in the text, it is old Athalia, the queenly murderess. She ought to have been honourable. Her father was a king, her husband was a king, her son was a king. And yet we find her plotting for the extermination of the entire royal family, including her own grandchildren. The executioner's knives are sharpened. 
the palace is red with the blood of princes and princesses on all sides are shrieks and hands thrown up and struggle and death groan no mercy kill kill but while the ivory floors of the palace run with carnage and the whole land is under the shadow of a great horror a fleet-footed woman a clergyman's wife jehoshaba by name stealthily approaches the imperial nursery seizes upon the grandchild that had somehow as yet escaped massacre wraps it up tenderly but in haste snuggles it against her flies down the palace stairs her heart in her throat lest she be discovered in this christian abduction get her out of the way as quick as you can for she carries a precious burden even a young king with this youthful prize she presses into the room of the ancient temple the church of olden times unwraps the young king and puts him down sound asleep as he is and unconscious of the peril that has been threatened and there for six years he is secreted in that church apartment meanwhile old athalia smacks her lips with satisfaction and thinks that all the royal family are dead but the six years expire and it is now time for young joash to come forth and take the throne and to push back into disgrace and death old athalia the arrangements are all made for political revolution the military come and take possession of the temple swear loyalty to the boy joash and stand around for his defence see the sharpened swords and the burnished shields everything is ready now joash half affrighted at the armed tramp of his defenders scared at the vociferation of his admirers is brought forth in full regalia the scroll of authority is put in his hand the coronet of government is put on his brow and the people clapped and waved and huzzaed and trumpeted what is that said athalia what is that sound over in the temple and she flies to see and on her way they meet her and say why haven't you heard you thought you had slain all the royal family but joash has come to light then the queenly murderess frantic with rage grabbed her mantle and tore it to tatters and cried until she foamed at the mouth you have no right to crown my grandson you have no right to take the government from my shoulders treason treason while she stood there crying that the military started for her arrest and she took a short cut through the back door of the temple and ran through the royal stables but the battle axes of the military fell on her in the barnyard and for many a day when the horses were being unloosed from the chariot after drawing out young joash the fiery steeds would snort and rear passing the place as they smelt the place of the carnage the first thought i hand you from this subject is that the extermination of righteousness is an impossibility when a woman is good she is apt to be very good and when she is bad she is apt to be very bad and this athalia was one of the latter sort she would exterminate the last scion of the house of david through whom jesus was to come there was plenty of work for embalmers and undertakers she would clear the land of all god-fearing and god-loving people she would put an end to everything that could in any wise interfere with her imperial criminality she folds her hands and says the work is done it is completely done is it in the swaddling clothes of that church apartment are wrapped the cause of god and the cause of good government that is the scion of the house of david it is joash the christian reformer it is joash the friend of god it is joash the demolisher of baalitish idolatry rock him tenderly nurse him gently athalia you may kill all the other children but you cannot kill him eternal defences are thrown all around him and this clergyman's wife jehoshaba will snatch him up from the palace nursery and will run up and down with him into the house of the lord and there she will hide him for six years and at the end of that time he will come forth for your dethronement and obliteration well my friend 
just as poor a botch does the world always make of extinguishing righteousness. Superstition rises up and says, I will just put an end to pure religion. Domitian slew 40,000 Christians. Diocletian slew 844,000 Christians. And the scythe of persecution has been swung through all the ages, and the flames hissed, and the guillotine chopped, and the Bastille groaned. But did the foes of Christianity exterminate it? Did they exterminate Alban, the first British sacrifice? Or Zuinglius, the Swiss reformer? Or John Oldcastle, the Christian nobleman? Or Abdullah, the Arabian martyr? Or Anne Askew, or Sanders, or Cranmer? Great work of extermination they made of it. Just at the time when they thought they had slain all the royal family of Jesus, some Joash would spring up and out and take the throne of power and wield a very sceptre of Christian dominion. Infidelity says, I'll just exterminate the Bible. And the scriptures were thrown into the street for the mob to trample on, and they were piled up in the public squares and set on fire and mountains of indignant contempt were hurled on them, and learned universities decreed the Bible out of existence. Thomas Paine said, In my age of reason, I have annihilated the scriptures. Your Washington is a pusillanimous Christian, but I am the foe of Bibles and of churches. Oh, how many assaults upon that word! All the hostilities that have ever been created on earth are not to be compared with the hostilities against that one book. Said one man in his infidel desperation to his wife, You must not be reading that Bible, and he snatched it away from her. And though in that Bible was a lock of hair of the dead child, the only child that God had ever given them, he pitched the book with its contents into the fire, and stirred it with the tongs, and spat on it, and cursed it, and said, Susan, never have any more of that damnable stuff here. How many individual and organised attempts have been made to exterminate that Bible? Have they done it? Have they exterminated the American Bible Society? Have they exterminated the British and Foreign Bible Society? Have they exterminated the thousand of Christian institutions whose only object is to multiply copies of the scriptures and throw them broadcast around the world. They have exterminated until instead of one or two copies of the Bible in our houses, we have eight or ten, and we pile them up in the corners of Sabbath school rooms and send great boxes of them everywhere. If they get on as well as they are now going on in the work of extermination, I do not know but that our children may live to see the millennium. Yea, if there should come a time of persecution in which all the known Bibles of the earth should be destroyed, all these lamps of light that blaze in our pulpits and in our families extinguished, in the very day that infidelity and sin should be holding a jubilee over the universal extinction, there would be in some closet of a backwoods church a secreted copy of the Bible, and this Joash of eternal literature would come out and come up and take the throne, and the Athalia of infidelity and persecution would fly out the back door of the palace and drop her miserable carcass under the hoofs of the horse of the king's stables. You cannot exterminate Christianity. You cannot kill Joash. The second thought I hand you from my subject is that there are opportunities in which we may save royal life. You know that profane history is replete with stories of strangled monarchs and of young princes who have been put out of the way. Here is a story of a young prince saved. How Jehoshaphat, the clergyman's wife, must have trembled as she rushed into the imperial nursery and snatched up Joash. How she hushed him, lest by his cry he hinder the escape. Fly with him. Jehoshaphat, you hold in your arms the cause of God and good government. Fail, and he is slain. Succeed, and you turn the tide of the world's history in the right direction. It seems as if between the young king and his assassins there is nothing but the frail arm of a woman. But why should we spend our time in praising this bravery of expedition 
when God asks the same thing of you and me. All around us are the imperiled children of a great king. They are born of almighty parentage and will come to a throne or a crown if permitted. But sin, the old Athalia, goes forth to the massacre. Murderous temptations are out for the assassination. Valence, the emperor, was told that there was somebody in his realm who would usurp his throne, and that the name of the man who should be the usurper would begin with the letters T-H-E-O-D. And the edict went forth from the emperor's throne, Kill everybody whose name begins with T-H-E-O-D. And hundreds and thousands were slain hoping by that massacre to put an end to that one usurper. But sin is more terrific in its denunciation. It matters not how you spell your name. You come under its knife, under its sword, under its doom, unless there be some omnipotent relief brought to the rescue. But, blessed be God, there is such a thing as delivering a royal soul. Who will snatch away Joash? This afternoon, in your Sabbath school class, there will be a prince of God, someone who may yet reign as king forever before the throne. There will be someone in your class who has a corrupt physical inheritance. There will be someone in your class who has a father and mother who do not know how to pray. There will be someone in your class who is destined to command in church or state, some Cromwell to dissolve a parliament, some Beethoven to touch the world's harp-strings, some John Howard to pour fresh air into the lazaretto, some Florence Nightingale to bandage the battle-wounds, some Miss Dix to soothe the crazed brain, some John Frederick Oberlin to educate the besotted, some David Brainard to change the Indian's war-whoop to a Sabbath song, some John Wesley to marshal three-fourths of Christendom, some John Knox to make queens turn pale, some Joash to demolish idolatry and strike for the kingdom of heaven. There are sleeping in your cradles by night, there are playing in your nurseries by day, imperial souls waiting for dominion, and whichever side the cradle they get out will decide the destiny of empires. For each one of these children, Sin and holiness contend, Athalia on the one side and Jehoshaphat on the other. But I hear people say, what's the use of bothering children with religious instruction? Let them grow up and choose for themselves. Don't interfere with their volition. Suppose someone had said to Jehoshaphat, don't interfere with that young Joash. Let him grow up and decide whether he likes the palace or not whether he wants to be king or not. Don't disturb his volition. Jehoshaphat knew right well that unless that day the young king was rescued, he would never be rescued at all. I tell you, my friends, the reason we don't reclaim all our children from worldliness is because we begin too late. Parents wait until their children lie before they teach them the value of truth. They wait until their children swear before they teach them the importance of righteous conversation. They wait until their children are all wrapped up in this world before they tell them of a better world. Too late with your prayers. Too late with your discipline. Too late with your benediction. You put all care upon your children between 12 and 18. Why do you not put the chief care between 4 and 9? It is too late to repair a vessel when it has got out of the dry docks. It is too late to save Joash after the executioners have broken in. May God arm us all for this work of snatching royal souls from death to coronation. Can you imagine any sublimer work than this soul-saving? That was what flushed Paul's cheek with enthusiasm. That was what led Munson to risk his life among Bernesian cannibals. That was what sent Dr. Abiel to preach under the consuming skies of China. That was what gave courage to focus in the third century. When the military officers came to put him to death for Christ's sake, he put them to bed that they might rest while he himself went out.
and in his own garden dug his grave, and then came back and said, I am ready. But they were shocked at the idea of taking the life of their host. He said, It is the will of God that I should die. And he stood on the margin of his own grave, and they beheaded him. You say it is a mania, a foolhardiness, a fanaticism. Rather would I call it a glorious self-abnegation, the thrill of eternal satisfaction, the plucking of Joash from death, and raising him to coronation. The third thought I hand to you from my text is that the Church of God is a good hiding place. When Jehoshaba rushes into the nursery of the king and picks up Joash, what shall she do with him? Shall she take him to some room in the palace? No, for the official desperados will hunt through every nook and corner of that building. Shall she take him to the residence of some wealthy citizen? No, the citizen would not dare to harbour the fugitive. But she has to take him somewhere. She hears the cry of the mob in the streets. She hears the shriek of the dying nobility. So she rushes with Joash unto the room of the temple, into the house of God, and then she puts him down. She knows that Athalia and her wicked assassins will not bother the temple a great deal. They are not apt to go very much to church. And so she sets down Joash in the temple. There he will be hearing the songs of the worshippers year after year. There he will breathe the odour of the golden censers. In that sacred spot he will tarry, secreted until the six years have passed, and he come to enthronement. Would God that we were as wise as Jehoshaba, and knew that the Church of God is the best hiding place. Perhaps our parents took us there in early days. They snatched us away from the world and hid us behind the baptismal fonts and amid the Bibles and psalm books. O oh, glorious enclosure! We have been breathing the breath of the golden censers all the time, and we have seen the lamb on the altar, and we have handled the files which are the prayers of all saints, and we have dwelt under the wings of the cherubim. Glorious enclosure! When my father and mother died, and the property was settled up, there was hardly anything left. But they endowed us with a property worth more than any earthly possession, because they hid us in the temple. And when days of temptation have come upon my soul, I have gone there for shelter. And when assaulted of sorrows, I have gone there for comfort, and there I mean to live. I want, like Joash, to stay there until coronation. I mean to be buried out of the house of God. O oh, men of the world outside there, betrayed, caricatured, and cheated of the world, why do you not come in through the broad, wide-open door of Christian communion? I wish I could act the part of Jehoshaphat today and steal you away from your perils and hide you in the temple. How few of us appreciate the fact that the Church of God is a hiding place. There are many people who put the Church at so low a mark that they begrudge it everything, even the few dollars they give toward it. They make no sacrifices. They dole a little out of their surplusage. They pay their butcher's bill, and they pay their doctor's bill, and they pay their landlord, and they pay everybody but the Lord. And they come in at the last to pay the Lord in his church, and frown as they say, There, Lord, it is. If you will have it, take it. Now take it, take it. Send me a receipt in full, and don't bother me soon again. I tell you, there is not more than one man out of a thousand that appreciates what the church is. Where are the souls that put aside that one-tenth for Christian institutions, one-tenth of their income? Where are those who, having put aside that one-tenth, draw upon it cheerfully? Why, it is pull and drag and hold on and grab and clutch, and giving is an affliction to most people, when it ought to be an exhilaration and a rapture. Oh, that God would remodel our souls on this subject, and that we might appreciate the house of God as the great refuge. If your children are to come up to lives of virtue and happiness, they will come up under the shadow of the church. If the church does not get them, the world will. 
Ah, when you pass away, and it will not be long before you do, when you pass away, it will be a satisfaction to see your children in Christian society. You want to have them sitting at the holy sacraments. You want them mingling in Christian associations. You would like to have them die in the sacred precincts. When you are on your dying bed, and your little one comes up to take your last word, and you look into their bewildered faces, you will want to leave them under the church's benediction. I don't care how hard you are, that is so. I said to a man of the world, Your son and daughter are going to join our church next Sunday. Have you any objections? Bless you, he said. Objections? I wish all my children belonged to the church. I don't attend to these matters myself. I know I am very wicked, but I am very glad they are going, and I shall be there to see them. I am very glad, sir. I am very glad. I want them there. And so, though you may have been wanderers from God, and though you may have sometimes caricatured the Church of Jesus, it is your great desire that your sons and daughters should be standing all their lives within this sacred enclosure. More than that, you yourself will want the church for a hiding place when the mortgage is foreclosed, when your daughter, just blooming into womanhood, suddenly clasps her hands in a slumber that knows no waking, when gaunt trouble walks through the parlour and the sitting room and the dining hall and the nursery, you will want some shelter from the tempest. Ah, some of you have been run upon by misfortune and trial. Why do you not come into the shelter? I said to a widowed mother after she had buried her only son, months after, I said to her, How do you get along nowadays? Oh, she replied, I get along tolerably well, except when the sun shines. I said, What do you mean by that? When she said, I can't bear to see the sunshine. My heart is so dark that all the brightness of the natural world seems a mockery to me. O oh, darkened soul, O oh, broken-hearted man, broken-hearted woman, why do you not come into the shelter? I swing the door wide open. I swing it from wall to wall. Come in, come in. You want a place where your troubles shall be interpreted, where your burdens shall be unstrapped, where your tears shall be wiped away. Church of God, be a hiding place to all these people. Give them a seat where they can rest their weary souls. Flash some light from your chandeliers upon their darkness. With some soothing hymn, hush their griefs. O oh, Church of God, gate of heaven, let me go through it. All other institutions are going to fail, but the Church of God, its foundation is the rock of ages. Its charter is for everlasting years. Its keys are held by the universal proprietor. Its dividend is heaven. Its president is God. Sure as thy truth shall last, to Zion shall be given the brightest glories earth can yield, and brighter bliss of heaven. God grant that all this audience, the youngest, the eldest, the worst, the best, may find their safe and glorious hiding place where Joash found it, in the temple. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of 25 Sermons on the Holy Land。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christopher Smith. 25 Sermons on the Holy Land – by Thomas de Witt Talmage. Chapter 12. The Philippian Earthquake. Jails are dark, dull, damp, loathsome places even now, but they were worse in the apostolic times. I imagine today we are standing in the Philippian dungeon. Do you not feel the chill? Do you not hear the groan of the incarcerated ones who for ten years have not seen the sunlight, and the deep sigh of women who remember their father's house and mourn over their wasted estates? Listen again. 
it is the cough of a consumptive or the struggle of one in a nightmare of great horror you listen again and hear a culprit his chains rattling as he rolls over in his dreams and you say god pity the prisoner but there is another sound in that prison it is a song of joy and gladness what a place to sing in the music comes winding through the corridors of the prison and in all the dark wards the whisper is heard what's that what's that it is the song of paul and silas they cannot sleep they have been whipped very badly whipped the long gashes on their backs are bleeding yet they lie flat on the cold ground their feet fast in wooden sockets and of course they cannot sleep but they can sing jailer what are you doing with these people why have they been put here oh they have been trying to make the world better is that all that is all a pit for joseph a lion's cave for daniel a blazing furnace for shadrach clubs for john wesley an anathema for philip melanchthon a dungeon for paul and silas but while we are standing in the gloom of that philippian dungeon and we hear the mingling voices of sobs and groans and blasphemy and alleluia suddenly an earthquake the iron bars of the prison twist the pillars crack off the solid masonry begins to heave and rock till all the doors swing open and the walls fall with a terrible crash the jailer feeling himself responsible for these prisoners and feeling suicide to be honourable since brutus killed himself and cato killed himself and cassius killed himself put his sword to his own heart proposing with one strong keen thrust to put an end to his excitement and agitation but paul cries out stop stop do thyself no harm we are all here then i see the jailer running through the dust and amid the ruin of that prison and i see him throwing himself down at the feet of these prisoners crying out what shall i do what shall i do did paul answer get out of this place before there is another earthquake put handcuffs and hopples on these other prisoners lest they get away no word of that kind compact thrilling tremendous answer answer memorable all through earth and heaven believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved well we have read of the earthquake in lisbon in lima in aleppo and in caracas but we live in a latitude where in all our memory there has not been one severe volcanic disturbance and yet we have seen fifty earthquakes here is a man who has been building up a large fortune his bid on the money market was felt in all the cities he thinks he has got beyond all annoying rivalries in trade and he says to himself now i am free and safe from all possible perturbation but a national panic strikes the foundations of the commercial world and crash goes all that magnificent business establishment he is a man who has built up a very beautiful home his daughters have just come home from the seminary with diplomas of graduation his sons have started in life honest temperate and pure when the evening lights are struck there is a happy and an unbroken family circle but there has been an accident down at the beach the young man ventured too far out in the surf the telegraph hurled the terror up to the city an earthquake struck under the foundation of that beautiful home the piano closed the curtains dropped the laughter hushed crash go all those domestic hopes and prospects and expectations so my friends we have all felt the shaking down of some great trouble and there was a time when we were as much excited as this man of the text and we cried out as he did what shall i do what shall i do the same reply that the apostle made to him is appropriate to us believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved 
there are some documents of so little importance that you do not care to put any more than your last name under them or even your initials but there are some documents of so great importance that you write out your full name so the saviour in some parts of the bible is called lord and in other parts of the bible he is called jesus and in other parts of the bible he is called christ but that there might be no mistake about this passage all three names come in together the lord jesus christ now who is this being that you want me to trust in and believe in men sometimes come to me with credentials and certificates of good character but i cannot trust them there is some dishonesty in their looks that makes me know i shall be cheated if i confide in them you cannot put your heart's confidence in a man until you know what stuff he is made of and am i unreasonable this morning when i stop to ask you who is this that you want me to trust in no man would think of venturing his life on a vessel going out to sea that had never been inspected no you must have the certificate hung amidships telling how many tons it carries and how long ago it was built and who built it and you cannot expect me to risk the cargo of my immortal interests on board any craft till you tell me what it is made of and where it was made and what it is when then i ask you who this is you want me to trust in you tell me he was a very attractive person you tell me that the contemporary writers describe him and they give the colour of his eyes and the colour of his hair and they describe his whole appearance as being resplendent christ did not tell the little children to come to him suffer little children to come unto me was not spoken to the children it was spoken to the pharisees the children had come without any invitation no sooner did jesus appear than the little ones pitched from their mother's arms an avalanche of beauty and love into his lap suffer little children to come unto me that was addressed to the pharisees not to the children christ did not ask john to put his head down on his bosom john could not help but put his head there such eyes such cheeks such a chin such hair such physical condition and appearance why it must have been completely captivating and winsome i suppose to look at him was just to love him oh how attractive his manner why when they saw christ coming along the street they ran into their houses and they wrapped up their invalids as quick as they could and brought them out that he might look at them oh there was something so pleasant so inviting so cheering in everything he did in his very look when these sick ones were brought out did he say take away these sores do not trouble me with these leprosies no no there was a kind look there was a gentle word there was a healing touch they could not keep away from him in addition to this softness of character there was a fiery momentum how the old hypocrites trembled before him how the kings of the earth turned pale here is a plain man with a few sailors at his back coming off the sea of galilee going up to the palace of the caesars making that palace quake to the foundations and uttering a word of mercy and kindness which throbs through all the earth and through all the heavens and through all the ages oh he was a loving christ but it was not effeminacy or insipidity of character it was accompanied with majesty infinite and omnipotent lest the world should not realize his earnestness this christ mounts the cross you say if christ has to die why not let him take some deadly potion and lie on a couch in some bright and beautiful home if he must die let him expire amid all kindly attentions no the world must hear the hammers on the heads of the spikes the world must listen to the death rattle of the sufferer the world must feel his warm blood dropping on each cheek while it looks up into the face of his anguish and so the cross must be lifted and the hole is dug on the top of calvary it must be dug three feet deep and the cross is laid on the ground and the sufferer is stretched upon it 
and the nails are pounded through nerve and muscle and bone through the right hand through the left hand and then they shake his right hand to see if it is fast and they shake his left foot to see if it is fast and then they heave up the wood half a dozen shoulders under the weight and they put the end of the cross to the mouth of the hole and they plunge it in all the weight of his body coming down for the first time on the spikes and while some hold the cross upright others throw in the dirt and trample it down and trample it hard oh plant that tree well and thoroughly for it is to bear fruit such as no other tree ever bore why did christ endure it he could have taken those rocks and with them crushed his crucifiers he could have reached up and grasped the sword of the omnipotent god and with one clean cut have tumbled them into perdition but no he was to die he must die his life for my life his life for your life in one of the european cities a young man died on the scaffold for the crime of murder some time after the mother of this young man was dying and the priest came in and she made confession to the priest that she was the murderer and not her son in a moment of anger she had struck her husband a blow that slew him the son came suddenly into the room and was washing away the wounds and trying to resuscitate his father when someone looked through the window and saw him and supposed him to be the criminal that young man died for his own mother you say it was wonderful that he never exposed her but i tell you of a grander thing christ the son of god died not for his mother nor for his father but for his sworn enemies oh such a christ as that so loving so self-sacrificing can you not trust him i think there are many under the spirit of god who are saying i will trust him if you will only tell me how and the great question asked by thousands in this assemblage is how how and while i answer your question i look up and utter the prayer which roland hill so often uttered in the midst of his sermons master help how are you to trust in christ just as you trust any one you trust your partner in business with important things if a commercial house gives you a note payable three months hence you expect the payment of that note at the end of three months you have perfect confidence in their word and in their ability you go home today you expect there will be food on the table you have confidence in that now i ask you to have the same confidence in the lord jesus christ he says you believe i take away your sins and they are all taken away what you say before i pray any more before i read my bible any more before i cry over my sins any more yes this moment believe with all your heart and you are saved why christ is only waiting to get from you what you give to scores of people every day what is that confidence if these people whom you trust day by day are more worthy than christ if they are more faithful than christ if they have done more than christ ever did give them the preference but if you really think that christ is as trustworthy as they are then deal with him as fairly oh someone says in a light way i believe that christ was born in bethlehem and i believe that he died on the cross do you believe it with your head or your heart i will illustrate the difference you are in your own house in the morning you open a newspaper and you read how captain braveheart on the sea risked his life for the salvation of his passengers you say what a grand fellow he must have been his family deserves very well of the country you fold the newspaper and sit down at the table and perhaps do not think of that incident again that is historical faith but now you are on the sea and it is night and you are asleep and are awakened by the shriek of fire you rush out on the deck you hear amid the ringing of the hands and the fainting the cries no hope we are lost we are lost 
the sail puts out its wings of fire the ropes make a burning ladder in the night heavens the spirit of wreck hisses in the waves and on the hurricane deck shakes out its banner of smoke and darkness down with the lifeboats cries the captain down with the lifeboats people rush into them the boats are about full room only for one more man you are standing on the deck beside the captain who shall it be you or the captain the captain says you you jump and are saved he stands there and dies now you believe that captain braveheart sacrificed himself for his passengers but you believe it with love with tears with hot and long continued exclamations with grief at his loss and with joy at your deliverance that is saving faith in other words what you believe with all the heart and believe in regard to yourself on this hinge turns my sermon i the salvation of your immortal soul you often go across a bridge you know nothing about you do not know who built the bridge you do not know what material it is made of but you come to it and you walk over it and ask no questions and here is an arched bridge blasted from the rock of ages and built by the architect of the whole universe spanning the dark gulf between sin and righteousness and all god asks you is to walk across it and you start and you come to it and you go a little way on and you stop and you fall back and experiment you say how do i know that bridge will hold me instead of marching on with firm step asking no questions but feeling that the strength of the eternal god is under you oh was there ever a prize offered so cheap as pardon and heaven are offered to you for how much a million dollars it is certainly worth more than that but cheaper than that you can have it ten thousand dollars less than that five thousand dollars less than that one dollar less than that one farthing less than that without money and without price no money to pay no journey to take no penance to suffer only just one decisive action of the soul believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved shall i try to tell you what it is to be saved i cannot tell you no man no angel can tell you but i can hint at it for my text brings me up to this point thou shalt be saved it means a happy life here and a peaceful death and a blissful eternity it is a grand thing to go to sleep at night and to get up in the morning and to do business all day feeling that all is right between my heart and god no accident no sickness no persecution no peril no sword can do me any permanent damage i am a forgiven child of god and he is bound to see me through he has sworn he will see me through the mountains may depart the earth may burn the light of the stars may be blown out by the blast of the judgment hurricane but life and death things present and things to come are mine yea farther than that it means a peaceful death mrs hemans mrs sigourney dr young and almost all the poets have said handsome things about death there is nothing beautiful about it when we stand by the white and rigid features of those whom we love and they give no answering pressure of the hand and no returning kiss of the lip we do not want anybody poetizing around about us death is loathsomeness and midnight and the ringing of the heart until the tendrils snap and curl in the torture unless christ be with us i confess to you an infinite fear a consuming horror of death unless christ shall be with me i would rather go down into a cave of wild beasts or a jungle of reptiles than into the grave unless christ goes with me will you tell me that i am to be carried out from my bright home and put away in the darkness i cannot bear darkness at the first coming of the evening i must have the gas lit and the further on in life i get the more i like to have my friends around about me 
and am i to be put off for thousands of years in a dark place with no one to speak to when the holidays come and the gifts are distributed shall i add no joy to the merry christmas or the happy new year ah do not point down to the hole in the ground the grave and call it a beautiful place unless there be some supernatural illumination i shudder back from it my whole nature revolts at it but now this glorious lamp is lifted above the grave and all the darkness is gone and the way is clear i look into it now without a single shudder now my anxiety is not about death my anxiety is that i may live aright for i know that if my life is consistent when i come to the last hour and this voice is silent and these eyes are closed and these hands with which i beg for your eternal salvation to-day are folded over the still heart that then i shall only begin to live what power is there in anything to chill me in the last hour if christ wraps around me the skirts of his own garment what darkness can fall upon my eyelids then amid the heavenly daybreak o oh, death i will not fear thee then back to thy cavern of darkness thou robber of all the earth fly thou despoiler of families with this battle-axe i hew thee in twain from helmet to sandal the voice of christ sounding all over the earth and through the heavens o oh, death i will be thy plague o grave i will be thy destruction to be saved is to wake up in the presence of christ you know when jesus was on the earth how happy he made every house he went into and when he brings us up to his house how great our glee his voice has more music in it than is to be heard in all the oratorios of eternity talk not about banks dashed with efflorescence jesus is the chief bloom of heaven we shall see the very face that beamed sympathy in bethany and take the very hand that dropped its blood from the short beam of the cross oh i want to stand in eternity with him toward that harbour i steer toward that goal i run i shall be satisfied when i awake in his likeness O oh, broken-hearted men and women, how sweet it will be in that good land to pour all your hardships and bereavements and losses into the loving ear of Christ, and then have him explain why it was best for you to be sick, and why it was best for you to be widowed, and why it was best for you to be persecuted, and why it was best for you to be tried, and have him point to an elevation proportionate to your disquietude here, saying, you suffered with me on earth come up now and be glorified with me in heaven someone went into a house where there had been a good deal of trouble and said to the woman there you seem to be lonely yes she said i am lonely how many in the family only myself have you had any children i had seven children where are they gone all gone all all dead all then she breathed a long sigh into the loneliness and said oh sir i have been a good mother to the grave and so there are hearts that are utterly broken down by the bereavements of life i point you to-day to the eternal balm of heaven are there any here that i am missing this morning oh you poor waiting maid your heart's sorrow poured in no human ear lonely and sad how glad you will be when christ shall disband all your sorrows and crown you queen unto god and the lamb for ever o oh, aged men and women fed by his love and warmed by his grace for threescore years and ten will not your decrepitude change for the leap of a heart when you come to look face to face upon him whom having not seen you love oh that will be the good shepherd not out in the night and watching to keep off the wolves but with the lambs reclining on the sunlit hill that will be the captain of our salvation not amid the roar and crash and boom of battle but amid the disbanded troops keeping victorious festivity that will be the bridegroom of the church coming from afar 
the bride leaning upon his arm while he looks down into her face and says behold thou art fair my love behold thou art fair end of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Twenty Five Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Twenty Five Sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. What is in a name? A name which is above every name. Philippians eleven two. On my way from the Holy Land, and while I wait for the steamer to resume her voyage to America, I preach to you from this text, which was one of Paul's rapturous and enthusiastic descriptions of the name of Jesus. By common proverb we have come to believe that there is nothing in a name, and so parents sometimes present their children for baptism, regardless of the title given them, and not thinking that the particular title will be either a hindrance or a help strange mistake you have no right to give your child a name that is lacking either in euphony or in moral meaning it is a sin for you to call your child jehoiakim or tiglath pileser because you yourself may have an exasperating name is no reason why you should give it to those who come after you but how often we have seen some name filled with jargon rattling down from generation to generation simply because someone a long while ago happened to be afflicted with it. Institutions and enterprises have sometimes, without sufficient deliberation, taken their nomenclature. Mighty destinies have been decided by the significance of a name. There are men who all their life long toil and tussle to get over the influence of some unfortunate name. While we may, through right behavior and Christian demeanor, outlive the fact that we were baptized by the name of a despot, or an infidel, or a cheat, how much better it would have been if we all could have started life without any such encumbrance. When I find the apostle in my text and other parts of his writing breaking out in a scription of admiration in regard to the name of Jesus, I want to inquire what are some of the characteristics of that appellation. And oh, that the Savior himself, while I speak, might fill me with his own presence, for we never can tell others that which we have not ourselves felt. First, the name of Jesus is an easy name. Sometimes we are introduced to people whose name is so long and unpronounceable that we have sharply to listen and to hear the name given to us two or three times before we venture to speak it. But within the first two years, the little child clasps its hands and looks up and says, Jesus. Can it be amid all the families represented here today, there is one household where the little ones speak of father and mother and brother and sister, and not of the name which is above every name. Sometimes we forget the titles of our very best friends, and we have to pause and think before we can recall the name. But can you imagine any freak of intellect in which you could forget the Savior's designation? That word Jesus seems to fit the tongue in every dialect. When the voice in old age gets feeble and tremulous and indistinct, still this regal word has potent utterance. Jesus, I love thy charming name, tis music to my ear. Fain would I sound it out so loud that heaven and earth might hear. Still further, I remark, it is a beautiful name. You have noticed that it is impossible to dissociate a name from the person who has the name. So there are names that are to me repulsive. I do not want to hear them at all, while well, those very names are attractive to you. Why the difference? It is because I happen to know persons by those names who are cross and sour and snappish and queer, while the persons you used to know by those names were pleasant and attractive. As we cannot dissociate a name from the person who holds the name, that consideration makes Christ's name so unspeakably beautiful. No sooner is it pronounced in your presence then you think of Bethlehem and Gethsemane and Golgotha, and you see the loving face and hear the tender voice, and feel the gentle touch. You see Jesus, the one who, though banqueting with heavenly hierarchs, came down to breakfast on the fish 
that rough men had just hauled out of Genesaret. Jesus, the one who, though the clouds are the dust of his feet, walked footsore on the road to Emmaus. Just as soon as that name is pronounced in your presence, you think of how the shining one gave back the centurion's daughter, and how he helped the blind man to the sunlight, and how he made the cripple's crutches useless, and how he looked down into the babe's laughing eyes, and as the little one struggled to go to him, flung out his arms around it and impressed a loving kiss on its brow, and said, Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Beautiful name, Jesus. It stands for love, for patience, for kindness, for forbearance, for self-sacrifice, for magnanimity. It is aromatic with all odors and accordant with all harmonies. Sometimes I see that name, and the letters seem to be made out of tears, and then again they look like gleaming crowns. Sometimes they seem to me as though twisted out of the straw on which he lay, and then as though built out of the thrones on which his people shall reign. Sometimes I sound that word Jesus, and I hear coming through the two syllables the sigh of Gethsemane, and the groan of Calvary. And again I sound it, and it is all a ripple with gladness, and a ring with Hosanna. Take all the glories of bookbindery and put them around the page where the name is printed. On Christmas morning, wreathe it on the wall. Let it drip from harp strings and thunder out in organ's diapason. Sound it often, sound it well, until every star shall seem to shine it, and every flower shall seem to breathe it, and mountain and sea and day and night and earth and heaven acclaim in full chant. Blessed be his glorious name for ever, the name that is above every name. Jesus, the name high over all, in heaven and earth and sky. To the repenting soul, to the exhausted invalid, to the Sunday school girl, to the snow-white octogenarian, it is beautiful. The old man comes from a long walk and tremblingly opens the door and hangs his hat on the old nail and sets his cane in the usual corner and lies down on a couch and says to his children and grandchildren, My dears, I am going to leave you. They say, Why, where are you going, grandfather? I am going to Jesus. And so the old man faints away into heaven. The little child comes in from play and throws himself on your lap and says, Mama, I am so sick, so sick. And you put her to bed, and the fever is worse and worse, until in some midnight she looks up into your face and says, Mama, kiss me goodbye. I am going away from you. And you say, My dear, where are you going to? And she says, I am going to Jesus. And the red cheek which you thought was the mark of fever only turns out to be the carnation bloom of heaven. Oh, yes, it is a sweet name, spoken by the lips of childhood, spoken by the old man. Still further, it is a mighty name. Rothschild is a potent name in the commercial world. Cuvier in the scientific world. Irving, a powerful name in the literary world. Washington, an influential name in the political world. Wellington, a mighty name in the military world. But tell me any name in all the earth, so potent to awe, to lift and thrill, and rouse and agitate and bless, as the name of Jesus. That one word unhorsed Saul, and flung Newton on his face in a ship's deck, and today holds four hundred million of the race with omnipotent spell. That name in England today means more than Victoria. In Germany means more than Emperor William. In France means more than Carnot. In Italy means more than Humbert of the present or Garibaldi of the past. I have seen a man bound hand and foot in sin. Satan, his hard taskmaster, in a bondage from which no human power could deliver him. Yet at the pronunciation of that one word, he dashed down his chains and marched out forever free. I have seen a man overwhelmed with disaster, the last hope fled, the last light gone out. That name pronounced in his hearing, the sea dropped, the clouds scattered, and a sunburst of eternal gladness poured into his soul. I have seen a man hardened in infidelity, defiant of God, full of scoff and jeer, jocose of the judgment, 
reckless of an unending eternity at the mere pronunciation of that name blanch cower and quake and pray and sob and groan and believe and rejoice oh it is a mighty name at its utterance the last wall of sin will fall the last temple of superstition crumble the last juggernaut of cruelty crash to pieces that name will first make all the earth tremble and then it will make all the nations sing it is to be the password at every gate of honor the insignia on every flag the battle shout in every conflict all the millions of the earth are to know it the red horse of carnage seen in apocalyptic vision and the black horse of death are to fall back on their haunches and the white horse of victory will go forth mounted by him who hath the moon under his feet and the stars of heaven for his tiara other dominions seem to be giving out this seems to be enlarging spain has had to give up much of its dominion austria has been wonderfully depleted in power france has had to surrender some of her favorite provinces most of the thrones of the world are being lowered and most of the sceptres of the world are being shortened but every bible printed every tract distributed every sunday school class taught every school founded every church established is extending the power of christ's name that name has already been spoken under the chinese wall and a siberian snow castle in brazilian grove and in eastern pagoda that name is to swallow up all other names that crown is to cover up all other crowns that empire is to absorb all other dominations all crimes shall cease and ancient fraud shall fail returning justice lift aloft her scale peace o'er the world her olive wand extend and white-robed innocence from heaven descend still further it is an enduring name you clamber over the fence of the graveyard and pull aside the weeds and you see the faded inscription on the tombstone that was the name of a man who once ruled all that town the mightiest names of the world have perished or are perishing gregory the sixth sancho of spain conrad the first of germany richard the first of england louis the sixteenth of france catherine of russia mighty names once that made the world tremble but now none so poor as to do them reverence and to the great mass of the people they mean absolutely nothing they never heard of them but the name of christ is to endure for ever it will be perpetuated in art for there will be other bellinis to depict the madonna there will be other girlandajos to represent christ's baptism there will be other bonzinos to show us christ visiting the spirits in prison other giottos to appall our sight with the crucifixion the name will be preserved in song for there will be other alexander popes to write the messiah other dr youngs to portray his triumphs other cowpers to sing his love it will be preserved in costly and magnificent architecture for protestantism as well as catholicism is yet to have its st mark's and its st peter's that name will be preserved in the literature of the world for already it is embalmed on the best books and there will be other dr paley's to write the evidences of christianity and other richard baxter's to describe the saviour's coming to judgment but above all and more than all that name will be embalmed in the memory of all the good of earth and all the great ones of heaven will the delivered bondman of earth ever forget who freed him will the blind man of earth forget who gave him sight will the outcast of earth forget who brought him home no no to destroy the memory of that name of christ you would have to burn up all the bibles and all the churches on earth and then in a spirit of universal arson go through the gate of heaven and put a torch to the temples and the towers and the palaces and after all that city was wrapped in awful conflagration and the citizens came out and gazed on the ruin even then they would hear the name in the thunder of falling tower and the crash of crumbling wall and see it inwrought in the flying banners of flame and the redeemed of the lord on high would be happy and yet cry out let the palaces and the temples burn we have jesus left blessed be his glorious name for ever and ever the name that is above every name have you ever made up your mind by what name you will call christ when you meet him in heaven you know he has many names will you call him jesus or the anointed one 
or the Messiah? Or will you take some of the symbolical names which on earth you learn from your Bible? Wandering some day in the garden of God on high, a place abloom with eternal springtide, infinite luxuriances of rose and lily and amaranth, you may look up into his face and say, My Lord, thou art the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. Some day, as a soul comes up from the earth to take its place in the firmament, and shine as a star for ever and ever, and the luster of a useful life shall beam forth tremulous and beautiful, you may look up into the face of Christ and say, My Lord, thou art a brighter star, the morning star, a star for ever. Wandering some day amid the fountains of life that toss in the sunlight and fall in the crash of pearl and amethyst, in golden and crystalline urn, and you wander up the round-banked river to where it first tingles its silver on the rock, and out of the chalices of love you drink to honor and everlasting joy. You may look up into the face of Christ and say, My Lord, thou art the fountain of living water. Some day, wandering amid the lambs and sheep in the heavenly pastures, feeding by the rock, rejoicing in the presence of him who brought you out of the wolfish wilderness, to the sheepfold above, you may look up into his loving and watchful eye and say, My Lord, thou art the shepherd of the everlasting hills. But there is another name you may select. I will imagine that heaven is done. Every throne has its king. Every harp has its harper. Heaven has gathered up everything that is worth having. The treasures of the whole universe have poured into it. The song full, the ranks full, the mansions full, heaven full. The sun shall set afire with splendor the domes of the temples, and burnish the golden streets into a blaze, and be reflected back from the solid pearl of the twelve gates. And it shall be noon in heaven, noon on the river, noon on the hills, noon in all the valleys, high noon. Then the soul may look up, gradually accustoming itself to the vision, shading the eyes as from the almost insufferable splendor of the noonday light, until the vision can endure it, then crying out, Thou art the sun that never sets. At this point I am staggered with the thought that notwithstanding all the charm in the name of Jesus, and the fact that it is so easy a name, and so beautiful a name, and so potent a name, and so enduring a name, there are people who find no charm in those two syllables. O oh, come this day, and see whether there is anything in Jesus. I challenge those of you who are farther from God to come at the close of this service, and test with me whether God is good, Christ is gracious, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. I challenge you to come and kneel down with me at the altar of mercy. I will kneel one side of the altar, and you kneel on the other side of it. And neither of us will rise up until our sins are forgiven, and we ascribe in the words of the text all honor to the name of Jesus, you pronouncing it, I pronouncing it, the name that is above every name. His worth, if all the nations knew, sure the whole earth would love him too. Oh, that God today, by the power of his Holy Spirit, would roll over you a vision of that blessed Christ, and you would begin to weep and pray and believe and rejoice. You have heard of the warrior who went out to fight against Christ. He knew he was in the wrong, and while waging the war against the kingdom of Christ, an arrow struck him and he fell. It pierced him in the heart. And lying there, his face to the sun, his life blood running away, he caught a handful of blood that was running out in his right hand, and held it up before the sun and cried out, O oh, Jesus, thou hast conquered, and if today the arrow of God's spirit piercing your soul, you felt the truth of what I have been trying to proclaim. You would surrender now and forever to the Lord who bought you. Glorious name! I know not whether you will accept it or not, but I will tell you one thing here and now. In the presence of angels and men, I take him to be my Lord, my God, my pardon, my peace, my life, my joy, my salvation, my heaven. Blessed be his glorious name for ever, the name that is above every name. Hallelujah unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. Amen and amen and amen. 
End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of twenty five sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Twenty five sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. Chapter fourteen. The half was not told me. The half was not told me. First Kings chapter 10 verse 7 Out of the 64 millions of our present American population and the millions of our past, only about 5,000 have ever visited the Holy Land. Of all those who cross to Europe, less than 5% ever get as far as Rome, and less than 2% ever get to Athens, and less than a quarter of 1% ever get to Palestine. Of the less than a quarter of one percent who do go to the Holy Land, some see nothing but the noxious insects and the filth of the Oriental cities, and come back wishing they had never gone. Of those who see much of interest and come home, only a small portion can tell what they have seen, the tongue unable to report the eye. The rarity of a successful, intelligent and happy journey through the Holy Land is very marked. But the time approaches when a journey to Palestine will be common. Thousands will go where now there are scores. Two locomotives were recently sent up from Joppa to Jerusalem, and railroads are about to begin in Palestine, and the day will come when the cry will be, All out for Jerusalem! Twenty minutes for breakfast at Tiberias! Change cars for Tyre! Grand Trunk Junction for Nineveh! And all out for Damascus! Meanwhile, the wet locks of the Atlantic Ocean and Adriatic and Mediterranean seas are being shorn, and not only is the voyage shortened, but after a while, without crossing the ocean, you or your children will visit the Holy Land. A company of capitalists have gone up the Bering Straits, where the American and Asiatic continents come within 36 miles of meeting. These capitalists, or others, will build a bridge across those straits, for midway are three islands called the Diomedes, and the water is not deep and is never disturbed with icebergs. Trains of cars will run from America across that bridge and on down through Siberia, bringing under more immediate observation the Russian outrages against exiles and consequently abolishing them. And there are persons here today who, without one qualm of seasickness, will visit that wonderful land where the Christ-like Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, Solomonic, and Herodic histories overlap each other with such power that by the time I took my feet out of the stirrups at the close of the journey, I felt so wrung out with emotion that it seemed nothing else could ever absorb my feelings again. The chief hindrance for going to Palestine with many is the dreadful sea, and though I have crossed it ten times, it is more dreadful every time and I fully sympathise with what was said one night when Mr. Beecher and I went over to speak in New York at the anniversary of the Seaman's Friends Society, and the clergyman making the opening prayer quoted from St. John, There shall be no more sea, and Mr. Beecher, seated beside me, in memory of a recent ocean voyage, said, Amen, I am glad of that. By the partial abolition of the Atlantic Ocean and the putting down of rail tracks across every country in all the world, the most sacred land on earth will come under the observation of so many people who will be ready to tell what they saw, that infidelity will be pronounced only another form of insanity, for no honest man can visit the Holy Land and remain an infidel. The Bible from which I preach has almost fallen apart for I read from it the most of the events in it recorded on the very places where they occurred. And some of the leaves got wet as the waves dashed over our boat on Lake Galilee, and the book was jostled in the saddlebags for many weeks. But it is a new book to me, newer than any book that yesterday came out of any of our great printing houses. All my life I had heard of Palestine, and I had read about it, talked about it, and preached about it, and sung about it, and prayed about it, and dreamed about it, until my anticipations were piled up into something like Himalayan proportions. 
and yet I have to cry out, as did the Queen of Sheba when she first visited the Holy Land, the half was not told me. In order to make the more accurate and vivid a book I have been writing, A Life of Christ, entitled From Manger to Throne, I left home last October, and on the last night of November we were walking the decks of the Senegal, a Mediterranean steamer. It was a ship of immense proportions. There were but few passengers, for it is generally rough at that time of year, and pleasurists are not apt to be voyaging there and then. The stars were all out that night. Those armies of light seemed to have had their shields newly burnished. We walked the polished deck. Not much was said, for in all our hearts was the dominant word, tomorrow. Somehow the Acropolis, which a few days before had thrilled us at Athens, now in our minds lessened in the height of its columns and the glory of its temples, and the Egyptian pyramids in our memory lessened their wonders of obsolete masonry, and the Colosseum of Rome was not so vast a ruin as it a few weeks before had seemed to be, and all that we had seen and heard dwindled in importance, for tomorrow, tomorrow, we shall see the Holy Land. Captain, what time will we come in sight of Palestine? Well, he said, if the wind and sea remain as they are, about daybreak. Never was I so impatient for a night to pass. I could not see much use for that night anyhow. I pulled aside the curtain from the porthole of my stateroom, so that the first hint of dawn would waken me. But it was a useless precaution. Sleep was among the impossibilities. Who could be so stupid as to slumber when any moment there might start out within sight of the ship, the land where the most stupendous scenes of all time and all eternity were enacted, land of ruin and redemption, land where was fought the battle that made our heaven possible, land of Godfrey and Saladin, of Joshua and Jesus. Will the night ever be gone? Yes, it is growing lighter, and along the horizon there is something like a bank of clouds, and as a watchman paces the deck, I say to him, What is that out yonder? That is land, sir, said the sailor. The land, I cried, and soon all our friends were aroused from sleep, and the shore began more clearly to reveal itself. With roar and rattle and bang, the anchor dropped in the roadstead a half mile from land. For though Joppa is the only harbour of Palestine, it is the worst harbour on all the coasts. Sometimes for weeks no ship stops there. Between rocks about seventy-five feet apart, a small boat must take the passengers ashore. The depths are strewn with the skeletons of those who have attempted to land or attempted to embark. Twenty-seven pilgrims perished with one crash of a boat against the rocks. Whole fleets of crusaders, of Romans, of Syrians, of Egyptians, have gone to splinters there. A writer of eight hundred years ago said he stood on the beach in a storm at Joppa, and out of thirty ships, all but seven went to pieces on the rocks, and a thousand of the dead were washed ashore. As we descended the narrow steps at the side of the ship, we heard the clamour and quarrel and swearing of fifteen or sixteen different races of men of all features and all colours and all vernaculars, all different in appearance, but all alike in desire to get our baggage and ourselves at exorbitant prices. Twenty boats and only ten passengers to go ashore. The man having charge of us pushes aside some and strikes with a heavy stick others, and by violence that would not be tolerated in our country, but which seems to be the only manner of making any impression there, clears our way into one of the boats, which heads for the shore. We are within fifteen minutes of the Christ land. Now we hear shouting from the beach, and in five minutes we will be landed. The prow of the boat is caught by men who wade out to help us in. We are tremulous with suppressed excitement. Our breath is quick, and from the side of the boat we spring to the shore. And Sunday morning, December 1st, 1889, about eight o'clock, our feet touch Palestine. Forever to me and mine will that day and hour be commemorated for that preeminent mercy. Let it be mentioned in prayer by my children and my children's children after we are gone, 
that morning we were permitted to enter that land and gaze upon those holy hills and feel the emotions that rise and fall and weep and laugh and sing and triumph at such a disembarkation on the back of hills one hundred and fifty feet high joppa is lifted toward the skies it is as picturesque as it is quaint and as much unlike any city we have ever seen as though it was built in that star mars where a few nights ago this very september astronomers through unparalleled telescopes saw a snowstorm raging how glad we were to be in joppa why this is the city where dorcas that queen of the needle lived and died and was resurrected you remember that the poor people came around the dead body of this benefactress and brought specimens of her kind needlework and said dorcas made this dorcas sewed that dorcas cut and fitted this dorcas hemmed that according to lightfoot the commentator they laid her out in state in a public room and the poor wrung their hands and cried and sent for peter who performed a miracle by which the good woman came back to life and resumed her benefactions an especial resurrection day for one woman she was the model by which many women of our day have fashioned their lives and at the first blast of the horn of the wintry tempest there appear ten thousand dorcases dorcases of brooklyn dorcases of new york dorcases of london dorcases of all the neighbourhoods and towns and cities of christendom just as good as the dorcas of the joppa which i visited thank god for the ever-increasing skill and sharpness and speed and generosity of dorcas's needle what is that man doing i said to the dragoman in the streets of joppa oh he is carrying his bed multitudes of the people sleep out of doors and that is the way so many in those lands become blind it is from the dew of the night falling on the eyelids as a result of this in egypt every twentieth person is totally blind in oriental lands the bed is made of a thin small mattress a blanket and a pillow and when the man rises in the morning he just ties up the three into a bundle and shoulders it and takes it away it was to that the saviour referred when he said to the sick man take up thy bed and walk an american couch or an english couch would require at least four men to carry it but one oriental can easily manage his slumber equipment but i inhale some of the odours of the large tanneries around joppa it is there to this day a prosperous business this tanning of hides and that reminds me of simon the tanner who lived at joppa and was a host of peter the apostle i suppose the olfactories of peter were as easily insulted by the odours of a tannery as others but the bible says he lodged with one simon a tanner people who go out to do reformatory and missionary and christian work must not be too sensitive simon no doubt brought to his homestead every night the malodours of the calfskins and oxhides in his tannery but peter lodged in that home not only because he may not have been invited to the houses of merchant princes surrounded by redolent gardens but to teach all men and women engaged in trying to make the world better they must not be squeamish and fastidious and finical and over particular in doing the work of the world the church of god is dying of fastidiousness we cry over the sufferings of the world in hundred dollar pocket handkerchiefs and then put a cent in the poor box there are many willing to do christian work among the cleanly and the refined and the elegant and the educated but excuse them from taking a loaf of bread down a dirty alley excuse them from teaching a mission school among the uncombed and unwashed excuse them from touching the hand of one whose fingernails are in mourning for departed soap such religious precisionists can toil in atmospheres laden with honeysuckle and rosemary but not in air floating up from the malodorous vats no 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 excuse them from lodging with one simon the tanner during the last war there was in virginia some sixty or seventy wounded soldiers in a barn on the second floor so near the roof that the heat of the august sun was almost insupportable the men were dying from sheer exhaustion and suffocation 
a distinguished member of the Christian Commission, said to the nurse who stood there, Wash the faces and feet of the seamen, and it will revive them. No, said the nurse, I didn't come into the army to wash anybody's feet. Well, said the distinguished member of the Commission, bring me water and towel. I will be very glad to wash their feet. One was the spirit of the devil, the other the spirit of Christ. But reference to Peter reminds me that we must go to the housetop in Joppa, where he was taught the democracy of religion. That was about the queerest thing that ever happened. On our way up to that housetop, we passed an old well where the great stones were worn deep with the ropes of the buckets. And it must be a well many centuries old, and I think Peter drank out of it. Four or five goat or calf skins, filled with water, lay about the yard. We soon got up the steps and on the housetop. It was in such a place in Joppa that Peter, one noon, while he was waiting for dinner, had a hungry fit and fainted away, and had a vision or dream or trance. I said to my family and friends on that housetop, Listen while I read about what happened here. And opening the Bible, we had the whole story. It seems that Peter on the housetop dreamed that a great blanket was let down out of heaven, and in it were sheep and goats and cattle and mules and pigeons and buzzards and snakes and all manner of creatures that fly the air or walk the fields or crawl the earth. And in the dream a voice told him, as he was hungry, to eat. And he said, I cannot eat things unclean. Three times he dreamed it. There was then heard a knocking at the gate of the house on the top of which Peter lay in a trance, and three men asked, Is Peter here? Peter, while yet wondering what his dream meant, descends the stairs and meets these strangers at the gate, and they tell him that a good man by the name of Cornelius, in the city of Caesarea, has also had a dream, and has sent them for Peter, and to ask him to come and preach. At that call, Peter left Joppa for Caesarea. The dream he had just had prepared him to preach, for Peter learned, by it, to reject no people as unclean, and whereas he previously thought he must preach only to the Jews, now he goes to preach to the Gentiles, who were considered unclean. Notice how the two dreams meet, Peter's dream on the housetop, Cornelius's dream at Caesarea. So I have noticed providences meet, distant events meet, dreams meet. Every dream is hunting up some other dream, and every event is searching for some other event. In the 15th century, 1492, the great event was the discovery of America. The art of printing, born in the same century, goes out to meet that discovery and make the new world an intelligent world. The Declaration of Independence, announcing equal rights, meets Robert Burns's A Man's a Man for All That. The United States was getting too large to be managed by one government, and telegraphy was invented to compress within an hour the whole continent. Armies in the Civil War were to be fitted out with clothing, and the sewing machine invention came out to make it possible. Immense farming acreage is presented in this country enough to support millions of our native-born and millions of foreigners. But the old style of plough and scythe and reaper and thresher cannot do the work, and there came steam ploughs, steam harrows, steam reapers, steam rakes, steam threshers, and the work is accomplished. The forests of the earth fail to afford sufficient fuel, and so the coal mines surrender a sufficiency. The cotton crops were luxuriant, but of comparatively little value, for they could not be managed, and so at just the right time, Hargreaves came with his invention of the spinning jenny, and Arkwright with his roller, and Whitney with his cotton gin. The world, after pottering along with tallow candles and whale oil, was crying for better light and more of it, and the hills of Pennsylvania poured out rivers of oil, and kerosene illumined the nations. But the oil wells began to fail, and then the electric light comes forth to turn night into day. So all events are woven together, and the world is magnificently governed, because it is divinely governed. We criticise things, and think the divine machinery is going wrong, and put our fingers amid the wheels, only to get them crushed. But I say, hands off! 
things are coming out gloriously. Cornelius may be in Caesarea and Peter in Joppa, but their dreams meet. It is one hand that is managing the world, and that is God's hand, and one mind that is planning all things for good, and that is God's mind, and one heart that is filled with love and pardon and sympathy, and that is God's heart. Have faith in him. Fret about nothing. Things are not at loose ends. There are no accidents. All will come out right in your history and in the world. As you are waking from one dream upstairs, an explanatory dream will be knocking at the gate downstairs. Standing here in Joppa, I remember that where we this morning disembarked, the prophet Jonah embarked. For the first time in my life, I fully understood that story. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, but the prophet declined that call and came here to Joppa. I was for weeks while in the Holy Land, consulting with tourist companies as to how I could take Nineveh in my journey. They did not encourage the undertaking. It is a most tedious ride to Nineveh and a desert. Now I see an additional reason why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. He not only revolted because of the disagreeable message he was called to deliver at Nineveh, but because it was a long way and tough and bandit infested, so he came here to Joppa and took ship, but alas for the disastrous voyage. He paid his full fare for the whole voyage, but the ship company did not fill their part of the contract. To this day they have not paid back that passage money. Why people should doubt the story of Jonah and the whale is more of a mystery than the Bible event itself. I do not need the fact that Pliny, the historian, records that the skeleton of a whale forty feet long and with a hide a foot and a half thick was brought from Joppa to Rome. The event recorded in the book of Jonah has occurred a thousand times. The Lord always has a whale outside the harbour for a man who starts in the wrong direction. Recreant Jonah! I do not wonder that even the whale was sick of him. This prophet was put in the Bible not as an example, but as a warning, because the world not only needs lighthouses, but boys, to show where the rocks are. The Bible story of him ends by showing the prophet in a fit of the sulks. He was mad because Nineveh was not destroyed, and then he went out to pout and sat under a big leaf, using it for shade from the tropical sun. And when a worm disturbed that leaf, and it withered, and the sun smote Jonah, he flew into a great rage and said, It is better for me to die than to live. A prophet in a rage because he had lost his umbrella. Beware of petulance. But standing on this Joppa housetop, I look off on the Mediterranean, and what is that strange sight I see? The waters are black, seemingly for miles. There seems to be a great multitude of logs fastened together. Oh, yes, it is a great raft of timbers. They are cedars of Lebanon, which King Hiram is furnishing King Solomon in exchange for 20,000 measures of wheat, 20,000 baths of oil, and 20,000 baths of wine. These cedars have been cut down and trimmed in the mountains of Lebanon by the 70,000 axemen engaged there, and with great withs and iron bolts are fastened together, and they are floating down to Joppa to be taken across the land for Solomon's temple, now building at Jerusalem. For we have lost our hold of the 19th century and are clear back in the ages. The rafts of cedar are guided into what is called the Moon Pool, an old harbour south of Joppa, now filled with sand and useless. With long pikes, the timber is pushed this way and that in the water, then with levers and many a loud, long, Lo, heave, as the carters get their shoulders under the great weight, the timber is fastened to the wagons and the lowing oxen are yoked to the load, and the procession of teams moves on with crack of whip, and rolled out words which translated, I suppose, would correspond with the Whoa, whoa, gee, of modern teamsters, toward Jerusalem, which is thirty miles away, over mountainous distances, which for hundreds of years defied all engineering. And these rough cedars shall become carved pillars, and beautiful altars, and rounded banisters, and traceried panels, and sublime ceiling, and exquisite harps, and kingly chariots. 
as the wagon train moves out from joppa over the plain of sharon toward jerusalem i say to myself what vast numbers of people helped build that temple of solomon and what vast numbers of people are now engaged in building the wider higher grander temple of righteousness rising in the earth our christian ancestry toiled at it amid sweat and tears and hundreds of the generations of the good and the long train of christian workers still moves on and as in the construction of solomon's temple some hewed with the axe in faraway lebanon and some drove a wedge and some twisted a withe and some trod the wet and slippery rafts on the sea and some yoked the ox and some pulled at the load and some shoved the plane and some fitted the points and some heaved up the rafters but all helped build the temple though some of these never saw it so now let us all put our hands and our shoulders and our hearts to the work of building the temple of righteousness which is to fill the earth and one will bind a wound and another will wipe away a tear and another will teach a class and another will speak the encouraging word and all of us will be ready to pull and lift and in some way help on the work until the millennial morn shall gild the pinnacle of that finished temple and at its shining gates the world shall put down its last burden and in its lavers wash off its last stain and at its altar the last wanderer shall kneel at the dedication of that temple all the armies of earth and heaven will shoulder arms and present arms and ground arms for behold a greater than solomon is here but my first day in the holy land is ended the sun is already closing his eye for the night i stand on the balcony of a hotel which was brought to joppa in pieces from the state of maine by some fanatics who came here expecting to see christ reappear in palestine my room here was once occupied by that christian hero of the centuries english chinese egyptian world-wide general gordon a man mighty for god as well as for the world's pacification although the first of december and winter the air is full of fragrance from gardens all abloom and under my window are acacia and tamarisk and mulberry and century plants and orange groves and oleander from the drowsiness of the air and the fatigues of the day i feel sleepy good night tomorrow morning we start for jerusalem end of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of twenty five sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. Twenty five sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas D. Witt Talmish. Chapter fifteen. I went up to Jerusalem. I went up to Jerusalem, Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. My second day in the Holy Land. We are in Joppa. It is six o'clock in the morning, but we must start early, for by night we are to be in Jerusalem, and that city is forty-one miles away. We may take camel, or house, or carriage, as today will be our last opportunity in Palestine for taking the wheel. We chose that. The horses with harness tasseled and jingling are hitched and with the dragoman in coat of many colours seated in front we start on a road which unveils within twelve hours enough to think of for all time and all eternity farewell mediterranean with such a blue as no one but the divine chemist could mix and such a fire of morning glow as only the divine illuminator could kindle Hail, mountains of Ephraim and Judah, whose ramparts of rock we shall mount in a few hours, for modern engineers can make a road anywhere, and without piling Ossa upon Pelion, those giants can scale the heavens. We start out of the city amid barricades of cactus on either side, not cacti in boxes two or three feet high, but cactus higher than the top of the carriage a plant that has more swords for defence considering the amount of beauty 
it can exhibit than anything created. We passed out amid about four hundred gardens, seven or eight acres to the garden, from which, at the right seasons, are plucked oranges, lemons, figs, olives, citron and pomegranates, and which hold up their censers of perfume before the Lord in perpetual praise. We meet great processions of camels, loaded with keys of oil and with fruits, and some wealthy Mohammedan, with four wives, three too many. The camel is a proud, mysterious, solemn, ancient, ungainly, majestic and ridiculous shape, stalking out of the past. The driver with his whip taps the camel with the foreleg, and he kneels to take you as a rider. But when he rises, hold fast, or you will fall off backward, as he puts his four feet in standing posture, and then you will fall off in front as his back legs take their place. But the inhabitants are used to his ways, although I find the riders often dismount and walk as though to rest themselves. Better stand out of the path of the camel. He stops for nothing and seems not to look down. And in the street I saw a child, by the stroke of a camel's front foot, hurled seven or eight feet along the ground. Here we meet people with faces and arms and hand tattooed. And in all lands, sailors tattoo their arms with some favourite ship or admired face. It was to this habit of tattooing among the Orientals that God refers in a figure when he says of his church, I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. Many of these regions are naturally sandy, but by irrigation they are made fruitful, and as in this irrigation the brooks and rivers are turned this way and that to water the gardens or farms. So the Bible says, The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord, and he turneth it as the rivers of water are turned whithersoever he will. As we passed out and on, we find about eight hundred acres belonging to the Universal Israelitish Alliance, Montefiore, the Israelitish Centenarian and Philanthropist, and Rothschild, the banker, and others of the large-hearted have paid the passage to Palestine for many of the Israelites, and set apart lands for their culture, and it is only a beginning of the fulfilment of divine prophecy when these people shall take possession of the Holy Land. The road from Joppa to Jerusalem, and all the lands leading to Nazareth and Galilee, we saw lined with processions of Jews going to the sacred places, either on holy pilgrimage or as settlers. All the fingers of providence nowadays are pointing toward that resumption of Palestine by the Israelites. I do not take it that the prospered Israelites of other lands are to go there. They would be foolish to leave their prosperities in our American cities, where they are among our best citizens and cross two seas to begin life over again in a strange land. But the outrages heaped upon them in Russia and the insults offered them in Germany will soon quadruple and centuple the procession of Israelites from Russia to Palestine. Faculties for getting there will be multiplied not only in the railroad from Joppa to Jerusalem, to which I referred last Sabbath as being built, but permission for a road from Damascus to the Bay of Acre as has been obtained, and that, of course, will soon connect with Joppa and make one great ocean shore railroad. So the road from Jerusalem to Joppa, from Joppa to Damascus, will soon bring all the Holy Land within a few hours of connection. Jewish colonization societies in England and Russia are gathering money for the transportation of the Israelites to Palestine and for the purchase for them of lands and farming implements. And so many desire to go that it is decided by lot as to which families shall go first. They were God's chosen people at the first and he has promised to bring them back to their home and there is no power in one thousand or five thousand years to make God forget his promises. Those who have prospered in other lands will do well to stay where they are. But let the Israelites, who are depreciated and attacked and persecuted, turn their faces towards the rising sun of their deliverance. God will gather in that distant land those of that race who have been maltreated, and he will blast with the lightnings of his omnipotence those lands on either side of the Atlantic which have been the instruments of annoyance and harm to that Jewish race to which belonged Abraham and David, and Joshua, and Baron Hirsch, and Montefiore, and Paul the Apostle, and Mary the Virgin, and Jesus Christ the Lord. On the way across the plain of Sharon, we meet many veiled women, 
it is not respectable for them to go unveiled and it is a veil that is so hung as to make them hideous a man may not even see the face of his wife until after betrothal or engagement of marriage hence the awful mistakes and the unhappy homes for god has made the face an index of character and honesty or dishonesty usually is demonstrated in the features i do not see what god made a fair face for if it were not to be looked at but here come the crowds of disfigured women down the road on their way to jupa bundles of sticks for firewood on their heads they started at three o'clock in the morning to get the fuel they staggered under the burdens whipped and beaten will some of them be if their bundle of sticks is too small all that is required for divorcement is for a man to say to his wife be off i don't want you any more woman a slave in all lands except those in which the gospel of christ makes her a queen and yet in christian countries there are women posing as sceptics and men with family deriding the only religion that makes sacred and honourable the names of wife mother daughter and sister what is that town of ramla birthplace residence and tomb of samuel the glorious prophet nearby is the town of forty martyrs so called because that number of disciples perished there for christ's sake but if towers had been built for all those who in the time of war as in time of peace have fallen on this road during the ages past you might almost walk on turrets from joppa to jerusalem now we pass guard houses which are castles of chopped straw and mud where at night and partly through the day armed men dwell and keep the bandits of travellers in the caves of these mountains dwell men to whom massacre would be high play and a purse with a few pennies would be compensation enough for the struggle that the savage might have with the wayfarer there is only one other defence that amounts to such in these lands and that is the law of hospitality if you can get an arab to eat with you if only one mouthful you are sure of his protection and that has been so from age to age the lord's supper was built on that custom a special friendship after partaking food together to that custom walter scott refers in his immortal talisman where saladin with one stroke of the sword strikes a head from an enemy who stands in saladin's tent with a cup in his hand and before he has time to put it to his lip and does it so suddenly that the body of his enemy beheaded stands for a moment after the beheading with the cup still in his right hand after the cup had been sipped it would have been impossible according to the laws of oriental hospitality to give the fatal blow the only lands where it is safe to travel unarmed are christian lands human life is more highly valued and personal rights are better respected and i am glad to believe that in our country from the atlantic ocean to the pacific ocean there is not a place today where a man is not safer without a pistol than with one but all through our journeys in palestine we required firearms while the only weapon i had on my person was a new testament we went through the region where i said to the dragoman david are you armed and he said yes and i said are those fifteen or twenty muleteers or baggage men and attendants armed and he said yes and i felt safer on we roll through the plain of sharon here grew the rose after which christ was named rose of sharon celebrated in all christendom and throughout all ages there has been controversy as to what flower it was some say it was a marshmallow that thrives here and some claim this honour for the narcissus and some for the blue iris and some for the scarlet animon for you must know that this plain of sharon is a rolling ocean of colour when the spring breezes move across it but leaving the botanists in controversy as to what it is i would take the most aromatic and beautiful of them all and twist them into a garden for the name which is above every name yonder a little to the north as we move on is the plain of ono the bible mentions it again and again the village standing on this plain of ono is a mud village the great basins of rock attach the rains for the people of more importance in olden time than in modern time was this plain of ono but as the dragoman announced it and in the bible i read of it i was reminded of the vast multitude of people who now dwell in the plain of ono they are by their nervous constitution or by their lack of faith in god always in the negative will you help to build a church oh no 
Will you start out in some new Christian enterprise? Oh, no. Do you think the world is getting any better? Oh, no. They lie down in the path of all good movements, sanitary, social, political and religious. They harness their horses with no traces to pull ahead, but only breaching straps to hold back. For all Christian work, I would not give for a thousand of them the price of a clipped ten-cent pence. They are in the plain of, oh no. May the Lord multiply the numbers of those who, when anything good is undertaken, are found to live in the plain of, oh yes. Will you support this new charity? Oh yes. Do you think that this victim of evil habit can be reformed? Oh yes. Are you willing to do anything, whether obscure or resounding, for he farewell of the church and the salvation of a ruined world? Oh yes. But I am sorry to say that the most populous plain in all the earth today is the plain of Ono. Oh Here now we come where stood the fields into which Samson fired the foxes. The foxes are no rarity in this land. I counted at one time twenty or thirty of them in one grip, and the cry all along the line was foxes. Look out, look at the foxes. And at night they sometimes bark until all attempts to sleep are an absurdity. Those I saw and heard in Palestine might have been descendants of the very foxes that Samson employed for an appalling incendiarism. The wealth of that land was in the harvests, and it was harvest time and the straw was dry. Three hundred foxes are caught and tied in couples by some wire or incombustible cord which the flames cannot divide. The fire brands are fastened to those couples of foxes, and the affrighted creatures are let loose and run every weather among the harvests, and in the awful blaze down go the corn shocks, and the vineyards, and the olives, and all through the valleys, and over the hills, and among the villages is heard the cry of fire. And in the burnt pathway walk hunger and want and desolation, all this for spite, and some theologians learn one thing, and some another. But I learn from it that a great man may sometimes stoop to a very mean piece of business, and that if men would use as much ingenuity in trying to bless as they do in trying to destroy, the world all the way down would have been in better condition. Yet the fire of the foxes kindled that night, and Palestine was not gone out, but has leaped the seas, and the sly foxes, the human foxes, are now still running every weather, kindling political fires, fires of religious controversy, fires of hate, world-wide fires, and whole harvests of righteousness perish. It took the hard work of multitudes on all those plains in Palestine for months and months to rear the vine and raise the corn, but it took only three hundred worthless foxes one night to blaze all into ashes. Brace up your nerves now, that you may look while I point them out. Yonder is Kurzjath Jerim, where the ark of God stayed until David took it to Jerusalem. Yonder John the Baptist was born. Yonder is Emmaus, where Christ walked with the disciples at eventide. Here are men ploughing, only one handle to the plough, showing the accuracy of Christ's illusion. When we plough in America or England, there are only two hands on two handles, but in Palestine only one handle. And so Christ uses the singular, saying, No man, having put his hand to the plough, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. The ox is urged on by a wooden stick, pointed with sharp iron, and the ox knows enough not to kick, for he would only hurt himself instead of breaking the goad. And the Bible refers to that when it says to Saul, It is hard for thee to kick against the goads. Here is the valley of Asgelon, famous for Joshua's pursuit of the five kings and the lunar arrest. And the imagination I see the moon in daytime halt. Who has not sometimes seen the moon dispute the throne with the sun? But when the king of day and the queen of night, who never before Joshua's time nor since then stopped a moment in their march, halted at Joshua's command, it was a scene enough to make the universe shiver. Moon, stand thou still in the valley of Asgelon. At another time, we will see the sun stop above Gibeon, but now we have only to do with the moon, and you must remember that it was more of an orb than it is now. It is a burnt-out world now, a dead world now, an extinct world now, a corpse laid out in state in the heavens, waiting for the judgment day to bury it. 
but on the day of which i speak the moon was probably a living world yet it halted at the wave of joshua's finger stand thou still do not budge an inch until joshua finishes those five kings who are there tumbling over the rocks sword of man slashing them hailstones out of the sky pelting them and there is the cavern of makeda where they fled for safety and where they were afterwards locked in and from which they were taken out to be slain and in which they were afterwards buried and you do well to examine the, that cavern for within a few hours it became three things which no other cave ever was fortress prison sepulchre now we pass the place where once lived one of the greatest robbers of the century abu gosh by name from this point you see he could look over all the surrounding country and long before the travellers came up to him the plan for the taking of their money or their life or both was consummated he one day found a company of monks who would not pay and he smothered them to death in a hot oven in his last days he lived here like an oriental prince and had his attendants and admirers to whom he told the stories of brigandage and assassination so late as when our eminent and beloved american william c prime passed through abigosh the scoundrelly bedouin sat at his doorway smoking his pipe his descendants live in this village and probably are no more honest than their distinguished ancestor but marauding and murder are not as safe a business now as when all this route to jerusalem was subject to outrages pandemonic here we pass the village of latrin the home of the penitent thief the village a few straggling houses on steep hills rising from the valley of agilone up these steep hills in his earlier days the thief had carried the spoils of arson and burglary and down them he had borne the heavier burden of a guilty heart but higher than these hills he mounted after he had repented from the transfixed posture on the cross to the bosom of a forgiving god now we come to the brook of elah from which little david took the smooth stones with which he prostrated goliath there is a bridge spanning the ravine but at the season we crossed there is not a drop of water in the brook he went down into the ravine and walked amid pebbles that had been washed smooth very smooth by the rush of the waters through all the ages there is where david armed himself he walked around and picked up five of these polished pebbles he got them off just the right size he prepared himself for five volleys so that if the giant escapes the first he will not escape the whole five the topography of the place so corresponds with the bible story that i could see the memorable fight go on it is the only fight i ever did watch pugilism i abhor but there were two champions the one god appointed the other satan appointed and deciding the destiny of a nation the destiny of a world it was a marathon an arbella a waterloo a plenheim a sedan concentered into two right arms here are two ridges of mountains five hundred feet high the palestines on one ridge the israelites on the other ridge the fight is in the valley between at that season shaded the sweet with terebinth and acacia david the champion for the israelites goliath the champion for the philistines david undersized and almost effeminate only a mouthful for goliath who was nearly ten feet high they advanced to meet each other but the bible says that david made the first step forward nearer and nearer they come but i do not think david will wait until he comes within reach of goliath's sword for that would be fatal and david has a weapon with which he can fight a long range closer and closer they come but david advances the more rapidly come to me said the giant and i will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field you see goliath going to give david for a banquet to the vulture and jackal he the mountain of flesh will fall over on that little hillock i hear him laugh through the mouthpiece of his helmet he will toast a little with it on the top of his long sword he will call all the crows for a breakfast come to me you contemptible little fellow and i will make quick work with you the idea that a five-footer should dare to come out against a ten-footer 
let the two armies looking down from the ridges watch me david responded i come to thee in the name of the lord of hosts aha that is the right kind of battle shout in the name of the lord of hosts how that cry rings through the weary is stumped he who fights in that spirit wins the day the almost dwarfed israelite enlarges into omnipotent proportions the moment to strike has come david takes his sling with a stone in it and whirls it round and round his head until he has put the weapon into sufficient momentum and then taking sure aim hurls it the giant throws it up throws up his hands and reels back the falls the stone sank into his forehead that was the only available point of attack but how about the helmet of his head did the stone that david flung crush through his helmet no an old rabbi says he thinks that when goliath scoffed at david the giant so suddenly and contemptuously jerked up his head that the helmet fell off that is like enough david saw the bare forehead a foot high and aimed at the centre of it and the skull cracked and broke in like an eggshell and the ground shook as this great oak of a military chieftain struck it you who's a for david but we must hasten on for the danger now is that night will be upon us before we reach jerusalem oh we must see it before sundown we are climbing the hills which are terraced with olive groves uplands rising above uplands until we come to an immensity of barrenness grey rocks above grey rocks where neither tree nor leaf nor bush nor grass blade can grow the horses stumble and slip and pull till it seems the harness must break solemnity and awe take possession of us though a vivacious party and during part of the day jocularity had reigned now no one spoke a word except to say to the dragon dragoman tell us when you get the first glimpse of the city i never had such high expectation of seeing any place as of seeing jerusalem i think my feelings may have been slightly akin to that of the christian just about to enter the heavenly jerusalem my idea of the earthly jerusalem were bewildering had i not seen pictures of it oh yes but they only increased the bewilderment they were taken from a variety of standpoints if thirty artists attempt to sketch brooklyn or new york or london or jerusalem they will plant their cameras at different places and take as many different pictures but in a few minutes i shall see the sacred city with my own eyes over another shoulder off the hill we go and nothing in sight but rocks and mountains and awful glutches between them which make the head swim if you look down on and up on and up until the lathered and smoking horses are reined in and the dragoman rises in front and points eastward crying jerusalem it was mightier than an electric shock we all rose there it lay the prize of nations the terminus of famous pilgrimages the object of roman and crusading wars and for it assyrians had fought the egyptians had fought and the world had fought the place which the queen of sheba visited the richard cure de leon had conquered home of solomon home of ezekiel home of jeremiah home of isaiah home of saladin mount zion of david's heartbreak the mount moriah where the sacrifices smoked mount of olives where jesus preached and gethsemane where he agonized and golgotha where he died and the holy sepulchre where he was buried o oh, jerusalem jerusalem greatest city on earth and type of the city celestial after i have been ten thousand years in heaven the memory of that first view from the rocks on the afternoon of december the second will be as vivid as now an arab on a horse that was like a whirlwind bitted and saddled and spurred its mane and flanks jet as the night and there are no such horsemen as arab horsemen a come far out to meet us and invite us to his hotel inside the gates but arrangements had been made for us to stay at a hotel outside the gates in the dusk of evening we halted in front of the place and entered but i said no thank you for your courteous reception but i must sleep tonight inside the gates of jerusalem i would rather have the poorest place inside the gates than the best place outside so we remounted our coach and moved on amid a clamour of voices and between camels grunting with great beams and timbers on their backs brought in for building purposes for it is amazing how much a camel can carry 
until we came to what is called the Joppa Gate of Jerusalem. It is about forty feet wide, twenty feet deep, and sixty feet high. There is a sharp turn just after you have entered, so planned as to make the entrance of armed enemies the more difficult. On the structure of these gates, the safety of Jerusalem depended, and all the Bible writers used them for illustrations. Within five minutes' walk of the gate we entered, David wrote, Enter into thy gates with thanksgiving. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion. Open to me the gates of righteousness. And Isaiah wrote, Go through, go through the gates. And the captive of Patmos wrote, The city hath twelve gates. Having passed the gate, we went on through the narrow streets, dimly lighted, and passed to our halting place, and sat down by the window from which we would see Mount Zion, and said, Here we are at last, in the capital of the whole world, and thoughts of the past and the future rushed through my soul in quick succession, and I thought of that old hymn sung by so many ascending spirits, Jerusalem, my happy home, name ever dear to me, when shall my labours have an end? in joy and peace in thee when shall these eyes thy heaven built walls and pearly gates behold thy bulwarks with salvation strong and streets of shining gold and so with our hearts full of gratitude to god for journeying mercies all the way from Joppa to jerusalem and with the bright anticipation of our entrance into the shining gate of the heavenly city when earthly journeys are over my second day in palestine is ended end of chapter 15 Recording by Chad Horner from Ballyclare in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. Chapter 16 of 25 Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. 25 Sermons on the Holy Land. By Thomas Dewitt Talmage. On the Housetop in Jerusalem. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Psalm 137, verse 5. Paralysis of his best hand, the withering of its muscles and nerves, is here invoked, if the author allows to pass out of mind the grandeurs of the holy city where once he dwelt. Jeremiah seated by the river Euphrates, wrote this psalm, and not David. Afraid I am of anything that approaches imprecation, and yet I can understand how anyone who has ever been at Jerusalem should, in enthusiasm of soul, cry out, whether he be sitting by the Euphrates, or the Hudson, or the Thames, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget her cunning. You see, it is a city unlike all others for topography, for history, for significance, for style of population, for waterworks, for ruins, for towers, for domes, for ramparts, for literature, for tragedies, for memorable birthplaces, for sepulchres, for conflagrations and famines, for victories and defeats. I am here at last in this very Jerusalem, and on a housetop, just after the dawn of the morning, on December 3rd, with an old inhabitant to point out the salient features of the scenery. Now, I said, where is Mount Zion? Here, at your right. Where is Mount Olivet? In front of where you stand. Where is the Garden of Gethsemane? In yonder valley. Where is Mount Calvary? Before he answered, I saw it. No unprejudiced mind can have a moment's doubt as to where it is. Yonder I see a hill in the shape of a human skull, and the Bible says that Calvary was the place of a skull. Not only is it skull-shaped, but just beneath the forehead of the hill is a cavern that looks like eyeless sockets. Within the grotto under it is the shape of the inside of a skull. Then the Bible says that Christ was crucified outside the gate, and this is outside the gate while the site formerly selected was inside the gate. Besides that, this skull hill was for ages the place where malefactors were put to death, and Christ was slain as a malefactor. The Saviour's assassination took place beside a thoroughfare along which people went wagging their heads. And there is the ancient thoroughfare. 
I sought Cairo, Egypt, a clay mould of that skull hill, made by the late General Gordon, the arbiter of nations. While Empress Helena, eighty years of age and imposed upon by having three crosses exhumed before her dim eyes, as though they were the three crosses of Bible story, selected another site as Calvary. All recent travellers agree that the one I point out to you was, without doubt, the scene of the most terrific and overwhelming tragedy this planet ever witnessed. There were a thousand things we wanted to see that third day of December, and our dragoman proposed this and that and the other journey, but I said, first of all, show us Calvary. Something might happen if we went elsewhere, and sickness or accident might hinder our seeing the sacred mount. If we see nothing else, we must see that, and see it this morning. Some of us in carriage, and some on muleback, we were soon on the way to the most sacred spot that the world has ever seen, or ever will see. Coming to the base of the hill, we first went inside the Skull of Rocks. It is called Jeremiah's Grotto, for there the prophet wrote his Book of Lamentations. The grotto is thirty-five feet high, and its top and side are malachite, green, brown, black, white, red, and grey. Coming forth from those pictured subterraneous passages, we begin to climb the steep sides of Calvary. As we go up, we see cracks and crevices in the rocks, which I think were made by the convulsions of nature when Jesus died. On the hill lay a limestone rock, white but tinged with crimson, the white so suggestive of purity and the crimson of sacrifice, that I said, that stone would be beautifully appropriate for a memorial wall in my church now building in America and the stone now being brought on camel's back from Sinai across the desert, when put under it, how significant of the law and the gospel! And these lips of stone will continue to speak of justice and mercy long after all our living lips have uttered their last message. So I rolled it down the hill and transported it. When that day comes, for which many of you have prayed, the dedication of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, the third immense structure we have reared in this city, and that makes it somewhat difficult being the third structure, a work such as no other church was ever called on to undertake. We invite you in the main entrance of that building to look upon a memorial wall containing the most suggestive and solemn and tremendous antiquities ever brought together. This rent with the earthquake at the giving of the law at Sinai the other end rent at the crucifixion on Calvary. It is impossible for you to realise what our emotions were as we gathered, a group of men and women, all saved by the blood of the Lamb, on a bluff of Calvary, just wide enough to contain three crosses. I said to my family and friends, I think here is where stood the cross of the impenitent burglar, and there the cross of the miscreant, and here between, I think, stood the cross on which all our hopes depend. As I opened the nineteenth chapter of John to read, a chill blast struck the hill, and a cloud hovered, the natural solemnity impressing the spiritual solemnity. I read a little, but broke down. I defy any emotional Christian man sitting upon Golgotha to read aloud and with unbroken voice, or with any voice at all, the whole of that account in Luke and John, of which these sentences are a fragment. They took Jesus and led him away, and he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Behold thy mother, I thirst. This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What sighs, what sobs, what tears, what tempests of sorrow, what surging oceans of agony in those utterances. While we sat there, the whole scene came before us. All around the top and the sides and the foot of the hill, a mob raged. They gnash their teeth and shake their clenched fists at him. Here the cavalry horses champ their bits and paw the earth 
and snort at the smell of the carnage. Yonder a group of gamblers are pitching up as to who shall have the coat of the dying saviour. There are women almost dead with grief among the crowd, his mother and his aunt, and some whose sorrows he had comforted, and whose guilt he had pardoned. Here a man dips a sponge into sour wine, and by a stick lifts it to the hot and cracked lips. The hemorrhage of the five wounds has done its work. The atmospheric conditions are such as the world saw never before or since. It was not a solar eclipse, such as astronomers record, or we ourselves have seen. It was a bereavement of the heavens, darker, until the towers of the temple were no longer visible, darker, until the surrounding hills disappeared, darker, until the inscription above the middle cross becomes illegible, darker, until the chin of the dying Lord falls upon the breast, and he sighs with this last sigh the words, It is finished. As we sat there, a silence took possession of us, and we thought, This is the centre from which continents have been touched, and all the world shall yet be moved. Toward this hill the prophets pointed forward, toward this hill the apostles and martyrs pointed backward, to this all heaven pointed downward, to this with foaming execrations perdition pointed upward, round it circles all history, all time, all eternity, and with this scene painters have covered the mightiest canvas, and sculptors cut the richest marble, and orchestras rolled their grandest oratorios, and churches lifted their greatest doxologies, and heaven built its highest thrones. Unable longer to endure the pressure of this scene, we moved on, and into a garden of olives, a garden which in the right season is full of flowers, and here is the reputed tomb of Christ. You know the book says, In the midst of the garden was a sepulchre. I think this was the garden, and this the sepulchre. It is shattered, of course. About four steps down we went into this, which seemed a family tomb. There is room in it for about five bodies. We measured it, and found it about eight feet high, and nine feet wide, and fourteen feet long. The crypt where I think our Lord slept was seven feet long. I think that there once lay the king, wrapped in his last slumber. On some of these rocks the Roman government set its seal, at the gate of this mausoleum, on the first Easter morning, the angels rolled the stone thundering down the hill. Up these steps walked the lacerated feet of the conqueror, and from these heights he looked off upon the city that had cast him out, and upon the world he had come to redeem, and at the heavens through which he would soon ascend. But we must hasten back to the city. There are stones in the wall which Solomon had lifted. Stop here and see a startling proof of the truth of prophecy. In Jeremiah, 21st chapter and 40th verse, it is said that Jerusalem shall be built through the ashes. What ashes? People have been asking. Were those ashes just put into the prophecy to fill up? No. The meaning has been recently discovered. Jerusalem is now being built out in a certain direction where the ground has been submitted to chemical analysis and it has been found to be the ashes cast out from the sacrifices of the ancient temple. Ashes of the wood and ashes of the bones of animals. There are great mounds of ashes, accumulation of centuries of sacrifices. It has taken all these thousands of years to discover what Jeremiah meant when he said, Behold, the days shall come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel, unto the gate of the corner, and the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes. The people of Jerusalem are at this very time fulfilling that prophecy. One handful of that ashes on which they are building is enough to prove the divinity of the scriptures. Pass by the place where the cornerstone of the ancient temple was laid three thousand years ago by Solomon. Explorers have been digging, and they found that cornerstone 75 feet beneath the surface. It is 14 feet long, 
and three feet eight inches high, and beautifully cut and shaped, and near it was an earthen jar that was supposed to have contained the oil of consecration used at the ceremony of laying the cornerstone. Yonder, from a depth of forty feet, a signet ring has been brought up, inscribed with the words, Haggai, the son of Shebniah, showing it belonged to the prophet Haggai, and to that seal ring he refers in his prophecy, saying, I will make thee as a signet. I walk further on far underground, and I find myself in Solomon's stables, and see the places worn in the stone pillars by the halters of some of his twelve thousand horses. Further on, look at the pillars on which Mount Moriah was built. You know that the mountain was too small for the temple, and so they built the mountain out on pillars. And I saw eight of those pillars, each one strong enough to hold a mountain. Here we enter the Mosque of Omar, a throne of Mohammedanism, where we are met at the door by officials who bring slippers that we must put on before we take a step further, lest our feet pollute the sacred places. A man attempting to go in without these slippers would be struck dead on the spot. These awkward sandals, adjusted as well as we could, we are led to where we see a rock with an opening in it, through which, no doubt, the blood of sacrifice in the ancient temple rolled down and away. At vast expense, the mosque has been built, but so sombre is the place, I am glad to get through it and take off the cumbrous slippers and step into the clear air. Yonder is a curve of stone which is part of a bridge which once reached from Mount Moriah to Mount Zion, and over it David walked, or rode, to prayers in the temple. Here is the wailing place of the Jews, where for centuries, almost perpetually during the daytime, whole generations of the Jews have stood putting their head or lips against the wall of what was once Solomon's temple. It was one of the saddest and most solemn and impressive scenes I ever witnessed to see scores of these descendants of Abraham with tears rolling down their cheeks and lips trembling with emotion, a book of Psalms open before them, bewailing the ruin of the ancient temple and the captivity of their race, and crying to God for the restoration of the temple in all its original splendour. Most affecting scene. And such a prayer as that, century after century, I am sure God will answer, and in some way the departed grandeur will return, or something better. I looked over the shoulders of some of them, and saw that they were reading from the mournful psalms of David, while I have been told that this is the litany which some chant. For the temple that lies desolate, we sit in solitude and mourn. For the palace that is destroyed, we sit in solitude and mourn. For the walls that are overthrown, we sit in solitude and mourn. For our majesty that is departed, we sit in solitude and mourn. For our great men that lie dead, we sit in solitude and mourn. For priests who have stumbled, we sit in solitude and mourn. I think at that prayer, Jerusalem will come again to more than its ancient magnificence. It may not be precious stones and architectural majesty, but in a moral splendour that shall eclipse forever all that David or Solomon saw. But I must get back to the housetop where I stood early this morning and before the sun sets that I may catch a wider vision of what the city now is and once was. Standing here on the housetop, I see that the city was built for military safety some old warrior, I warrant, selected the spot. It stands on a hill 2,600 feet above the level of the sea, and deep ravines on three sides do the work of military trenches. Compact as no other city was compact, only three miles journey round, and the three ancient towers, Hippicus, Phisilus, Mariamna, frowning down upon the approach of all enemies. As I stood there on the housetop in the midst of the city, I said, O oh Lord, reveal to me this metropolis of the world, that I may see it as it once appeared. No one was with me, for there are some things you can see more vividly with no one but God and yourself present. Immediately, the mosque of Omar, 
which has stood for ages on Mount Moriah, the site of the ancient temple, disappeared, and the most honoured structure of all the ages lifted itself in the light, and I saw it. The temple, the ancient temple. Not Solomon's temple, but something grander than that. Not Zerubbabel's temple, but something more gorgeous than that. It was Herod's temple, built for the one purpose of eclipsing all its architectural predecessors. There it stood, covering nineteen acres, and ten thousand workmen had been forty-six years in building it. Blaze of magnificence, bewildering range of porticos, and ten gateways, and double arches, and Corinthian capitals chiselled into lilies and acanthus. Masonry bevelled and grooved into such delicate forms that it seemed to tremble in the light. Cloisters with two rows of Corinthian columns, royal arches, marble steps, pure as though made out of frozen snow. Carving that seemed like a panel of the door of heaven, let down and set in, the façade of the building on shoulders at each end lifting the glory higher and higher, and walls wherein gold put out the silver, and the carbuncle put out the gold, and the jasper put out the carbuncle, until in the changing light they would all seem to come back again into a chorus of harmonious colour. The temple, the temple, doxology in stone, anthems soaring in rafters of Lebanon cedar, from side to side and from foundation to gilded pinnacle, the frozen prayer of all ages. From this housetop, on the December afternoon, we look out in another direction, and I see the King's Palace, covering 160,000 square feet, three rows of windows illumining the inside brilliance. The hallway wainscoted with all styles of coloured marbles, surmounted by arabesque, vermilion and gold. Looking down on mosaics, music of waterfalls in the garden outside answering the music of the harps, thrummed by deft fingers inside, banisters over which princes and princesses leaned, and talked to kings and queens ascending the stairway. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, mountain city, city of God, joy of the whole earth, stronger than Gibraltar and Sebastopol, surely it never could have been captured. But while standing there on the housetop that December afternoon, I hear the crash of the twenty-three mighty sieges which have come against Jerusalem in the ages past. Yonder is the pool of Hezekiah and Siloam, but again and again were those waters reddened with human gore. Yonder are the towers, but again and again they fall. Yonder are the high walls, but again and again they were levelled. To rob the treasures from her temple and palace, and dethrone this queen city of the earth, all nations plotted. David, taking the throne at Hebron, decides that he must have Jerusalem for his capital, and coming up from the south at the head of 280,000 troops, he captures it. Look, here comes another siege of Jerusalem. The Assyrians, under Sennacherib, enslaved nations at his chariot wheel, having taken 200,000 captives in his one campaign, Phoenician cities kneeling at his feet. Egypt, trembling at the flash of his sword, comes upon Jerusalem. Look, another siege. The armies of Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar, come down and take plunder from Jerusalem, such as no other city had to yield, and ten thousand of her citizens trudge off into Babylonian bondage. Look, another siege. And Nebuchadnezzar and his hosts, by night, go through a breach of the Jerusalem wall, and the morning find some of them seated triumphant in the temple, and what they could not take away because too heavy, they break up, the brazen sea and the two wreathed pillars, Jachin and Boaz. Another siege of Jerusalem, and Pompey with the battering rams which a hundred men would roll back, and then at full run forward, would bang against the wall of the city, and catapults, hurling the rocks upon the people, left twelve thousand dead, and the city in the clutch of the Roman war eagle. Look, a more desperate siege of Jerusalem, Titus with his tenth legion on Mount of Olives, and Ballista, 
arranged on the principle of the pendulum to swing great boulders against the walls and towers, and miners digging under the city, making galleries of beams underground, which, set on fire, tumbled great masses of houses and human beings into destruction and death. All is taken now but the temple, and Titus, the conqueror, wants to save that unharmed, but a soldier, contrary to orders, hurls a torch into the temple, and it is consumed. Many strangers were in the city at the time, and ninety-seven thousand captives were taken, and Josephus says one million one hundred thousand lay dead. But looking from this housetop, the siege that most absorbs us is that of the Crusaders. England and France and all Christendom wanted to capture the Holy Sepulchre and Jerusalem, then possession of the Mohammedans, under the command of one of the loveliest, bravest, and mightiest men that ever lived, for justice must be done him, though he was a Mohammedan, Glorious Saladin. Against him came the armies of Europe, under Richard Coeur de Lyon, King of England, Philip Augustus, King of France, Tancred, Raymond, Godfrey, and other valiant men, marching on through fevers and plagues and battle charges, and sufferings as intense as the world ever saw. Saladin, in Jerusalem, hearing of the sickness of King Richard, his chief enemy, sends him his own physician, and from the walls of Jerusalem, seeing King Richard afoot, sends him a horse. With all the world looking on, the armies of Europe come within sight of Jerusalem. At the first glimpse of the city, they fall on their faces in reverence, and then lift anthems of praise. Feuds and hatred among themselves were given up, and Raymond and Tancred, the bitterest rivals, embraced, while the armies looked on. Then the battering rams rolled, and the catapults swung, and the swords thrust, and the carnage raged. Godfrey the Bouillon is the first to mount the wall, and the crusaders, a cross on every shoulder or breast, having taken the city, march bareheaded and barefooted to what they suppose to be the holy sepulchre, and kiss the tomb. Jerusalem, the possession of Christendom. But Saladin retook the city, and for the last four hundred years it has been in possession of cruel and polluted Mohammedanism. Another crusade is needed to start for Jerusalem, a crusade in this nineteenth century greater than all those of the past centuries put together, a crusade in which you and I will march, a crusade without weapons of death, but only the sword of the Spirit, a crusade that will make not a single wound, nor start one tear of distress, nor incendiarize one homestead, a crusade of gospel peace, and the cross again be lifted on Calvary, not as once an instrument of pain, but a signal of invitation. And the mosque of Omar shall give place to a church of Christ, and Mount Zion become the dwelling place not of David, but of David's Lord, and Jerusalem purified of all its idolatries, and taking back the Christ she once cast out, shall be made a worthy type of that heavenly city which Paul styled the mother of us all, and which St. John saw, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Through its gates may we all enter when our work is done, and in its temple, greater than all the earthly temples piled in one, may we worship. Russian pilgrims lined all the roads around the Jerusalem we visited last winter. They had walked hundreds of miles, and their feet bled on the way of Jerusalem. Many of them had spent their last farthing to get there, and they had left some of those who starved with them, dying or dead by the roadside. An aged woman, exhausted with the long way, begged her fellow pilgrims not to let her die until she had seen the holy city. As she came to the gate of the city, she could not take another step, but she was carried in, and then said, Now hold my head up till I can look upon Jerusalem and her head lifted, she took one look, and said, Now I die content, I have seen it, I have seen it. Some of us, before we reach the heavenly Jerusalem, may be as tired as that, but angels of mercy will help us in, 
and one glimpse of the temple of God and the Lamb, and one good look at the king in his beauty, will more than compensate for all the toils and tears and heartbreaks of the pilgrimage. Hallelujah. Amen. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Twenty Five Sermons on the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twenty Five Sermons on the Holy Land by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. The Journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Luke ten thirty. It is morning in Jerusalem, and we take stirrups for the road along which the wayfarer of old fell among thieves, who left him wounded and half dead. Job's picture of the horse in the Orient, as having neck clothed with thunder, is not true of most horses now in Palestine. There is no thunder on their neck, though there is some lightning in their heels. Poorly fed and unmercifully whacked, they sometimes retort. To Americans and English, who are accustomed to guide horses by the bridle, these horses of the Orient, guided only by foot and voice, make equestrianism in uncertainty, and the pull on the bridle that you intend for slowing up of the pace may be mistaken for a hint that you intend to outgallop the wind or wheel in swift circles like the hawk but they can climb steeps and descend precipices with skilled foot, and the one I chose for our journey in Palestine shall have the praise of going for weeks without one stumbling step amid rocky steeps where an ordinary horse would not for an hour maintain sure-footedness. There were eighteen of our party, and twenty-two beasts of burden carried our camp equipment. We are led by an Arab sheik with his black Nubian servant carrying a loaded gun in full sight, but it is the fact that this sheik represents the Turkish government which assures the safety of the caravan. We cross the Jehoshaphat Valley, which, if it had not been memorable in history, and were only now discovered, would excite the admiration of all who look upon it. It is like the gorges of the Yosemite or the chasms of Yellowstone Park. The sides of this Jehoshaphat Valley are tunneled with graves and overlooked by Jerusalem walls, an eternity of depths overshadowed by an eternity of architecture. Within sight of Mount Olivet and Gethsemane, and with the heavens and the earth full of sunshine, we start out on the very road mentioned in the text when it says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. No road that I ever saw was so well constructed for brigandage, deep gullies, sharp turns, caves on either side. There are fifty places on this road where a highwayman might surprise and overpower an unarmed pilgrim. His cry for help, his shriek of pain, his death groan, would be answered only by the echoes. On this road today we met groups of men who, judging from their countenances, have in their veins the blood of many generations of Rob Roys. Josephus says that Herod at one time discharged from the service of the temple forty thousand men, and that the great part of them became robbers. So late as 1820, Sir Frederick Henniker, an English tourist, was attacked on this very road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and shot and almost slain. There has never been any scarcity of bandits along the road we travel today. With the fresh memory of some recent violence in their minds, Christ tells the people of the Good Samaritan who came along that way and took care of a poor fellow that had been set upon by villainous Arabs, and robbed and pounded and cut. We encamped for lunch that noon close by an old stone building, said to be the tavern where the scene spoken of in the Bible culminated. Tumbled in the dust and ghastly with wounds, the victim of this highway robbery lay in the middle of the road, a fact of which I am certain, because the Bible says the people passed by on either side. 
there were twelve thousand priests living at Jericho, and they had to go to Jerusalem to officiate at the temple. And one of these ministers of religion, I suppose, was on his way to the temple service, and he is startled as he sees this bleeding victim in the middle of the road. Oh, he says, here is a man that has been attacked of thieves. Why don't you go home? says the minister. The man in a comatose state makes no answer, or, with a half-dazed look, puts his wounded hand to his gashed forehead and drawls out, What? Well, says the minister, I must hurry on to my duties at Jerusalem. I have to kill a lamb and two pigeons in sacrifice today. I cannot spend any more time with this unfortunate. I guess somebody else will take care of him. But this is one of the things that cannot be helped anyhow. Besides that, my business is with souls and not with bodies. Good morning. When you get well enough to sit up, I will be glad to see you at the temple. And the minister curves his way out toward the overhanging sides of the road and passes. You hypocrite! One of the chief offices of religion is to heal wounds. You might have done here a kindness that would have been more acceptable to God than all the incense that will smoke up from your censer for the next three weeks, and you missed the chance. Go on your way, execrated by the centuries. Soon afterward a Levite came upon the scene. The Levites looked after the music of the temple, and waited upon the priests, and provided the supplies of the temple. This Levite, passing along this road where we are today, took a look at the mass of bruises and laceration in the middle of the road. My, my, says the Levite, this man is awfully hurt, and he ought to be helped. But my business is to sing in the temple. If I am not there, no one will carry my part. Besides that, there may not be enough frankincense for the censers, and the wine or oil may have given out, and what a fearful balk in the service that would make. Then one of the priests might get his breastplate on crooked. But it seems too bad to leave this man in this condition. Perhaps I had better try to staunch this bleeding and give him a little stimulant. But no, the ceremony at Jerusalem is of more importance than taking care of the wounds of a man who will probably soon be dead anyhow. This highway robbery ought to be stopped, for it hinders us Levites on our way up to the temple. There, I have lost five minutes already. Go along, you beast! He shouts as he strikes his heels into the sides of the animal carrying him, and the dust rising from the road soon hides the hard-hearted official. But a third person is coming along this road. You cannot expect him to do anything by way of alleviation, because he and the wounded man belong to different nations, which have abominated each other for centuries. The wounded man is an Israelite, and the stranger now coming on this scene of suffering is a Samaritan. They belong to nations which hated each other with an objurgation and malediction diabolic. They had opposition temples, one on Mount Gerizim and the other on Mount Moriah, and I guess this Samaritan, when he comes up, will give the fallen Israelite another clip and say, Good for you, I will just finish the work these bandits began, and give you one more kick that will put you out of your misery and here is a rag of your coat that they did not steal, and I will take that. What, do you dare to appeal to me for mercy? Hush up! Why, your ancestors worshipped at Jerusalem when they ought to have worshipped at Gerizim. Now take that, and that, and that, will say the Samaritan, as he pounds the fallen Israelite. No, the Samaritan rides up to the scene of suffering, gets off the beast, and steps down, and looks into the face of the wounded man, and says, This poor fellow does not belong to my nation, and our ancestors worshipped in different places, but he is a man, and that makes us brothers. God pity him as I do. And he gets down on his knees, and begins to examine his wounds, and straighten out his limbs to see if any of his bones are broken, and says, my dear fellow, cheer up, you need have no more care about yourself, for I am going to take care of you. Let me feel of your pulse. 
let me listen to your breathing. I have in these bottles two liquids that will help you. The one is oil, and that will soothe the pain of these wounds, and the other is wine, and your pulse is feeble, and you will feel faint, and that will stimulate you. Now I must get you to the nearest tavern. Oh, no, says the man, I can't walk, let me stay here and die. Nonsense, says the Samaritan, you are not going to die, I am going to put you on this beast, and I will hold you on till I get you to a place where you can have a soft mattress and an easy pillow. Now the Samaritan has got the wounded man on his feet, and with much tugging and lifting puts him on the beast, for it is astonishing how strong the spirit of kindness will make one, as you have seen a mother, after three weeks of sleepless watching of her boy, down with scarlet fever, lift that half-grown boy, heavier than herself, from couch to lounge. And so this sympathetic Samaritan has, unaided, put the wounded man in the saddle, and at slow pace the extemporized ambulance is moving toward the tavern. You feel better now, I think, says the Samaritan to the Hebrew. Yes, he says, I do feel better. Hallo, you landlord, help me carry this man in and make him comfortable. That night the Samaritan sat up with the Jew, giving him water whenever he felt thirsty, and turning his pillow when it got hot, and in the morning, before the Samaritan started on his journey, he said, Landlord, now I am obliged to go. Take good care of this man, and I will be along here soon again, and pay you for all you do for him. Meanwhile, here is something to meet present expenses. The two pence he gave the landlord sounds small, but it was as much as ten dollars here and now, considering what it would there and then buy of food and lodging. As on that December noon we sat under the shadow of the tavern where this scene of mercy had occurred, and just having passed along the road where the tragedy had happened, I could, as plainly as I now see the nearest man to this platform, see that Bible story reenacted, and I said aloud to our group under the tent, One drop of practical Christianity is worth more than a whole temple full of ecclesiasticism, and that good Samaritan had more religion in five minutes than that minister and that Levite had in a lifetime, and the most accursed thing on earth is national prejudice, and I bless God that I live in America, where Gentile and Jew, Protestant and Catholic, can live together without quarrel, and where, in the great national crucible, the differences of sect and tribe and people are being moulded into a great brotherhood, and that the question which the lawyer flung at Christ, and which brought forth this incident of the Good Samaritan, who is my neighbour, is bringing forth the answer, my neighbour is the first man I meet in trouble, and a wound close at hand calls louder than a temple seventeen miles off, though it covers nineteen acres. I saw in London the vast procession which one day last January moved to St. Paul's Cathedral at the burial of that Christian hero, Lord Napier. The day after, at Howarden, in conversation on various themes, I asked Mr. Gladstone if he did not think that many who were under the shadow of false religions might not nevertheless be at heart really Christian. Mr. Gladstone replied, Yes, my old friend Lord Napier, who was yesterday buried, after he returned from his Abyssinian campaign, visited us here at Hawarden, and, walking in this park where we are now walking, he told me a very beautiful incident. He said, after the war in Africa was over, we were on the march and we had a soldier with a broken leg who was not strong enough to go along with us, and we did not dare to leave him to be taken care of by savages, but we found we were compelled to leave him, and he went into the house of a woman who was said to be a very kind woman, though of the race of savages, and we said, Here is a sick man, and if you will take care of him till he gets well, we will pay you very largely. And then we offered her five times that which would ordinarily be offered, hoping by the excess of pay to secure for him great kindness. The woman replied, 
i will not take care of him for the money you offer i do not want your money but leave him here and i will take care of him for the sake of the love of god mr gladstone turned to me and said dr talmage don't you think that though she belonged to a race of savages that was pure religion and i answered i do i do may god multiply all the world over the number of good samaritans in philadelphia a young woman was dying she was a wreck sunken into the depths of depravity there was no lower depth for her to reach word came to the midnight mission that she was dying in a haunt of iniquity near by who would go to tell her of the christ of mary magdalene this one refused and that one refused saying i dare not go there a christian woman her white locks typical of her purity of soul said i will go and i will go now she went and sat down by the dying girl and told her of the christ who came to seek and save that which was lost first to the forlorn one came tears of repentance and then the smile as though she had begun to hope for the pardon of him who came to save to the uttermost then just before she breathed her last she said to the angel of mercy bending over her pillow would you kiss me i will said the christian woman as she put upon her cheek the last salutation before in the heavenly world i think god gave her the welcoming kiss that was religion yes that was religion good samaritans along every street and along every road as well as this one on the road to jericho but our procession of sightseers is again in line and here we pass through a deep ravine and i cry to the dragoman david what place do you call this and he replied this is the brook cherith where elijah was fed by the ravens and in that answer he overthrew my lifelong notions of the place where elijah was waited on by the black servants of the sky a brook to me had meant a slight depression of ground and a stream fordable and perhaps fifteen feet wide but here was a chasm that an earthquake must have scooped out with its biggest shovel or split with its mightiest battle-axe six hundred feet deep is it and the brook cherith is a river which when in full force is a silver wedge splitting the mountains into precipices the feathered descendants of elijah's ravens still wing their way across this ravine but are not like the crows we supposed them to be they are as large as eagles and one of them could carry in its beak and clenched jaw at once enough food for a half dozen elijahs no thanks to the ravens they are carnivorous and would rather have picked out the eyes of elijah whom they found at the mouth of his cave on the side of cherith waiting for his breakfast having drunk his morning beverage from the rushing stream beneath than have been his butlers and purveyors but god compelled them as he always has compelled and always will compel black and cruel and overshadowing providences to carry help to his children if they only have faith enough to catch the blessing as it drops from the seeming adversity the greatest blessing always coming not with white wings but black wings black wings of conviction bringing pardon to the sinner black wings of crucifixion over calvary bringing redemption to the world black wings of american revolution bringing free institutions to a continent black wings of american civil war bringing unification and solidarity to the republic black wings of the judgment day bringing resurrection to an entombed human race and in the last day when all your life and mine will be summed up we will find that the greatest blessing we ever received came on the wings of the black ravens of disaster bless god for trouble bless god for sickness bless god for persecution bless god for poverty you never heard of any man or woman of great use to the world who had not had lots of trouble the diamond must be cut the wheat must be threshed the black ravens must fly who are the nearest the throne 
those are they who came out of the great tribulation and had their robes washed and made white in the blood of the lamb but look look at what four o'clock in the afternoon bursts upon our vision the plain of jericho and the valley of jordan and the dead sea we have come to a place where the horses not so much walk as slide upon their haunches and we all dismount for the steep descent is simply terrific though a princess of wallachia who fell here and was dangerously injured after recovery spent a large amount of money in trying to make the road passable down and down till we saw the white tents pitched for us by our muleteers amid the ruins of ancient jericho which fell at the sound of poor music played on ram's horn that ancient instrument which taken from the head of the leader of the flock of sheep is perforated and prepared to be fingered by the musical performer and blown upon when pressed to the lips as in another sermon i have fully described that scene i will only say that every day for seven days the ministers of religion went round the city of jericho blowing upon those ram's horns and on the seventh day without the roll of a war chariot or the stroke of a catapult or the swing of a ballista crash 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 went the walls of that magnificent capital on the evening of december the sixth we walked amid the brick and mortar of that shattered city and i said to myself all this done by poor music blessed of god for it was not a harp or a flute or a clapping cymbal or an organ played at the sound of which the city surrendered to destruction but a rude instrument making rude music blessed of god to the demolition of that wicked place which had for centuries defied the almighty and i said if all this was by the blessing of god on poor music what mightier things could be done by the blessing of god on good music skilful music gospel music if all the good that has already been done by music were subtracted from the world i believe three-fourths of its religion would be gone the lullabies of mothers which keep sounding on though the lips which sang them forty years ago became ashes the old hymns in log cabin churches the country meeting-houses and psalms in rouse's version in scotch kirks the anthem in english cathedrals the roll of organs that will never let handel or hayden or beethoven die the thrum of harps the sweep of the bow across the bass viols the song of sabbath schools storming the heavens the doxology of great assemblages why a thousand jerichos of sin have by them all been brought down seated by the warmth of our campfires that evening of december sixth amid the bricks and debris of jericho and thinking what poor music has done and what mightier things could be accomplished by the blessings of god on good music i said to myself ministers have been doing a grand work and sermons have been blessed but would it not be well for us to put more emphasis on music oh for a campaign of old hundred oh for a brigade of mount pisgahs oh for a cavalry charge of coronations oh for an army of antiochs and st martins and ariels oh for enough orchestral batons lifted to marshal all nations as jericho was surrounded by poor music for seven days and was conquered so let our earth be surrounded seven days by good gospel music and the round planet will all be taken for god not a wall of opposition not a throne of tyranny not a palace of sin not an enterprise of unrighteousness could stand the mighty throb of such atmospheric pulsation music it sounded at the laying of creation's cornerstone when the morning stars sang together music it will be the last reverberation when the archangel's trumpet shall wake the dead music let its full power be now tested to comfort and bless and arouse and save while our evening meal was being prepared in the tents we walk out for a moment to the fountain of elisha the one into which the prophet threw the salt because the waters were poisonous and bitter and lo they became sweet and healthy and ever since 
with gurgle and laughter they have rushed down the hill and leaped from the rocks the only cheerful object in all that region being these waters now on this plain of jericho the sun is setting making the mountains look like balustrades and battlements of amber and maroon and gold and the moon just above the crests seems to be a window of heaven through which immortals might be looking down upon the scene three arabs as watchmen sit beside the campfire at the door of my tent their low conversation in a strange language all night long a soothing rather than an interruption i had a dream that night never to be forgotten that dream amid the complete ruins of jericho its past grandeur returned and i saw the city as it was when mark antony gave it to cleopatra and herod bought it from her and i heard the hoofs of its swift steeds and the rumbling of its chariots and the shouts of excited spectators in its amphitheatre and there was white marble amid green groves of palm and balsam cold stone warmed with sculptured foliage hard pillars cut into soft lace iliads and odysseys in granite basalt jet as the night mounted by carbuncle flaming as the morning upholstery dyed as though dipped in the blood of battlefields robes encrusted with diamond mosaics white as sea foam flashed on by auroras gaieties which the sun saw by day rivalled by revels the moon saw by night blasphemy built against the sky ceilings stellar as the midnight heavens grandeurs turreted archivolted and intercolumnar wickedness so appalling that established vocabulary fails and we must make an adjective and call it herodic the region round about the city walls seemed to me white with cotton such as thenius describes as once growing there and sweet with sugar-cane and luscious with oranges and figs and pomegranates and redolent with such flora as can only grow where a tropical sun kisses the earth and the hour came back to me when in the midst of all that splendour herod died commanding his sister salome immediately after his death to secure the assassination of all the chief jews whom he had brought to the city and shut up in a circus for that purpose and the news came to the audience in the theatre as some one took the stage and announced to the excited multitude herod is dead herod is dead then in my dream all the pomp of jericho vanished and gloom was added to gloom and desolation to desolation and woe to woe until perhaps the rippling waters or the fountain of elisha suggesting it as sounds will sometimes give direction to a dream i thought that the waters of christ's salvation and the fountains open for sin and uncleanness were rolling through that plain and rolling across that continent and rolling round the earth until on either side of their banks all the thorns became flowers and all the deserts gardens and all the hovels mansions and all the funerals bridal processions and all the blood of war was turned into dahlias and all the groans became anthems and dante's inferno became dante's divina commedia and paradise lost was submerged by paradise regained and tears became crystals and cruel swords came out of foundries glistening ploughshares and in my dream at the blast of a trumpet the prostrate walls of jericho rose again and some one told me that as these walls in joshua's time at the sounding trumpets of doom went down now at the sounding trumpet of the gospel they came up again and i thought a man appeared at the door of my tent and i said who are you and from whence have you come and he said i am the samaritan you heard of at the tavern on the road from jerusalem to jericho as taking care of the man who fell among thieves and i have just come from healing the last wound of the last unfortunate in all the earth and i rose from my pillow in the tent to greet him and my dream broke and i realized it was only a dream but a dream which shall have a glorious reality as surely as god is true and christ's gospel is the world's catholicon 
glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen end of chapter 17